Uh, appreciate your joining in. That's that's all we needed. Okay, great. Great. Okay. And welcome everyone to the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. Today is March 23rd and we'll be holding public hearings on LD83, LD511, and then a number of work sessions. Um, my name is Seth Berry. I am the House Chair of the Committee. I represent House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdoinham, most of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec. Uh, I will ask the committee members now to introduce themselves, um, and I'll call on folks um, just based on the way my screen is arrayed. So that will begin with Representative Wadsworth. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name's Nate Wadsworth, and I proudly serve Southern Oxford County, and that's House District 70. Thank you. Representative Cuddy. Good morning. My name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville. Representative Carlo. Good morning. I'm Representative Nathan Carlo from House District 16, which is part of Saco, all of Hollis, and a part of Buxton. Representative Grahowski. Good morning all from the crossroads of Down East Maine. I am Nicole Grahowski. I serve House District 132, City of Ellsworth and Town of Trenton. Representative Foster. Good morning from the heart of Maine. I'm Representative Steve Foster serving the towns of Dexter, Garland, Exeter, Stetson, and Charleston. Representative Wood. Good morning, I'm Barb Wood and I represent House District 38 which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Representative Ziegler. Morning, I'm uh, Representative Paige Ziegler from District 96, uh, Waldo County, the seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Mapamoral, Palermo, and Searsmont. Representative Kessler. Good morning, Chris Kessler, representing District 32, which is the middle portion of South Portland and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. And Senator Lawrence is muted, um, and I think uh, uh, Senator oh, there Mark he is. Lawrence. Yep, I'm Senator Mark Lawrence, the uh, Senate Chair of the Committee. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, for joining us and providing us uh, the necessary quorum to start. Um, we do have other members of the committee who are unable to be with us today, but as always, they will read your written testimony and um, also probably watch this uh, proceeding on YouTube uh, where we are streaming live as we speak. Um, with us today, as always, is Izzy Zox, our committee clerk, and Daniel Tartikoff is our analyst for the day on these two bills and our first two work sessions as well. Um, <clears throat> before we begin with the public hearing on LD83, uh, just a few reminders, a few preliminaries. First of all, uh, we are <clears throat> streaming live and um, we invite public comment in this fashion, um, encourage people to sign up the night before so that they can get a panelist link and uh, you will be admitted to, as an attendee to the meeting waiting to testify where you cannot be seen or heard <clears throat> and where we uh, discourage the use of the chat function. Um, and all of us, including panelists and members of the committee, try not to use the chat function for anything except for uh, sort of procedural matters, such as communicating with our clerk or analyst. Um, if you are uh, able to see yourself and you are unmuted, then consider yourself live on Zoom, on YouTube, and on the uh, audio function for the legislature's live stream. Um, please do update your name on your Zoom square. Um, we want to make sure that it is uh, possible for you to be identified for the purpose of uh, proper transparency to the public. So um, uh, we especially discourage uh, names like iPhone 6 or dad's laptop. Um, uh, please do make sure to click on those three little dots, rename yourself uh, fully with your first name and last name and pronouns if you wish. Um, let's see.
Uh, I will call on you to testify and you will be given three minutes to do so. Uh, we make an exception for um, the uh, person presenting the bill. They need to go on a little bit longer to make sure we understand what it does. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, call on sponsors and co-sponsors to speak first. Uh, then those speaking for the bill, those speaking against the bill, and those neither for nor against the bill. Uh, once you're done testifying, uh, we will uh, potentially ask you some questions. And uh, if you if there are no questions, or once you've answered all questions, um, you'll be able to exit the meeting on your own and watch the remainder of the hearing on the YouTube channel um, or uh, as an attendee, if you wish. Um, but you won't be able to come back in um, to the meeting once you've testified. Uh, we do strongly encourage written testimony. You can submit this at any time, uh, but again, preferably before the hearing if possible. Um, if we receive it afterwards, we will also uh, read it and um, try to digest everything before the work session, which is generally scheduled a couple weeks after the public hearing. So um, with those preliminaries out of the way, I will open the public hearing on LD83, um, which uh, will be presented by Representative Reisman. LD83 um, has a title, but I don't have it in front of me, so I'll let Representative Reisman uh, remind me what it is. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Reisman, and uh, the floor is yours. And actually see Representative Dodge. So it looks like there was a little bit of a miscommunication here. I'm going to switch over to Representative Dodge's bill if necessary. Um, Izzy, is, is Representative Reisman not with us? I had a different order. That was my bad, that. I'm sorry. I switched them over. Okay, thank you. Excellent. I'll just give Representative Reisman a moment to unmute himself. Okay, thank you very Welcome. much. Chairman, uh, uh, I I don't have any Girl Scout cookies here presently, but I can tell you that over a period of years, I've bought three tons of Girl Scout cookies. So, uh, with that said, uh, I I do want to thank you for the opportunity to present this bill to you. So, good morning, Senator Lawrence on the phone, and Representative Barry, and other distinguished members of the Committee on Energy, Utilities, and I'm sorry, Energy, Utilities, and Technology. I'm Walter Reisman, and I represent District 69, which includes Harrison, Bridgeton, and Denmark, and it includes two counties. Today, I am testifying in support of LD83, an act to clarify the meaning of unserved area within the state's broadband service laws. I think that's what you were asking me to do, Senator, but I mean, Representative, do you want me to just continue on? Okay. Now in my second term, I am honored to serve the good people of District 69. I've had the opportunity to listen to various concerns of my constituents, but undoubtedly the one most mentioned was, why can't they do something about our broadband? I thought to myself, well, who was they? So it was two years ago that I started discussions with local officials about what they were doing to solve the problem. I found that they had no good answers. They just knew on a town level that the only way to fix the problem would cost money, lots of money. And there was no monies to pay to fix the problem. My region's made up of small rural communities, just like many regions in the state. It was obvious that our small communities had little chance to compete against the giant corporations who control the broadband industry. There is no incentive for current providers to make changes to their comfortable environment. Is it time for a change? No doubt. The state is fortunate to have an agency like Connect Maine to assemble the resources for bringing better broadband to our communities. In their 2019-20 detailed strategic plan, they laid a foundation to enable communities to achieve success in this struggle. I paraphrase what they said. Success will come from the formation of public-private collaborations. Number two, we need a place we need to place our communities in the driver's seat to determine their own broadband destiny. Three, 
There needs to be collaboration to produce accurate mapping of actual broadband speed availability. Four, support deployment of high quality networks that have the ability to deploy low latency, symmetrical upload and download speeds, fixed broadbands, which are scalable for the future. And last but not least, least develop a definition of unserved and underserved to recognize the value of long-term investment. So uh, this, this section here comes directly from the detailed strategic plan of Connect Maine. After reading those polls, I decided it was time to explore our options as a town and on a regional basis as well. As a result, I led the charge to form local broadband committees to my region with the goal to encourage each community to develop a plan for better broadband and create a process to accomplish it. So what does this have to do with the bill and those objectives? This is what I discovered. I can best describe the current situation of broadband in Maine as the tail wagging the dog and not the dog wagging the tail. Without local commitment, not much would change. Thus, we established the Harrison Broadband Advisory Committee, a town appointed committee to make a recommendation to the selectmen on a plan to solve the broadband dilemma. It is a hard, dedicated working committee. And with the help of various outside re resources, we were able to educate ourselves about the needed processes to develop a plan. Over the last year, we conducted local surveys, completed our own mapping, and identified the issues surrounding unserved and un underserved areas of the community. What was our takeaway from this process? Number one, provider assessments of some unserved areas were inaccurate. This speaks to how unserved areas are defined. Number two, results of our own speed test data determined that upload download speeds as presented were quite often inaccurate or overstated based on the current 25 over three standard. Number four, number three, customer service and quality of service were not favorably rated. Those were the results of our survey. Um, and uh, some of the comments included in trying to expand the service by subscribers it was unaffordable or unavailable. So why is this bill so important? This bill will address the definitions of both unserved and underserved and level the playing field for consumers from providers. Unfortunately, the state continues to be linked to a 25 over three standard that is based on an antiquated federal policy. In doing research on the subject of 25 over three upload download standards, I came across the Blandon Foundation, a renowned nonprofit focused on issues related to broadband use, policies, and trends. I would like to quote a recent comment by them. That is, quote, the FCC still frames the national broadband discussion in terms of the ability to provide speeds of 25 over three. The FCC is able to declare that a lot of the US has acceptable broadband based on that standard. As a Minnesota stakeholder, Blandon also commented that their state has broadband speed goals of number one, ubiquitous access to speeds of 25 uh, down and three up in place by the year 2022. That means the entire state. The second goal, ubiquitous access to 100 over 20 by 2026. Although more aggressive than federal standards, their legislature put them into statute so they could be more competitively globally and play the and level the playing field between urban and rural areas of the state. Could Maine and Connect Maine choose to aspire to a more aggressive and forward-looking policy? The answer is yes. Look at the history on broadband speed goals. There has been no apparent appetite to look forward seemingly keeping the status quo, which was primarily benefiting the current broadband providers. That needs to change. What will better broadband look like? The core elements of a successful modern broadband infrastructure will mean nearly 100% access, affordable consumer cost, and reliability of service for, um, that provides exceptional educational telemedicine, safety, and business opportunities. I hope you would agree this is a goal we should set by setting our visions 
higher. Where are we currently? The measures of growth, publication put out, uh, um, put out by the, um, oh, sorry, the Main Development Foundation, the measures of growth um, estimates that under current policy, there are at least 85,000 locations in Maine that don't meet the current 25 over three standard. I mentioned earlier about our town broadband committee in Harrison. After analyzing that information from the survey, I came out with results that looked like this. After adjusting for seasonal households, I found that 35% of potential households were unserved and 30% of those households were underserved. Much different than how things are portrayed under current standards by providers. There isn't much as incentive under the present system to do better. Things are fine, right? No, wrong. Our town couldn't even qualify for natural resource, uh, financial re resources for broadband from the state because our town would be considered adequately covered. One thing I have learned to date is that the status quo is not acceptable. In summarizing my testimony, let me reiterate my main point. The Connect Maine strategic plan calls for allowing Maine communities to drive a process to improve their broadband services. This bill would encourage the development of a broadband infrastructure that is forward-looking and addresses present and future needs of our communities and residents. We will be able to upgrade our access to broadband and improve educational, telehealth, and business opportunities. To do, to do this, we need to set the bar higher for our broadband infrastructure. By passing this legislation, it will help encourage a balanced public-private approach to broadband development. The legislation will provide for future growth by providing incentives to attract new and expanding businesses, encourage new families to move here, and grow our labor pool. We need a goal of providing better, ubiquitous coverage sooner than later. Remember that the question at the beginning of my testimony is, are they doing anything about broadband? Well, with this bill, we can confidently say we are. I encourage you to pass this bill as a unanimous ought to pass. Thank you for your time. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Representative Reisman. Does the committee have any questions for the sponsor? Uh, Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Representative Reisman, for bringing this topic forward. Um, I do notice that Director Peggy Schaefer is in the attendees room, although I didn't see if she signed up to speak, but I wonder, um, have you spoken with her or with the Board of Connect Maine Authority to when you were working on this bill? And what were their thoughts on it, I guess? Um, we'll hear more, I'm sure, had, but. Uh, we've had... Sorry, we... uh, yes, we've Representative had... Brasman, go ahead. We're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, can you can you try that again? I'll bring this closer. Yeah. Um, both myself and uh, through our committee, we've we've had a, a pretty decent association with the Ms. Schaefer on the issues that we face in our town, and um, we were a approaching this, trying to figure out how to put a package together to uh, finance a, an investment in in broadband in in our town. And um, basically the response coming from Connect Maine was, uh, well, your area is adequately served based on the definitions of the 25 over three standard. That's what I was speaking to in my testimony. The standards that, that the state and the feds use currently are antiquated and insufficient to help grow what we need to accomplish here in the state. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Connect Maine, uh, rules indicate currently they, they are uh, following a 25 over three standard. I'm not sure if I totally answered your question. Yes, we did have conversations. That's the short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Seeing none, Representative Reisman, thank you uh, for presenting your bill. And uh, we look forward to the first uh, truckload shipment of Girl Scout cookies. Well, I, I was listening. I heard something about lemon cookies being wicked good. 
Oh. I'll take the thin mints as well. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, with that, um, I just wanna check whether there are any co-sponsors who are um, interested in testifying. I don't have any signed up, but um, I do like to double check. All right, seeing none, we will proceed to testimony in favor of the legislation. And seeing none, uh, we'll proceed to testimony in opposition. Um, represent, uh, excuse me, uh, first up will be Benjamin Sanborn of the Telecommunications Association of Maine. Uh, welcome, Ben, the floor is yours. And you'll need to unmute. I think you're unmuting. Yes, there we go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Trying to hit the little red microphone there. <laughs> Got it. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Barry and Senator Lawrence and members of the committee. My name is Ben Sanborn. I'm the Executive Director and Counsel for Telecommunications Association of Maine. Um, we are here to testify in opposition to LD83. Uh, we did submit written testimony. I'm not going to go over the testimony that we wrote. Uh, hopefully everyone has a chance to review it. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the difference between what is unserved versus what is billed to, because I think there's some confusion there. And um, the issue with unserved is, is there a baseline where we can say we need to get everybody in the state up to a certain level before we start lifting everybody up to whatever level B is? And so right now, what the, the definition of unserved is the federal definition of 25 down, three up, so that we can get everybody in the state up to this baseline level. And we agree, it's baseline, it's not ideal. It's the baseline level that everybody should have. And once we do that, then we can look at, all right, can we change that number? And the FCC is looking at that. But when we're doing this, and when Connect Maine is giving grants, and when we're working through federal programs like RDOF and uh, similar programs, the build to is something that's well above 25.3. And in fact, for any build that we're doing with Connect Maine funds, we have to have a minimum of 10 megabits per second upload. And realistically, we are frequently exclusively for most of him members, um, putting in fiber, meaning we can get symmetrical speeds. And we can be doing 100-100 if we're doing a build. I know that um, Consolidated has committed in many of their RDOF areas to be doing uh, gigabit service. So there, it's important to understand the distinction between what is the cutoff at which you can say, everybody needs to have this level. So we need to use public dollars to get everybody at the very least who doesn't have this minimum up to some level of broadband versus once you've given public dollars to support a community that lacks this level of service, what should you expect for the investment? Should you expect it just to go up to the minimum or should you expect something that's forward looking? That's what we're doing. We're doing forward looking investments. And in fact, we'll continue to do that um, for quite a long time. Just a real quick stat. Uh, in 2015, 69% of the population in, of the rural population in Maine had access to fixed uh, terrestrial 25 down three up service. As of 2020, 92.8% of the population in Maine has that. That puts us at number six in the nation. Uh, we're actually doing really well in terms of getting rural penetration for folks to get up to this level so that once we hit this, we can start moving everybody else up. But the reality is this money comes out of the pockets of ratepayers, And so we have a real problem with the idea that somebody who doesn't even have 25.3 should be paying some of their bill to give somebody who already has 25.3 more. And that's what this bill would do. This bill would say, we can now overbuild these other areas that already have this baseline of service, which is being paid for by the telephone bills of people, including those people in areas with nothing so that this place can get more. We just don't think that's appropriate. We think the build to levels should be high and they are because when we build something with public dollars, it should be lasting and forward looking. So with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, I, I encourage folks to read our testimony. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Sanborn for differentiating for us those two um, technical terms. Um, <clears throat> one thing I was interested in uh, speaking with some folks from Minnesota was that they require that 
anything that their similar authority to our CACMAN authority is partnering on be scalable to 100 over 100, um, which I think is the same concept perhaps as the build two, although maybe not because maybe it means that you're only providing 50 over 50, but you could go to 100 over 100. I guess my question for you is, do you see value in it being clear from the legislature that anytime we're using our funds for an unserved area, which might be 25 over three, that it be required to reach 100 over 100? Um, would, is that something that you believe is technically feasible? Um, thank you, Representative. I do believe it's technically feasible. As with most things, it's a cost question where um, fiber has the capability, once you put it in, to be symmetrical uh, at a gigabit and beyond. It, the question at that point is two things. One, what are the electronics in terms of how many channels can you actually handle uh, simultaneously? That has a cost. Um, and the upload has a cost. We have to get connections down to Boston or, or Quebec or whomever we're connecting to for um, the upload portion of the internet, which again is doable, it's a cost thing. And then we have to make sure that we have sufficient what's called fiber to the node, which is we have, uh, when we're running fiber, we have these nodes that we bring a whole lot of capacity into. And from this node, we then go out to individual locations. So this node has to get built up so that when we promise 100-100, we can deliver 100-100. And that's really the only thing that holds it back once you put in fiber, is what are those sort of backhaul costs that you have included in the project? Technically speaking, once we put in fiber, can we say we're scalable to 100-100? Yes, we are. It's just, what's the question? Uh, what's the cost? is the only question of how do we scale it to that level. So um, I agree, once we put it in, it, can we say it's scalable to 100, 100? Yes. Is there a cost associated? Yes, maybe it's a lot in some regions and only a little bit in others. So uh, it's hard to make a hard and fast, you should commit to 100, 100 everywhere because that can actually reduce the scope of where you can get that fiber. And our position tends to be once you get something in there where we have the fiber build up to the node, people will like it and people will buy it. And once people buy it, that gives us the ability to then reinvest into that node and boost up the speeds for everybody um, and bring the prices down for everybody. So that's our goal. Is it scalable? Yes. Should it be scalable? Absolutely. It should be fiber going in. And uh, that's what we're committed to. I don't know that that's something you should put in statute. I think it's appropriate to keep it in the rules for Connect Main authorities so that they can be observing the reality on the ground and making those determinations on an annual basis to balance that what's the best scalable versus what's the most affordable so that we can get the maximum uh, return on their, our investment of public dollars. Thank you, Representative Sanborn. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Sanborn, I should say. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, haven't seen your name on a ballot yet. I apologize. Not yet. <laughs> uh, didn't mean to insult you there. Uh, Representative <laughs> Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And good morning, Mr. Sanborn. Um, I was wondering in your, um, in your assumptions that this may um, cause areas of the state that can already uh, get access to higher speed broadband, um, are you assuming that there won't be a sort of uh, scoring criteria for release of funds uh, when it comes to prioritizing projects that the, the whole state will just be under one sort of set of criteria for underserved and that Connect Maine won't be able to differentiate? Um, thank you, Representative. Uh, I think that Connect Maine can differentiate. The problem is one of the key drivers appropriately is what's the cost per household served. And that is based on what is the provider putting in what is Connect Maine putting in? What is the federal program putting in? And what's the community putting in? Which means that communities that have more resources up front are going to be able to put in more upfront dollars to bring down the Connect Maine funds per user or per um, connection that will be requested as a part of the grant, which means that lower income communities or communities that don't have the property value base of some of their uh, larger or wealthier neighbors are not gonna be able to put in that same amount of upfront capital, meaning that they're not going to be able to compete as well against 
these larger communities that may have more resources to put in up front. And that's our concern, that that's what can increase the digital divide, where we think it's really important to focus on these locations that don't have those resources because they shouldn't be left behind. They should be getting up to this level. And that's our concern with having this higher standard that we're going to miss some of these smaller areas that really need it and deserve to have this. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Sanborn, um, uh, you mentioned that M Maine is doing fairly well um, in rural broadband deployment at sort of the basic like 25-3 standard. Um, it's my understanding that that uh, sort of positive situation is actually, uh, it looks very different when you apply a higher speed uh, threshold to the analysis and compare Maine with other states at a truly high speed. So, you know, if we were to look at a 10, 10 over 10 or 100 over 100 standard, um, it's my understanding that we're actually uh, more at the back of the pack. Would you disagree with that characterization? I think it, uh, thank you, Representative. I think it uh, depends a little bit on what the data set you're using is. Um, there are two things in play. One, Maine is not only very spread out, but we have uh, very few concentrated cities uh, where you may have uh, a state that has uh, a very dispersed population, but still has some very large uh, central cities. And once you get the central cities, it's much cheaper to serve those locations. And so it's much easier to get 100 by 100 out there. As I was talking about, you bring in the fiber node to serve the area, and the more people who are taking it, the less cost per connection you can do. So the fact that Maine, I mean, Portland's only around 60,000 uh, customers in, in that area. And so that's really small nationwide. And that's kind of our biggest area with Lewiston Auburn kind of tiptoeing up there. So we don't have that concentration. And so that lessens the amount that we're able to provide in the urban areas. Um, however, the reason we're looking at the rural areas is because most of Maine's economy is coming from the rural areas. And that's where we're really trying to promote. The other thing is that when you're looking at some of this data that, especially the data that is driven by speed testing, um, then that's data that it's really hard to do any meaningful audit on because it's not clear that all of the tests are happening in the same way um, and are doing an apples to apples comparison. That's the advantage of the FCC data. It does an apples to apples comparison. Whereas with a speed test, it depends what's your device, what's your modem, what's your router, how many people are using it at any, when you're doing the test itself. It changes over time as a result of that. Where are you pinging off of? For example, I did the uh, broadband coalition speed test and I also did the speed test on my phone uh, through Spectrum. Spectrum pings to Bangor to the Otelco server, whereas the um, main broadband coalition connects to New York State. And so there was a distinction in latency because they were going further with where their test was. So there are all these little details that occur when you're doing that sort of speed test and the self-reporting and speed testing that makes that data kind of questionable. So I would say, are we as good uh, in some of these higher speeds comparatively? Probably not because we don't have the urban concentration. Um, but Will this help us get there? Yes, because as we invest in the rural areas, then that's also going to let us invest in the competitive areas as this need grows throughout the state. So um, it sounds like we, um, I, I didn't hear you disagree with, with my, um, my understanding. So I'll, I'll, I'll look for more um, discussion of that as we go through the day. But um, just to put a finer point on uh, your discussion of speed testing, the alternative we have, Mr. Sanborn, is to rely on uh, data provided by the industry that reflects an entire census block as if it were served. If one household in that entire census block is served, do you disagree with that? Uh no, but with a caveat in that, uh, two caveats. One, this is where I get back to the apples to apples. So does every other state in the nation. And so to the extent that has an impact on us, it's the exact same impact on all the other states. So that's why um, we're sort of focused on that empirical data. But also the Broadband Data Act was pa passed by Congress and 
it looks like it's now being funded, which is requiring a shape file for future 477 filings. Uh, 477 is the form with the FCC wherein companies report their data. So the shape file means you're no longer going to be relying on the census blocks or census tracts. You're actually drawing a GIS style map that's going to be overlaid. And that is going to allow you to have a lot more precision. And uh, that is absolutely going on right now at the FCC level. It is going to be trickling down to what happens at the state. So I agree right now, uh, there are sort of the poison pill uh, census blocks where one customer exists and therefore it's served for the 20 who don't have it. Does that exist? Absolutely. And so there are steps underway at the federal level. It's been enacted, now it's getting funded. So we expect to see that very soon, uh, much higher quality maps. Excellent. Well, we happen to have a, a shapefile expert on the committee and she has raised her hand. Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't help but take the bait on that one as a GIS specialist. Um, could you maybe for the work session, give us more information about the um, precision of the shapefile. So a shapefile is just a file that contains any geographic data. A census block lives in a shapefile. The state of Maine outline lives in a shapefile. A map of roads lives in a shapefile. So it's like kind of meaningless to say they're making a shapefile. What would be meaningful to know is how precise is it? Is it, um, you know, points of homes? Is it polygons of uh, streets that are one mile long? What are we actually looking at when we say shapefile? I don't expect you necessarily know right off the top of your head, but I'm extremely curious about this. And if anyone could look that up so I don't have to spend a lot of time Googling the federal uh, websites, I would appreciate knowing the precision that we're looking at within the shape file. Thank you, Representative. I will certainly get that uh, detail to you for the work session. And I can tell you, it is designed to have significant precision that the idea is not just, you know, here, give us a blob of the state of Maine and that's a shape file. The idea is to actually be mapping out where on road stretches you have service and what that service is. And a, a significant amount of the back and forth that's going on at the federal level right now is the precision of the wireless um, propagation maps, because that has become a question with the shape file of how do you actually build out a propagation map from a tower for wireless so that you can say, instead of just drawing a big circle and saying, well, we're somewhere in here, to actually say, well, what's the, the topography of the area? What are the trees? What are the hills? What's blocking it? So that you have a much more precise uh, build out. So the concept is certainly for precision. I will get you more detail for the work session. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, we appreciate your testimony, Mr. Sanborn. And up next is Melinda Kinney from Charter Communications, um, also speaking against the bill. Welcome. Great. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yep, okay. that's great. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, dialed in on the phone too. So Chairman Barry um, of the Energy Utilities Technology Committee, my name is Melinda Kinney representing uh, Charter Communications. Charter provides broadband services to 293 communities in Maine and our fastest broadband residential broadband service is one gig, which is available statewide. We oppose uh, LD83 for two primary reasons. One, um, changing Connect Maine's definition to 100 by 100 megabits per second will diverse scarce state resources away from rural areas that lack access to broadband services today, much of what we've talked about. Um, and actually, the standard does would, in fact, render the state pretty much uh, um, unserved. And the second would be that um, this bill would also require these broadband symmetrical speeds to be in order in place in order to um, get Connect Maine funds. And the symmetrical mandate is really inconsistent with how consumers use broadband today and, and the actual broadband bandwidth needs of real world applications. So the goal of funding unserved areas should really be to close the digital divide, not to subsidize areas where connectivity already exists. And Connect Maine does have the current authority to reevaluate these un the unserved speed definition on an annual basis and to review trends in consumer usage and, and how people are really um, utilizing their broadband speeds today. The symmetrical mandate is inconsistent, again, with how, how our real world applications are being used. So like for, in, for example, video streaming makes up the vast majority of broadband consumption, which is about 60% of all internet traffic. And it's primarily a downstream, not an upstream experience. 
and even two-way video conference applications are efficient and do not need symmetrical speeds. According to Zoom, it only requires a one megabit um, connection for both up and downstream. And a study by Cable Labs this past November showed that a 25 by three connection was sufficient for, for the use of five video conference calls at one single time. And the internet usage during the pandemic really creates a great example of why the focus on symmetrical speeds is misguided. Um, since March 2020, cable broadband providers in Maine saw an, up, an increase in upstream traffic of 70% and an increase in downstream traffic of 35%, with no speed reductions or material impact to our customers' experience. Nationally, pre-pandemic, 95% of traffic was downstream, and actually during the pandemic, that actually declined oddly enough but to 93%, but the, with the 7% of traffic going upstream. So that's a ratio of 16 to one from downstream to upstream. So as these statistics demonstrate that the focus on symmetrical speeds is really misunderstanding how broadband networks are used and how they function. So redefining to mean broadband to mean the entire state is essentially unserved and focusing on the speed metric that the consumer demand and really how it's actually being applied are not warranted. It just will shift our concern is that it will shift government funding away from these rural areas. And so that's why we oppose uh, LD83 and hope that the committee um, will you know, see, see that as well. Thank you, Ms. Kinney. Questions from the committee? Representative Grahowski. Thank you. Um, really appreciate the extra details that you provided about um, usage. The question that I had, and thank you for the written testimony that I can look at later. I, I always wonder, um, do we have any um, information within those statistics about what people have available? Is it a case of if we build it, they will come? Our, our upload usage is not as high because people don't have good <laughs> upload speeds. Um, I'm a person with a I have an asymmetrical connection that's actually faster on my upload and for the size of the files that I use in the creation that I do in my job, it's super helpful uh, for me to communicate with my colleagues and my customers. But I wonder if somebody is sitting on a 25 over three connection, they don't even think they can do the kind of work that I do. So their upload is never high because it's not really available to them. So I, I didn't know if you had any differentiation in those statistics for people that have access to high upload, are they using it um, at more than people who just don't have it? Does that, I hope that makes sense, but I just wonder if we're getting skewed statistics because it's not even possible for some folks to um, produce or create in the same way. Yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to think of like kind of how to apply that, your question to, to, to grab a data point, um, but I'll say, so for instance, the gigabit speeds that we offer across the state um, for residential services is a you know, 940 down and then it's 35 upload. Um, and so I think that in a lot of cases too, like if it's a business or um, businesses are treated very differently um, in that they can get uh, you know, direct fiber connections and have you know, symmetrical services you know, as, as much as they absolutely need. So I think it's very much kind of to your point, it's very needs based and what um, the consumer, um, you know, has to do for like, whether it's for remote for work or, or what have you, but then they can act, you know, increase the speeds and the services that they get. Um, as far, I mean, I guess, maybe I'm not quite understanding the question as far as like what's available. Are you for like a statewide standard? Is that more what you're asking about for Upload I think my, my question is your information you presented sort of showed that people aren't as interested in using upload speeds and don't need higher upload speeds. But I wonder if the fact that they're not getting high upload speeds in a lot of cases is determining that they're not using it. Um, I, I think the testimony, you know, I think the data that that we've seen and that we've have is really based on what the applications are that the majority of consumers are using. And when you look at um, you know, video conferencing, for instance, it's just more of a download than an upload, um, you know, usage. So it, I think it, I think it's more driven by what the consumers are using today and what those various services, whether it's video, to stream video, video conferencing, um, you know, chatting with family. I think that that's what's driving that was what is driving our data points. Representative Cuddy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Kinney. Uh, when you hook to someone's house in a residential application, is it a zero sum game between upload and download? Um, like, do you only have uh, one gigabit, you know, in, in this, this connection you mentioned? Mm -hmm. And, and it, if you're going to give somebody half a half a gig download, they get half a gig upload and, and it varies like that? Or is it zero sum if you take away from one to add to the, do you have to take away from one to add to the other? So our services are designed to be consistent from for each individual household. So every um, cable modem, if you will, is is provisioned to provide the service that they that they buy, whether it's our baseline of 100 by 10 or the gigabit service of 940 by 35. So um, you know that is so they get that you know that's the service that they would get for that for their particular household. A follow up. Yeah. Yep. Um, is it uh, then to say, so I mean, I'm, I understand that there's, there's throttling, so you, you're only paying for a certain level of service, so you're only given a certain level of service, even though the line could hold whatever the line can hold. But if, is it the case that um, if I'm buying the, 100, the 110, that uh, there's really, is there anything stopping you from offering 100, 100? Is it, is it just uh, how much traffic would be going either way? Um, well, I guess why is, and I should point out too, relatively new to the committee, relatively new to this. So uh, you're, you're getting questions from a point of extraordinary ignorance. And I appreciate if you answer them as though I am extraordinarily ignorant. Do you have the capacity to give somebody 100-100 and it's just that you're, you feel people won't use it so you, you can charge them less by not giving them access to it. Why is it 110 instead of 100-100? Got it. Um, so the, yeah, so the network is configured for, because of consumer usage for a ha higher download than upload, right? So the, um, it's not to say that the, can, that we can't make the network, um, accommodate that, but it also has their software. And I think Ben mentioned this too, and there's, it's soft, there's software and equipment that are needed, um, in different standards to support higher upload speeds. So, um, that would just, there are some, um, network configurations that would need to happen in order to, to reconfigure. Um, and, and that's what we do do actually for like businesses, for instance. And so if there's a business connection, um, uh, uh, then we will ask, you know, they, we can make certain accommodations for that particular account to make, you know, to provide whatever symmetrical services they need. Um, we actually do have um, some like condo and apartment units, like for instance, um, in, in Portland, although our services are, are standard, you know, we provide the same services across the board um, in Maine, but there are a, a, a apartment complexes that have a 200 by 200 service, but they pay for the technology and the equipment to be able to provision that service. Does that help? It does, thank you. Okay. Great, other questions? Ms. Kinney, um, early in your testimony, you said that um, Spectrum slash Charter is uh, currently offering one gigabit service um, statewide. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to double check on um, what that means. I know that Maine has about 560,000 households, about 40,000 businesses. So that's about uh, 600,000 potential customers statewide. Um, are you saying that all of those 600,000 potential customers currently have access or can you qualify that remark a little bit more clearly? Yes. So, um, so our, um, our net, so we have about 426,000 customers in Maine and they all have access to that, to gigabit services. Our network passes, um, I would have to get an updated number, but it was over, you know, 600,000 homes and businesses. So that, that means the homes passed or like it's who, who would be capable of, of accepting or, or getting our services. And so everyone from, you know, Allagash down to York, have, we have access to the same services. Thank you. Of those 426,000 customers. Well, the one, those are just the customers that we have. We have potential to get more. But um, they have, you know, they have other choices and have gone with other providers. Um, so as a follow up, um, my road does not have a 
coaxial cable or a, or a spectrum fiber line running down it. So you cannot physically serve me unless I pay, I don't know, you know, maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars um, $50,000. So can we talk about cost a little bit? What is the cost of that um, for someone who does have, um, you know, a, a, a spectrum fiber line running by um, their house and lives close to yeah. the road? Um, what is sort of the basic package of, you know, what is the monthly cost of that one gig symmetrical service? So, um, actually, I gotta, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I would have to, hang on, I can, I can pull that up. But um, one of the things we, you know, we offer, we have like kind of a standard, um, you know, pricing for broadband services. But I would also say, <clears throat> we also offer, um, you know, single, you know, additional services too. So, but just to give you kind of a, a standard price point, um, hang on, I'm sorry, I'm pulling it up right now. So the kind of like the standard rate card, if you will, for the gigabit service is $135 a month. Um, our, our baseline product for uh, uh, 100 by 10 is about $75. But then if you, and then we do offer a low cost broadband service called Spectrum Internet Assist at a 30 megabit, 30 by four service, and that's about $18 a month. And that's for families who have kids on the National School Lunch Program or seniors who receive SSI benefits. Um, and so they have to qualify, but um, that is available to them. And then, you know, if, if people uh, bundle our services, if you will, um, you know, the price point could be, you know, $45 a month for two services or um, $90 for, for all three. So there are different um, promotional and um, bundled packages and services available for, for folks. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the committee? For Ms. Kinney. Seeing none, we appreciate your testimony and we will proceed to our public advocate, uh, Barry Hobbins, speaking neither for nor against. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, Representative Barry, Senator Lawrence, and members of the Energy, Utilities, and Technology Committee. I'm Barry Hobbins, and I'm the public advocate speaking on behalf of the Office of the Public Advocate. First of all, let me thank Representative Reisman. Um, he has a special place in my life. He doesn't know that, but uh, my sister my sister Ann and her husband are, are, are constituents of Mr. Representative Reisman from Harrison. And on the other side of the district in Denmark, uh, my mother-in-law, who I love, and my sister-in-law and my wife Donna all resided and grew up in Denmark, Maine. So just a little shout out to Representative Reisman for a couple of the, his constituents. Um, I'm speaking neither for nor against the bill, uh, not because I don't have don't have the the enthusiasm about extending broadband, I do. And I really want to say that with the pandemic happening with the validation of a bond issue by the legislators and by the by the um, voters last time uh, and by the federal um, the federal plan of the COVID recovery money which will be significant we'll be able to as a state um, broaden uh, our broadband coverage however um, the problem I have is that if you raise the um, and, and again fortunately I had an opportunity to read the comments of Peggy Schaefer, who is the, as you know, the executive director and who has really been very proactive in identifying the unserved areas. Um, I really think that although it's good intention, there's a fact that I think has been brought out. I think the, rep the last speaker brought this out, but I believe that if you raised um, the to 100, 100 over 100, uh, to the unserved areas, it would might have a situation where everyone in, everyone in the state would qualify for uh, net, network assistance and probably would be need to build out, some areas not, but would be to build out. And what would happen is that they're eligible for Connect Main funding, then the unmet needs 
uh, or the areas that aren't funded um, could have a problem because the first build out will be in dense areas. That's the way it has been in wireless telecommunications law and the process in all states. And that's the situation that I experienced in my 28 years permitting wireless telecommunications facilities. Uh, I think we're on the right direction. I still wonder whether or not um, keeping it by rule instead of by statute for temporarily until we see and everything shakes out with the federal money, the state bond money, additional state bond money, which has been asked for by the governor, um, to, to they're going to they're going to very very um, almost immediately because they're required by rule to uh, revisit the whole unserved definition, and so and they're going to look at as as Peggy Schaefer will tell you in her testimony uh, in much more articulate detail um, that what we think will be the best idea might not be because of because I believe only Minnesota um, has put the put the um, the figures into into statute. I believe most of the states have been by rule. Great. said that, thank you thank very you. much. Any questions, please? Ask me or if you have another one. Excellent, thank Thanks. you, Mr. Hobbins. Uh, questions for the public advocate? Okay, seeing none, we appreciate your testimony. And up next is Nick Batista of the Island Institute and chair of the Connect Maine board uh, to speak neither for nor against. Good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry. Thank you, um, members of the committee. Nick Batista on behalf of the Island Institute and um, as Representative Barry noted, also chair of the Connect Maine Authority Board. I don't have written testimony today and just wanted to add a couple of comments that are neither for nor against, but probably skew more against this idea. Um, certainly appreciate the sentiment that broadband is important and small rural communities are struggling. We, we all, all of us working on broadband are very, very well aware of this. Um, I would say this probably isn't the way to go about solving some of the challenges that we're, we're facing in the state, um, but I really appreciate the conversations you've just had and the questions you've been asking and your, your willingness to, to dig into these issues. Um, as a policy matter, I would question the wisdom of enshrining this definition in, in statute. Just as the world changes, it can be challenging to get a bill in um, and align the legislative timing with considerations around uh, long session, short session with needs to get um, funding out to solve these problems. If you miss getting a bill in for the long session, maybe you're, you're looking at uh, waiting two years to, to change the, the definitions. And I, I think that's probably not a particularly helpful construct. Um, it's not the, certainly not the best way to meet community, community needs. Um, and I would just also note that the unserved um, definition and the goal are two different conversations. Ben um, Sanborn from TAM spoke um, well about that. And um, as a practical matter, solving our state broadband challenges takes money. Um, it's not a definition of change. It's, it's the willingness to provide the funding to really tackle the challenges. So if you're interested in going down some of these roads, I would suggest thinking about whether a resolve around the definition of broadband service is a more appropriate vehicle. Um, or, or some of the other places where broadband um, ends up in, in statute. Um, but I don't, I don't think enshrining an unserved definition is going to quite get us to solve these challenges. Thank you, Mr. Batista. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, um, Mr. Batista, I just want to um, ask about the Island Institute's involvement with the Maine Broadband Coalition. Um, as members of this committee know, the legislature does have a bipartisan bicameral broadband caucus, which has been discussing some of these ideas and meets every other week. Um, am I correct that the Island Institute is one of uh, many members of the Maine Broadband Coalition, our, our partner in that effort? We, we are, um, we have a couple of staff in, involved. Um, I'm involved occasionally on, on parts of the coalition and Kendra Jo Grindle, our strategy lead for broadband has been supporting a bunch of the coalition's programmatic work and helping to 
um, connect the work that we're we're doing in you know supporting 50-ish communities across the coast um, to the to the statewide conversations about how to help communities move forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, we appreciate your joining us. And yep. we will go on to Peggy Schaefer, the director of the Connect Me Authority. Welcome. Good morning. Um, you know, I don't, I've listened to this and I don't have a, I, I've not a lot to add, right? Because you had a lot of the pieces here. I think um, what we're seeing is the, is the, the very real frustration at the community level um, about data and how we get it and how that impacts their strategies. Um, people, uh, what we have found um, is that communities really tend to get hung up on this data piece. We try to push them beyond it. We try to say, focus on your goals first, where you wanna be, but they get, th th we know there's several catch points, right? And this is one of them. Um, and which is one of the reasons why we are helping support this, this speed test statewide is because it gives them sort of the tool to figure it out, also gives them sort of a place to move to, right? So once they, if you know, they can check that box and then they can begin to think about, okay, so what is it we want for a community? Um, you know, I understand um, completely, uh, um, one of the things that we know about a lot of Maine is that the, what we call the urban cores of, the, of these rural towns are served, right? Sort of the downtown area is served. And it's when you get out beyond that, that your service is bad. And we also know that it's really hard to put together a plan that is looks a looks a little bit like spaghetti and um, doesn't bring everybody uh, in town potentially up to the same level. Um, so, uh, with that, um, it's important to note that our funding um, can be used in areas that are unserved. Right. So you can put a package together that brings everybody up to the same level. It's just that our funding can only be used for the pieces that are unserved. So you need to figure out where the other pieces come in. Um, the definition of unserved actually was changed, I want to say in 2018, um, from, oh, I, I euphemistically say it no, was nothing over nothing. I think it was 1.5 over 0.75 to 25 over 3, which was, you know, not an insignificant jump, right? Um, and so that made a lot more of the state eligible for funding. Um, the uh, build standard, I believe, was put in place about 2015, 2016 as a build standard of 10 over 10. And as Ben pointed out, there is a distinct difference, right? One is what we expect you to build to when we give you money, and the other is where we can fund. So there is a distinct difference there in, in how we look at those numbers. Both of those um, are defined by rules so that we can change them um, it, we're, we revisit it annually and we can change them based on market needs and market desires and market changes. Um, I am a huge fan, as most of you know, of, the, of high quality service and especially a high quality up speed. Um, we are building networks that are going to last 40 years. So while I get that people don't necessarily need an up speed today and whatever, we are building a network that is going to last longer than today or tomorrow. It is a future network. So it's important that we remember that as we look at all these standards. Um, it is the only state that I know of that has a different, has a higher, up, uh, higher speed level of unserved than the FCC is actually South Dakota. And their definition of unserved is 100 over 10. Everybody else is either at 25.3 or below that. Um, and um, I was just on a call last week with a bunch of uh, uh, state broadband leaders and we were asked the question, would it be helpful if the FCC changed the speed? And the answer is it would, it would because it then would set a standard across the country that everybody has to live by. And it's a big agency that can then take the lead on that, right? And since they are like the source of the maps for them to redefine what is unserved helps all of us. And so I think it's hard for states to make huge leaps around the unserved where we can provide funding definition 
without support from the from national because then what happens is your your federal funds have a different standard than your state funds and we're trying to match state federal and local and it becomes much more difficult um you know there are a couple states who have more than a couple but the, who have um, goals in statute that says by x uh people in our state will have a service of you know 100 over 100 or um, and that that's sort of one way you can look at it. I, I really think that um, at this point in time where technology is changing, where funding is changing, it's really important to maintain the flexibility that we have, which is in rule, not in statute. Statutes, as you know, not impossible to change, but it's on a two year cycle, which makes it much harder to change. Um, you know, the board is we are aware that we are looking at this uh, every year. And we are starting to have the conversation because we are entering into our triennial plan of what is our next piece gonna be? Are we gonna raise the build standard? Are we gonna raise the unserved standard? We, this year, uh, when we did our rule change, added um, in the defini definition section, what we call common use applications, which gives us the basis to look at what are the uses that people have of the, in of the internet and how do we make sure that our standards make sure those uses are, uh, are usable? And so I think that we have set the stage for this. Um, and you know, to some extent, the, the letter that Senator King sent uh, with other senators that essentially told the state, told the federal government, you know, make a standard that's, that's even across all of your agencies and make it high is also a good step. Um, but for us to go out on our own right now and change the up speed uh, or change the whole definition of unserved as we're coming into, we're in the middle of a, of a grant cycle. We got another one probably this summer. We have some amounts of federal money coming. It makes it very, um, it makes it harder for communities and us to figure out what's going on, right? I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you, it does. Questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Browski. Thank you. And I should know this and just for clarity, so I don't have to go running to look at the rules. Is our, is your definition of unserved currently 25 over 10 or 25 over three? Our uh, definition of unserved is 25, three. Our build two, which in other words, we will fund a project that serve, that every project has to serve. It's, it's at least 10 over 10. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Director Schaefer. You're off the hook. And um, I do have uh, some news that Sarah Davis from Consolidated uh, has asked to testify as well. So we're adding her to the list and she has joined us. Ms. Davis, welcome. The floor welcome. is yours. Good morning, um, Chairman Barry, members of the committee. Let me first start by saying I'm sorry I made a mistake when signing up, and I appreciate you indulging me and giving me just a few minutes to talk here. So thank you. Um, I, I will not be long. I will be very brief. You've heard it all. You've heard the policy issues. They've all um, talked to you about what the issue with train, changing the standard and setting that in statute without any flexibility will do in the state. Um, I will address a few of the things I've heard. Um, Chairman Barry, you talked about um, the, the state and its ability to serve at a very high level. Um, consolidated is largely fixing that problem in many areas. Um, we have a $224 million investment we're making uh, from 22 to 25 in the state of Maine, building out a fiber to the home, uh, fiber to the prem, two gig product. Um, to 450,000 locations in Maine. Um, and that gets directly to the heart of this. Uh, we heard that the status quo uh, was what it was and that there was no incentive to change that. Clearly there is um, and consolidated is living that out through an investment that will largely reach the areas of the state that have some level of service today that are more densely populated. You know, this kind of investment expects a return. Um, and so it will really go to those areas. And a change to this definition would create many of those areas eligible for state funding at the time at the same time there's private investment in a full fiber to the prem premier product at two gigs, um, which also comes with 
um, some commitments on a low price service thanks to the good work of the public advocate. So, you know, that that's the problem with the policy. Some of the saddest stories we hear um, here at Consolidated, I'm sure Peggy hears at the Connect Main Authority, are the people that are at the end of the road where there's very few of them and they really need service. And I really think that's where our focus should be. That's where state money should go um, to try to get those last people where the, the private sector is not going to spend its money to get a level of service that's acceptable. Um, I'm sure Peggy and Nick could confirm, but I believe that all of their uh, projects that have come in as a result of the 1010 standard have been um, fiber to the prem projects. You are getting what you want, which is a lasting service for your state money that will, as Peggy said, you know, live for 40 years. Um, and that's that's what's important. You know, um, that's what they see. That's what they get to score when it comes in. And that will continue. Um, we have our first round with the $15 million that um, was passed by referendum. Oh, I think that we need to wait till we get through that process, see what comes in. Everything I've heard is it will all be fiber to the prem projects. They're all in areas that desperately need broadband. I think that's all a good thing. I think if you want to change a policy, you need a reason to. And as Peggy said, you know, one of the challenges is money. If you have unlimited funds, sure, make everybody eligible. But since the funds are limited, I think we need to focus on what we're trying to do, and that is to get those without service to have a level of service. And I think that's working. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Three minutes exactly. Thank you. Uh, questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, uh, you're off the hook. Uh, thank you, Ms. Davis. And um, Izzy, is there anyone else who you know of that wishes to testify at this time? I've gone through my list. There's no one Mr. that Chair. I know of. Nope. Oh. <clears throat> Representative Brachowski? I actually did think of a question for Ms. Davis if it's not too late. Uh, it looks like she's still with us. So I'm still here. In the nick of time. Thank Go you. ahead. Um, my question was, and I think you alluded to it, um, you know, we heard a little bit about the spectrum cost structure. Um, could you tell us what's available for folks that are um, having trouble affording internet through consolidated? So I can tell you some and not all. Um, so consolidated currently um, has a number of products at a number of different prices. We see take rates at very low product levels, um, not the full full service available due to income limitations uh, frequently. And we share that with communities when we work with them. So it is a very real situation that, that people you know, cannot afford broadband. With our new fiber to the prem build, as I was indicating, um, we are gonna offer a 50-50 meg product at a very affordable rate. We are not advertising that rate, it's confidential um, because until it's in the market, you know, we don't wanna tip our competitors off to competing with us. But the public advocate um, was part of a stipulation at the PUC um, and that was one big thing that was really important to the public advocate was to get a really good service at a cost that they were very happy with. So suffice it to say, it's very good, but unfortunately due to um, you know concerns with uh, confidentiality, I can't share that with you today, but I think you could get commitments from the public advocate that people will be very happy with that. Representative has any follow up? Nope, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and any final other questions for Ms. Davis? Okay, seeing none, you really are dismissed this time. And uh, it's my understanding that that is uh, the, the, we've gotten through the list for LD83. So that will conclude the hearing on uh, LD83. We'll take it up at work session in a couple of weeks and advise interested parties uh, as to when that is. Um, next up, we have LD 511, and um, I will go ahead and open the public hearing on LD 511, which is uh, an act to require telephone service providers to provide at no cost to customers services designed to reduce the number of so-called robocalls and automatically dial telephone calls. It'll be presented to us today by Representative Dodge, the sponsor. And I do want to call the committee's attention to an email that um, you all should have received, also sent to interested parties uh, who are signed up for the committee's list. Uh, what came, went out um, under Dan Tartikoff's email uh, at 10, 12 a.m. yesterday. 
uh, with a sponsor's amendment to the bill, um, which I think she'll be presenting to us today. I just wanna make sure people have that uh, language in front of them. It does involve a name change to the bill. So it would now be an act regarding services designed to reduce the number of so-called robocalls and automatically dialed telephone calls. Um, with that, uh, Representative Dodge, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just draw your attention to my backdrop, which includes some significant boxes of cookies. Excellent, more virtual cookies. <laughs> Good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry, and esteemed members of the Energy, Utilities, and Technology Committee. I am Representative Jan Dodge of House District 97, which includes Belfast, Northport, and Waldo. I am here to present LD 511, an act to require telephone service providers to provide, excuse me, at no cost to customers, services designed to reduce the number of so-called robocalls and automatically dialed telephone calls. Legislative service is often judged by the degree of success in solving constituent problems. I am here today to present this bill and ask for your support in beginning to solve the problem of robocalls for the people of Maine. You know what I'm talking about. The problem of inappropriate use of a utility has a long history of attempted federal fixes, such as the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991, the Truth in Caller ID Act of 2010, in May of 2019, the Telephone Robocalls Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrent, or the TRACED Act, increased the fines the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, can impose and lengthened the statute of limitations. In July 2019, there was the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act. Earlier this month, Senator Collins joined colleagues in proposing the Anti-Spoofing Penalties Modernization Act, which proposes to double previously set penalties. This was announced on March 4th, which was declared Slam the Scam Day. In the 129th legislature, the governor signed Senator Chenette's bill that classified robocalls as an unfair trade practice for a telemarketer to misrepresent their phone number or utilize an artificial voice, but this is not enough. Last year, I got a robocall from my own phone number. The National Council of State Legislators has recently advised states to take their own actions to protect citizens. I called my phone provider and asked if they had technology to reduce or eliminate unwanted calls. I asked about cost. It was free. I requested the service and my robocalls were instantly reduced. Service providers have the technology. I submitted the original bill language. Maine was on the way to quieter evenings and scam reduction. Enter Margot Saunders, Senior Counsel at the National Consumer Law Center in Washington, D.C. When I asked for advice, she shared that several months ago, the TRACED Act added a new rule, subsection 227J, to the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, 47 U.S.C. 227. This new rule requires the FCC to ensure that robocall blocking services are provided and section 227J1B requires that the blocking services, and I quote, are provided with no additional line charge to the consumers, end quote. This was challenged as making a requirement of service without compensation, a taking. She stated the real problem is the FCC order does not require all telephone service providers, especially those operating in rural areas to implement the blocking requirements. As a result, many lower income consumers who rely on their landline telephones are most vulnerable to unstoppable telemarketing and scam calls. Your bill would provide real protections for Maine consumers if it mandated the blocking services." End quote. This bill aims to fix this. Today, I am including an amendment to this bill that changes the title and clarifies that a telephone utility must inform each subscriber as to the nature and cost of any such service offered that is designed to reduce the number of calls received by a subscriber that are made using an automated telephone calling device or an artificial or pre-recorded voice. This amendment also clarifies that a telephone utility must describe how the subscriber may elect to enroll in or take advantage of such service. Finally, the amendment provides that a telephone utility must offer 
any such service at a reasonably affordable cost to all subscribers in the state. I urge the committee to please pass LD 511 as amended. Let's use technology to improve telephone service by reducing the number of robocalls Maine citizens receive. Thank you. And I will attempt to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Representative Dodge. Are there questions from the committee? Uh, I'll start with Representative Kessler. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Dodge. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to clarify, this is only for landline service? I am not sure about that. Um, I am hoping that this will be all services. Representative Kessler, any follow-up? <clears throat> Okay, we'll proceed to Representative Krahowski. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is not a question, but I just want to thank you, Representative Dodge, for doing some really great research on a topic that I know annoys everybody that has a phone, and I've had constituents reach out to me, but it's always very daunting to tackle the state and federal relationship and what we can do while we wait for the go federal government to take action. So I just wanna thank you for finding some sort of path forward that helps our constituents at least learn about what options are available. And I know it, having worked on things like internet privacy and net neutrality, I know how hard it can be to thread the needle. And I hope we can figure out with you how to sew up <laughs> this problem. So I just wanna thank you for that. Thank you very much. I That was part of the whole process. I thought I had what seemed to be a simple solution, but as I consulted more people, it was um, not as straightforward as I had hoped. And there's still, because this is not my um, my area of expertise, I, I still am looking to you folks to help, as you say, to try to um, straighten this out. <laughs> Thanks. It's a tangled web that we weave on this committee, Representative Dodge. Uh, Representative Cuddy has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Dodge. And I definitely echo Representative um, Krakowski's comments. Your your research on this is exceptional. I think you've, uh, by doing it all, you've already taken like the first two or three steps this committee might have taken, and, and you've moved them aside so we can really get to the heart of it. Um, I, in looking at your bill, uh, in, in listening to your testimony, um, you said that were you to mandate in, in testimony, you said that you were told that were you to mandate this service, it would really offer a great protection, but the bill doesn't, doesn't seem to mandate it. It mandates that, um, and, and I'm looking at the, um, what we were sent by uh, Mr. Tartikoff, the amendment, that they must offer the, the service, but they must offer it at a, at a reasonable price. So did you, did you intentionally stop short of mandating it for a reason? Again, Mr. Tartikoff may be able to clarify that because I sent him my white paper and said, please, can, can you help with this? But um, I believe your question may um, refer to the it, earlier in my testimony about if you mandate it and you mandate it at no cost, it's considered a taking. And supposedly already the service is mandated, um, but that was challenged in court um, again, if it's offered for free, it's a taking. So this, that's why I said, okay, um, is it going to be too nebulous and too um, sort of floaty um, to say at a reasonable cost? Um, that doesn't seem as specific as I'd like it, but um, if that's a starting point, perhaps. Right. Um, and a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair? Sure, go ahead. The, yeah, I, I was referring to, um, you had quoted uh, Margot Saunders, um, and I'll just quickly read that. She stated that the real problem was the FCC order does not require all telephone service providers, especially those in, in operating rural areas, to implement the blocking requirements. And then the last sentence, it says, your bill would provide real protections for main consumers if it mandated the blocking services. And this seems like, uh, and, and, and this, isn't, this isn't a criticism, this is trying to understand it seems like this is an incremental step toward that where um, the service providers may need to let us know what's available to us uh, in, in trying to block these. I mean, I, I use a, a Google Assistant on my phone that most people don't know is available. It doesn't block them, but it adds a, um, a firewall that a real human gets past very easily 
but that a recording doesn't. Um, so it, it seems like a, a an incremental step towards getting to where everybody could be using this if they wanted to, but we're not mandating that the service providers absolutely have to provide this, um, even if you know if they added a, a charge to the bill. Um, so it weren't a taking. We're not going to mandate that they're they're going to do it. We're just going to mandate that they explain to the users uh, of their service that this exists, I guess, is, is where we're looking. So thank and you. I don't think there's even a question there, actually. I just sort of talked myself through it and wound up not asking you a question. I apologize. Well, my answer to your non-question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, my answer to your non-question, Representative Cuddy, is I was being trying to be careful about using the word mandate However, if your committee in its infinite wisdom sees a path forward to do such a thing, I would be very um, amenable to that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dodge. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, we look forward to the shipment of Girl Scout cookies. And, uh, I uh, do want to caution the committee just before we go on to uh, the next to testify that uh, it is important in a public hearing to um, try to frame comments as questions um, whenever possible. And uh, we'll, we'll um, hopefully be slightly more efficient that way. Um, so up next is Barry Hobbins um, from the Public Advocates Office. And welcome back, Mr. Hobbins. Welcome, welcome this morning to uh, members of the committee, Representative Barry, Senator Lawrence. I'm Barry Hobbins speaking on behalf of the Office of the Public Advocate uh, in favor of the LD 5111 as amended by the amendment that has been presented to the committee for consideration. You know, the office uh, is supportive of the intent behind the original bill, but after reviewing information, the sponsor with her incredible due diligence received from the National Consumer Law Center, I have to acknowledge it, that it seemed clear that the amendment uh, was appropriate. Um, the amended language would require the telephone utility to provide details of a service designed to reduce the volume of calls received from automated te telephone calling devices to the consumer, as well as including how a, to enroll in the service and at what cost. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, we receive, uh, we receive in our office and individually, you probably have the same situation, people complaining about this type of this type of service uh, and, this, and this type of practice. Uh, what I believe is the compromise in the amendment is to, to put the phrase reasonable, reasonably affordable cost. Um, I, I know this committee has in the past, um, basically because of, because of sincerity and the like have pressed the industry through through bills that have passed and been signed by the governor, uh, which unfortunately four of them have been aggressively opposed in federal court. But this is one. This is one. I think you have to have a judgment call on. Um, but even though we rec we recognize this is limited to telephone utilities. Well, I'm hoping that we could get the other telecom providers to follow the spirit of the legislation and make the same information readily available at, to their consumers and to their to the ratepayers. So that's uh, my testimony. I do want to thank uh, Representative Dodge for bringing this up. It's a very important issue to discuss as a matter of policy. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hobbins. Any questions for the public advocate? Uh, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
good morning, Mr. Hobbins. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, in terms of definitions, is it your understanding that this bill would also incorporate wireless carriers? It, I interpret the definition of telephone utilities. I believe it doesn't fall within the category because of VoIP, because of VoIP technology, and also because of the way the wireless telecommunications um, industry, even though they helped put my kids through college, um, um, aggressively fought uh, anything that would be in their purview, uh, against their purview. And as you know, the F FCC um, is the problem. And the idea of precedent and the idea of circumventing um, circumventing the federal law by local legislation. But I, I think that this will send, this sends a message. I hope the industry will look at it and say, you know, this is what the spirit of the legislation is and not hide behind the federal the federal FCC. Um, and I think they've learned a lesson and that is the state of Maine and the Maine legislature and the governor of the state um, did not, were not threatened by the, by the responses of um, the industries. And I think they respect that. And I'm maybe thinking that the, they will follow the spirit of the legislation if they were smart would be good public policy and good and good corporate citizenship. Representative Kessler, did you have a follow up? Yeah. So uh, was the uh, was the answer no? Yeah. The answer is right. it, it applies to wireline carriers because of the definition of tele telephone utilities. That's why, for example, okay. um, consolidated would be part of this because the other thing is they're a polar. They provide provo provide the last resort um, communication. So, okay, the Thank you last resort. Thanks. And just for those new to the committee, um, po Polar or provider of last resort service is also um, it's sometimes described that general category of service is sometimes called plain old television telephone service. It's it's the the legacy of Ma Bell and the old fashioned um, copper wire um, telephone service, which as Representative Dodge said, um, a lot of Maine still does uh, depend on exclusively, including many senior citizens that the public advocate looks out for. Um, right. Representative Grahowski. Um, my question is a follow up to that uh, question from Representative Kessler and your answer, Mr. Hobbins. Is there the bill right now looks like it's only regulating those uh, wired telephone service providers, but is there a reason you can think of why we couldn't just change the way it's worded and include the cellular and VoIP uh, service providers? Oh, you could include that in the language as we did with um, uh, um services by the um, cable networks. Yeah, you could, you could include it, but I'll forewarn you, um, the, the jets will be flying into the Portland jet port with, with very expensive suits. So we'll be going to the federal courts. And, uh, and fortunately for us, we had a tenacious, a tenacious deputy attorney general, assistant attorney general who, who gave it his all and did a really good job. I, I did happen to uh, go over there one day uh, and I, I was very impressed. The, he was on one side with a with the assistant of assistant, and there were like twenty five um, lawyers and corporate corporate citizens uh, from all the different industries there. So, um, so you do what you want. I just want to forewarn you: you'll be in federal court. So you're saying this could be an economic development piece as we bring more tourists to Maine? Well, you know, I'm sure those. <laughs> I'll be careful what I say. They, they did seem to have the sessions, uh, the court sessions in the summertime and not in the wintertime. Um, I don't know whether that was planned or not. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for the public advocate? Uh, Representative Kessler, back to you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just discovered a thing that I would appreciate some follow-up on in the work session. Um, as I see the statute that this would be placed under um, it has to do with caller ID and um, current statute states that they must provide uh, yeah. um, call blocking to a, yes. a certain extent for reasons of health and safety. And I was wondering if um, uh, you could tell us um, if we can sort of match that requirement for health and safety reasons like frauds, uh, scams and all that. That's a good question. Uh, my first advice would be to is to have the attorney general's office take a look at this uh, to see whether or not it's consistent with the um, issues involving taking, which are used overwhelmingly within this, this sphere of uh, cases and also federal preemption. So those yeah. are the issues that I think you have to, to look at. I, I, we'd be more than happy to take a, a, a look at it, but the Attorney General's office is the ones that are gonna have to defend this. And uh, it would be a good idea to, to do that. Um, you can have, um, oh, and if you want, um, we will make the same request of the Attorney General's office. But I think it's, it's stronger if the Committee of Jurisdiction makes, it, makes the call, but I will make a personal call to to the attorney general who mentioned this too. Thank you. Thank you. Great, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Hobbins. And um, up next, uh, unless my list is incomplete and we will check um, the last testimony on this bill from Mr. Sanborn. And just for folks uh, planning purposes, I anticipate at least a 15 minute break after this public hearing concludes before we take up uh, the first work session of the day. I know a number of folks have been waiting patiently for that to begin. So just for your planning purposes, probably be at least 20 minutes. Um, Mr. Sanborn, welcome. Thank you, Representative Barry, members of the committee. My name is Ben Sanborn. I'm the Executive Director and Council for Telecommunications Association of Maine. Uh, we did submit testimony. Um, we were aware that there was going to be a amendment offered, so we touched briefly upon that as well. I just want to get into um, a little bit of the detail regarding the difficulties with implementing it. Uh, there's something at the federal level called stir shaken. And that is what is going into effect to uh, essentially handle robocalls. And it creates a, a piece of metadata that travels with calls that gives you information about this call uh, may have originated from an inappropriate site. You do a data dip to find out whether or not this is within the blocked list essentially. And then that can give you the information as to whether or not to forward the call on to the next of the receivers uh, in the chain of originating carrier to finally the terminating carrier. And all of this was designed with, uh, frankly, wireless and VoIP in mind. And that's what they're doing at the federal level. The problem is that a lot of the rural areas have what's called a TDM switch, which is not a software-based switch. It is a circuit-based switch. And so the metadata that has been developed to handle this doesn't work. Um, so that being said, there are work groups that are trying to figure out how to go around this. There is data that gets passed with calls. It's called System Signaling 7 or SS7. So they're trying to figure out ways to essentially how do we get a similar metadata into a SS7 that will go into a switch circuit. So it's not that any company I'm aware of doesn't want to do this. We absolutely do. This is why we're neither for nor against. We think it's a good idea. And um, the tricky part is, can some of these switches do it right now or not? It's not that we don't want to. It's that it's a question of how do we get that technology moving forward? So um, with regards to the amended bill, uh, the only questions we had, and I laid these out in the written testimony, were notice is fine. The question is, when do you give it? How do you give it? What do the contents need to be? Uh, again, we're not opposed to the idea of having some sort of notice, but we really need to get that spelled out in terms of what the expectation is, just so we know what we're supposed to do. Because we do get a lot of feedback from our customers about spam, and we don't like it any more than anyone else. And if we can block it uh, in a way that 
works, we want to. We just want to make sure that we don't get into a situation, as was noted by the sponsor of the bill, um, Representative Dodge had received a call that had spoofed her own number. We have seen circumstances where a person's personal number is getting spoofed, or in one example, a sheriff's office number was getting spoofed. And so the reason you need a sophisticated uh, system for doing a data dip is that you need to be able to figure out when was this spoofed versus when was this a legitimate wrong number uh, that should be blocked because we don't wanna be blocking calls from the local sheriff's department because at an earlier point, someone had spoofed that number and it got reported as spam. So it's complicated, uh, we're working on it. And that's why we think it's important to keep this at the federal level the added benefit of keeping it at the federal level is that uh, wireless and VoIP do get rolled in at the federal level. They are subject to federal jurisdiction. And as I said, stir and shaken are being uh, undertaken by both the VoIP providers and wireless providers. So I think if you implement a notice requirement at the state level, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, we don't oppose that. It's just, I think as this process moves forward, we need more detail as to what a notice requirement means. What is the notice and how does it get out there? So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sanborn. Questions from the committee, Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can't help that I'm in a silly mood, I guess, but um, when you say you would like more specificity, should we um, entertain our usual style of specifying font sizes, where and how often you should be notifying people on their bills? Is, is that the sort of specificity you're looking for? Uh, thank you, Representative. I think that what I had put in my written testimony was, for example, is this an annual notification? Is this at a point of sale? Is this something that we do in a bill stuffer? And at that point, maybe it is sort of a, a bill stuffer. It cannot be any smaller font size than you would advertise any of your services, things like that. Um, that's fine. Uh, I think that from our perspective, we've, we've said this in a lot of different venues, we just need clarity and stability. And that's what businesses want. We just need to know what we're supposed to be doing and then we can do it. And so uh, we would prefer to have this spelled out. I think ideally what we would uh, think would be appropriate would be a point of sale and then maybe an annual bill stuffer or a point of sale and keep it on a prominent site on your website. Something like that would make sense um, because a lot of people don't necessarily get physical bills anymore. And so a bill stuffer might not really work. So. I think that's probably what we would do, but we haven't thought a lot about what that would look like, so. Great, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question about um, the uh, feasibility of just banning robocalls altogether. Um, and I, in some research that I'm doing during this public hearing, I had seen how uh, last July, actually, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, states can ban robocalls altogether. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, how easy that would be for uh, the companies that you represent to do. Thank you, Representative. I think that that's where the tricky part comes in of how do you know that it's a robocall versus somebody spoofing a legitimate number uh, versus a legitimate uh, outreach for, for, as a personal example, uh, at one point in time, I had direct TV. I don't have direct TV now, but I get a whole lot of outreach from them about, we want you back because I had previously had a business relationship with that company. It is not spam or spoofing or any of the, the robo calling. If they give me a call because I had established that previous business relationship. So that gets hard also. How do you make that delineation between what was a legitimate a legitimate business contact versus what is somebody just spamming you. Um, so that's that's the detail. That's where it gets hard. That is what they're working on with the stir and shaking to really try and parse out at the very least those calls that are clearly illegitimate and those calls that are clearly being handled in a manner that is designed to either scam uh, individuals or to deceive them in some manner. Um, and I believe that's why there has been language put in uh, by the uh, by the state to declare these to be unfair trade practices when you or deceptive trade practice when you are in fact spoofing another number um, to make that clear so that there is a cause of action. So uh, we absolutely support coming down hard on these situations. It's just it's complicated and frankly they're good at what they do when what they do is scamming people and finding loopholes. And so that's what we're trying to 
kind of race against is how do we close the loopholes faster than they find them? Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Sanborn. Thank you. And um, Izzy, do we have anyone else uh, that's jumped in uh, since last night asking to testify? We do not. Okay. Very well. In that case, I will um, close the public hearing on LD 511. And um, what I'd like to do now is give the committee a break, a uh, chance to stretch your legs, feed the chickens, whatever it is you need to do. Um, and we will come back for our work sessions. Um, so we'll take up uh, a 20 minute break and resume at 1115. If everyone could please remember to turn off your uh, video and mute your audio. Um, that would be great. And we'll see everyone at 1115.
Okay. We are back. If folks could just turn on their video so I know you're with us. That would be great. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it looks like Senator Vitelli has joined us, which is great, so that we'll be able to take a vote on bills since we're moving into work session mode. Um, just for the folks who are waiting for their bill to come up, um, we will be starting with LD 340. Uh, we'll then go on to LD 487. I'm guessing that may take us up to lunchtime. So 507, 526, and 9 are likely to come up in the afternoon after lunch. All right, and it looks like we have a quorum. So <clears throat> we'll go ahead and um, jump in with our work session on LD340, uh, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, we uh, have our committee analyst uh, for this bill, Dan Tartikoff, with us. And Dan, I'm hoping you can just walk us through your analysis, and we're going to want to really um, understand the two amendments that have recently surfaced as well. <clears throat> so I'll turn it over to you to um, walk us through everything. And I forget, do you guys like to do a screen share? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So I just mailed out a couple of documents to you. Um, some of them you received before. Um, so uh, this is LD340, an act to allow for the establishment of commercial property assessed clean energy programs. This is Senator Sanborn's bill. The bill allows the Efficiency Main Trust or municipality to establish a, what we'll call a CPACE program to finance energy saving improvements um, on qualifying property. CPACE is a financing structure available in many states. It was suggested during the hearing there are 24 states with CPACE programs. Um, I wrote suggested because I tried to verify this and, and there seems to be some discrepancy about whether states have uh, a commercial PACE program or residential PACE program or whether it's combined, but there's a number of programs uh, in other states. Um, it's a financing structure in which commercial property owners borrow money for energy efficiency, renewable energy, or other projects and make repayments via an assessment on their property tax bill. The financing arrangement typically remains with the property even if it is sold. Uh, I've noted here that the bill closely mirrors the majority report amendment to LD 1748, uh, which was considered and voted by EUT in 2020 during the 129th legislature. It was a divided report, 9-3 uh, in favor. It was voted in February 2020, but it was not reported out of committee until July, um, and it thus died upon the conclusion of the 129th legislature. Uh, I've noted here that Maine currently has what I guess you could call a residential PACE program on the books. It was enacted in 2010 and codified at uh, Title 35A, Chapter 99. That program is in many ways structured and administered in a manner similar to the CPACE program proposed in the bill. However, that residential program is designed to provide loans to residential homeowners to finance energy upgrades or energy efficiency improvements on their properties. Uh, I've listed in the analysis those um, individuals and entities that tested in favor of, against, or neither for or against on the bill. And so I'll move into uh, some notes and proposed amendments. Um, so there were a number of issues raised by what I'll call the banking slash lending community. This was from the Maine Association of Realtors, Maine Bankers Association, and Maine Credit Union League. And so uh, they had raised the issue that under the bill, with a couple exceptions, a CPACE lien on a qualifying property will take priority over any other liens on the same property. In the case of a municipal foreclosure on a property with a CPACE lien where the assessment, the CPACE assessment is delinquent or in default, uh, those entities asserted that the state municipal foreclosure law <clears throat> does not require a municipality that forecloses on that property to pay excess proceeds to any subrogated lien holders. I believe that law, which is uh, 36 MRSA section 949, 
uh, would allow the municipality to um, take the money owed and then uh, provide the rest of the proceeds directly to the um, to the property owner. Uh, those entities suggest that this creates an increased lending risk that may restrict the availability of the CPACE program to interested property owners. Uh, you were all sent through me yesterday a proposed amendment, um, which uh, I understand was drafted by the Nature Conservancy, which Senator Sanborn is sponsoring, and it makes a number of changes to the bill. Uh, as described by the Nature Conservancy in the email you received, the amendment is designed to address concerns raised about the bill by that banking lending community uh, that I just described, namely that a municipal um, a municipal tax foreclosure triggered by a delinquent CPACE assessment could result in a tax sale of the property and the excess proceeds from that sale would not be distributed, uh, dispersed to lien holders. The amendment requires that if a CPACE assessment is delinquent, but the subject property is, in, is otherwise in good standing, then the municipality would assign the CPACE lien to the CPACE lender, who could then commence a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure action, resulting in a disbursement of the sale proceeds to the lien holders in order of seniority. Uh, I've noted here that the Nature Conservancy proposed in its written testimony uh, three, uh, I guess you could call sort of minor amendments to the bill. Uh, those amendments appear to have been incorporated into that proposed amendment um, sponsored by Senator Sanborn that you received yesterday. As uh, Representative Barry indicated, uh, there was also some proposals from, again, what I'm calling the banking lending community. This was um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, at the at the hearing in written testimony and in person, um, those members of this banking lending community made a couple suggestions for amendment to the bill. Uh, one was to amend state municipal foreclosure law to allow for the disbursement of excess funds to subrogated lien holders in the event of a municipal foreclosure on a property with a CPACE lien. Another suggestion was to follow the model taken by some other states with CPACE programs and establish uh, what's called a debt service reserve fund uh, and or a loan loss reserve fund, which would protect lenders under those same circumstances where there's a municipal foreclosure. Uh, and the third option was to establish a working group to propose solutions to this sort of more narrow issue in the bill. Um, as I've noted here, Yesterday, you did receive uh, some recommendations from the Maine Bankers Association and Maine Credit Union League uh, regarding the establishment of a uh, state loan loss reserve fund with a couple funding options that were described, as well as a proposed modification to the mortgage lender notice and consent provision that's in the bill. Um, I've also noted here that the Office of the Public Advocate uh, had, had suggested that the committee may want to consider uh, to allow for the program to commit planning to commence immediately to make the bill emergency legislation. Uh, although there's no fiscal information available at this time, uh, the fiscal note associated with the majority report amendment to 1748, which appears to have served as a basis for this LD may be of interest to the committee. Uh, that note, uh, which did not require uh, an appropriation or allocation, uh, did reflect a current biennium cost and revenue increase for the efficiency main trust. And I've noted here um, the detail from that fiscal note. Um, so I'm going to stop my share. And I will note that um, in the email I just sent you, I also included the Nature Conservancy's proposed amendment that Senator Sanborn is sponsoring and the comments from the um, Maine Bankers Association and the Maine Credit Union League. Uh, and I believe, I believe that Senator Sanborn is with us today, as is uh, Rob Wood from the Nature Conservancy, as well as uh, Ellen Parent um, from the Maine Bankers Association. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Tartikoff. And um, I'm sure the committee will have questions for those individuals, but let's start with uh, with Dan. Um, does the committee, you know, that was a lot that was just presented. So um, does the committee have questions for our analyst? To help make sure that we've fully digested all of that. Okay. Well, it's in the email, and I do think that uh, we're going to want to refer back to that document. Um, 
you know, I, Dan, I guess I'll, I'll ask you a question just to kind of prime the pump and make sure that we are, uh, you know, on the same page here. So the loan loss reserve fund is a clear difference between the two different approaches as I see it that have been put before us. Um, that's sort of an obvious one. Um, you know, it would likely involve some kind of fiscal note because we would need to provide some money for that loan loss reserve fund. Um, but uh, setting that aside, um, can you characterize in a little more detail uh, the differences, and you can go back to your document if it's helpful, but just a little more detail on the differences between the, um, the, the subrogation approaches that are used in the two different amendments? So um, I, I just received these yesterday, so, uh, and I didn't, um, I wasn't involved in creating either of them. So okay. those that were can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my understanding is that the Nature Conservancy proposed amendment um, was to address the foreclosure issue directly by creating uh, a, a different process for where the, um, the property is delinquent in the CPACE assessment only, but that there were no other delinquencies. And in that instance, um, the CPACE lender would be able to, uh, in, to, to engage in a, a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure, which under that process, it would allow all of the various lien holders to be paid uh, in order of seniority. Um, whereas uh, in a municipal foreclosure, my understanding is that the municipality has no uh, requirement to disperse um, any of the additional funds once they foreclose. So it wouldn't be a municipal foreclosure process. Um, there's of course a number of other changes. Um, I, I would say more minor changes in that um, TNC amendment. The, uh, the other recommendation that you have uh, about um, establishing some sort of a, a loan loss reserve fund there were a number of different funding options that were described in that recommendation. Um, I, I'm not sure that they would require uh, state funding. There was at least one proposal, if I remember correctly, to uh, actually have uh, as part of the, the CPACE loan issuance, have some part of that um, loan go into a funding program for this. Um, and then the other change that was proposed <clears throat> by the Maine Bankers Association and the Credit Union League uh, is to, uh, if, if you recall from the bill, uh, the, the lien holders have to agree to the, to the CPACE lien being placed on the property. So if they don't agree, it can't be placed on it. And so I believe their suggestion was to uh, include explicit written consent requirements that the, those that already have, have liens on the property um, would have to uh, in writing, note that they uh, they understand the risk that they're entering into because of the risk of the municipal foreclosure process. So I've probably misstated uh, in a number of instances how those are both set up, but um, it, there are people who are involved with both of those there that can explain it much better and correct me, hopefully. Great. Any other questions for Dan? All right, thank you, Dan, uh, for that overview and for the analysis that's in our email inboxes. Um, as everyone is aware, the work sessions are a time for the committee to um, state its own opinions, to ask uh, opinions of others, um, to ask for further information. Uh, we have been given a lot of information on this bill, so um, I'm inclined to open up discussion to the committee and see what people would like to do. Um, I know there are attendees as uh, Mr. Tartikoff suggested that may want to provide some additional information to us. So I'll start with Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May we have uh, Rob Wood from the Nature Conservancy come up for some questions? We sure can. Um, we'll add in Mr. Wood. And may I ask the first question, please? 
And you may. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Woods. Uh, I had a question um, about uh, the other financial institutions that are participating in CPACE around the country. And I'm wondering if you could tell me if you're aware um, in the states that they operate, um, what percentage of those have a loan loss reserve type fund that they have as a backstop for the lenders? Thanks. Thanks, Representative Kessler. Um, and, and good morning to, to Chair Barry and, and to other members of the, the committee as well. Um, so um, again, I'm, I'm Rob Wood, uh, Director of Government, Government Relations and Climate Policy for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to um, present uh, uh, this amendment, you know, an amendment to the bill with Senator Sanborn and then also to, to help answer questions that I can. So uh, the loan loss reserve, you know, my, my understanding is that um, so there are 20, 23 states, and I, I know this was, a little, we said 24 states in the analysis of the bill, but I think it was 23 states that have active CPACE programs and three more that are currently uh, developing programs or have programs that are, that are just, just starting. Um, California, my understanding, was the first state to adopt uh, PACE. Uh, they have a, a commercial PACE program and a residential PACE program, and I think, importantly, this, this bill is just commercial PACE. So my understanding is that California um, created a, a, a loan loss reserve up front because they were the first state to move forward with PACE and didn't really know uh, what to expect. And also they have both a residential and a commercial program. Uh, and so since that time, I do not believe there have been other uh, kind of set, you know, set aside loan loss reserves created. Uh, the um, main Bank Makers Association and, and uh, the Main Credit Union League, who of course can also speak speak this as well because it's in their testimony. In their testimony, uh, they pointed to Vermont. Uh, Vermont, to my understanding, does not have an active CPACE program. Um, the, I did look at the the language in their legislation, and it you know comports with the proposal that that they've put forward for kind of requiring. Um, you know, CPACE lenders or property owners to pay into a loan loss reserve in order to participate in the program. Um, and I, I appreciate that that uh, kind of suggestion or consideration. Um, you know, however, I think that the amendment we put forward directly addresses the concern at hand, and that we don't we won't need to to go in that direction. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of your question. So I, I hope that that helps answer your question. Yes, uh, may I ask a follow up question, Mr. Chair? You may. Um, I just wanted to clarify that participation in a CPACE program is completely voluntary. Is that correct with this bill? Yes. Yeah. Th thanks for that. Good question. Yes, it, a absolutely. And so just really quickly, I mean, there, there are several steps to it being voluntary. A, um, a municipality has to pass an ordinance opting into the program to begin with. So they have to understand the lien process and what it means to place a CPACE assessment on a property and their responsibilities with respect to, um, you know, either administering a program if they choose to do that, or if they choose to work with efficiency mean what that means in terms of, you know, billing and collection of assessments. Um, so the municipality has to opt in first and foremost. And then once there is a program, a, a property owner that is interested in um, uh, kind of uh, doing a CPACE finance energy efficiency renewable energy project has to provide written notice to the mortgage holder on the property um, that they they are, are looking in that direction and then they would also the mortgage holder on the property would have to provide written consent uh, for for the the project to move forward and so if they choose not to provide consent then the project doesn't move forward so they have that that veto point uh, in the process that is a, a, a big protection um, so I'll, I'll I hope, I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Uh, Representative Krahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I think you started to allude to this, Mr. Wood, but it seems like the circumstances that the lenders are concerned about that would require a loan loss reserve fund in their view 
are um, made moot by the amendment that you proposed to uh, make sure that the process would change and that um, lien holders, other lien holders would get funds back based on the uh, the foreclosure, I forget what it was called, but um, it would basically go to the, the judicial or non-judicial foreclosure action. So is that an accurate understanding um, of the process that that would protect them, that amendment? And then secondly, what are the downsides of having this loan loss reserve uh, fund for potential uh, takers? Um, thank you so much, Representative Grahowski, just writing down those two questions. So, uh, <clears throat> so I, I just want to, you know, first of all, provide a lot of credit to, to the uh, Main Bankers Association, Main Credit Union League. I mean, there's been a lot of good dialogue around this bill, and I think that's good. Um, and I appreciate I appreciate that. And I do appreciate them raising the concern around the municipal foreclosure process. And so the way that, you know, CPACE works in, in other states, it's kind of elemental to, to the framework is that it is a, uh, you know, a, a special assessment on the property that's treated like a, like a tax lien. And so that includes the enforcement mechanism of a tax foreclosure uh, process for a delinquent uh, CPACE assessment or a defaulted CPACE assessment. And I do think that uh, Maine Bankers Association and Credit Union League, they, they raise you know, a fair point in that Maine's municipal tax foreclosure law does seem to be um, less common. I, I don't think it is unique. I've, I've done some additional research. I don't think it's the only state that, that does uh, kind of have the same uh, municipal tax foreclosure approach. However, it is less common. And so we have been you know, researching, trying to, trying to develop a, a solution to the specific concerns raised by, by the opponents, which is that in, in their testimony, they stated a, their, their primary concern is that means municipal tax foreclosure process does not require the former lien holders on a property that goes through a tax foreclosure process to be reimbursed from the, the proceeds of the sale of that property. And so we directly address that by saying, if it's a CPACE in this amendment that Senator Sanborn uh, has, has submitted, um, if a CPACE assessment is uh, delinquent, that the property is otherwise in good standing. Um, and, and so the CPACE assessment would be the impetus for going into the tax foreclosure process, that that would no longer be the case, that the lien would be assigned to the CPACE lender who could then conduct a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure. And that is, that's a standard foreclosure process that a mortgage holder would, would use to foreclose on a property. And that does not result in uh, you know, the, the um, former liens being wiped from the property and the excess proceeds can be dispersed to those, the mortgage holder. Uh, so that's, that's your first question. Um, on the second question around, was it was on the, the loan loss reserve representative for Husky, I just to double check. So I, I, I do, I believe our amendment has, has addressed that that concern. Uh, the proposal for the loan loss reserve was specifically to address the additional um, risk that would be created by means municipal tax foreclosure process. And so again, I think our amendment has addressed that. A loan loss reserve, I mean, there's there's two challenges. I think the, the proposal has not been uh, this session to, to create a separate pot of funding from the legislature. So it wouldn't, wouldn't require that appropriation from the legislature. But my understanding I guess my, my reading of, of the proposal from the Bankers Association and the Credit Union League is that the CPACE lender, so the financial institution that's providing the capital for the, the uh, energy efficiency project, or the property owner who is uh, hoping to complete the energy efficiency upgrades on their property, would have to pay into a loan loss reserve fund in order to participate in the program. And so that that is... Uh, challenging in terms of actually getting projects completed. And so I think that you know, the way that the concerns have been framed is that uh, mortgage lenders will not consent to CPACE projects because of, of the risk created by the tax foreclosure process. And that would result in a less successful program. However, I think creating a loan loss reserve that requires the property owner or the CPACE lender to pay into a separate pot of funding just in order to participate in the program that itself would actually prevent projects from getting done and would result in a less successful program.
Okay, Representative Krahowski is muted, so I assume she has no follow up questions. Any other questions for Mr. Wood? So, Mr. Wood, just for the sake of argument, if we were to have uh, a fair amount of money um, at our beck and call um, and could create a loan loss reserve fund upfront with that money without an assessment on these transactions, might it help to prime the pump, if you will, and um, encourage the lending community to engage more actively in this market? Thanks, Representative Barry. I think that's a, a really fair question. Um, I, 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 I can't say with certainty. However, I think you know, if you look at the track record of CFACE in other states, there aren't loan loss reserves like that in other states. It's my understanding is it's just California. Um, and so, you know, the lack of a loan loss reserve in other states has not prevented uh, successful CFACE programs. So I, I think, you know, there's, it's, it wouldn't be necessary. And actually, I also believe that in California, they have never had to use the loan loss reserve fund there. And so it, it exists, but it's never been utilized. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, I can't answer, again, I can't answer the question with 100% certainty. I think it's a good one, but the track record of CFACE in other states suggests that in all of these states that don't have loan loss reserve funds, they're still getting CFACE projects completed and financing uh, energy efficiency upgrades. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Wood? All right, seeing none, um, I assume the committee would like to hear from uh, the uh, backers of the other amendment. I think Dan has uh, uh, pointed out that Ellen Parent is with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask that she be brought in so that the committee can hear from that side of things. Um, Sorry, and if I, if I can, um, Kathy yeah. Kemboris is also here. Okay. Um, from the Mang Bankers Association. Great. Um, so Ms. Parent is from C the Credit Union League. Yes, I think I misspoke last time. And Kathy Kenaboris from the Maine Bankers Association. All right, welcome to both of you. And um, I wanna acknowledge that there are others in the attendee um, space who uh, the committee can also bring in uh, as we proceed through the work session, but um, the committee does uh, have the discretion to do that or not. Um, so, um, as parent, Ms. Keenan Boris, welcome. Does the committee have any questions for either of these folks? Ms. Uh, Representative Ziegler. Yes, good morning and thank you for being here. Can you speak to um, the uh, TNC's amendment uh, and also Senator uh, Sanborn's amendment? I believe that the amendments are one and the same, um, but correct me if I'm I'm wrong, please. Representative um, Ziegler, did you mean did you mean to uh, speak to each of the two amendments? No, I just meant I, I want them to speak to the uh, to the TNC Sanborn amendment. Okay, yes, got it. I, Great. And Sanborn, I wanted to acknowledge that it was also hers. Got it. Um, so Kathy, I'm happy to start and then can pass it over to you, um, should the uh, chairs chair provide. Um, so the amendment certainly does mitigate some of the risk, um, but one of our concerns is, our concern is not exclusively the municipal foreclosure problem. Um, we are also have, um, have a, it is very unusual that a mortgage holder would be in second position to any other type of lien um, in the, the only thing in the state of Maine that is, um, that pushes a, a mortgage lien, which is a, you know, a secured property um, lien below is taxes. So um, what this really means is even if we're not going into municipal foreclosure, um, the the CPACE lender gets first bite at the apple. So there, there are risk, increased risks there. 
Um, and if, in addition, these mortgages are built on uh, this idea of being in first position. Now, uh, lenders mitigate risk by uh, interest rates. Um, in addition to the fact that, that interest rates serve as, to some extent, a funding mechanism, they also are there in case the loan goes bad. Um, so you're going to see the, the interest rates that we have in place prior when we're in first position um, don't necessarily apply to the situation where we would then be in second position. Um, like I said, I think the, I, we have had some great conversations with Rob Wood, um, and we certainly appreciate his um, hard work to, to make this a better program. Um, the, but there is still a, a significant member element of risk. Um, and the, um, the proposed amendment doesn't do away with that completely. Um, with the, do away with the, the increase completely. There's always going to be another element of risk because all actions have risk. Um, but what is important for us is to make sure that we can mitigate that risk so that we are, are able to protect our members um, our, in the credit union world, our, our member owners of the facility um, in the banking world, their, their um, shareholders. Um, so, so we, you know, the, the, uh, the amendment doesn't solve all of our problems. Um, it is certainly an improvement over where we, we stand, would stand today. Does that answer your question, Representative Ziegler? Any follow-up? Uh, yeah. Could I just clarify? So in other words, yeah. you wouldn't support this bill with the amendment at this point, you're saying without the LLR, is that what you're saying totally? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we certainly, we support the the, the concept, but we're, we still have to advocate for what's best for our, our members. Um, and the best situation for our members would be to have this LLR. Um, the end result is that our, the, our, our institutions need to feel comfortable in being able to sign off on these. Um, and ideally we would like to uh, facilitate that by mitigating the risk as much as we can. Um, we, we certainly can't force our membership to do anything um, as I'm sure many trade associations have uh, stated before, um, but it, we, we certainly agree with the necessity of encouraging um, innovations in green energy and, and um, green efficiency or energy efficiency. Uh, and we, but we need to present a situation where our, our lenders are protected and feel like they can um, comfortably make these, make these decisions. So we, we, um, we certainly don't oppose the amendment. We just don't think that it um, supports a, uh, a strong risk mitigation on our side. And I'm sorry, Kathy, that I've been uh, speaking exclusively for the, the credit unions, but I'm sure the bankers have an opinion on this as well. Kathy, do you wanna to add to um, the answer to Representative Ziegler's question and then we'll go on to Representative Grahowski's? Okay, you're talking to me, thank you. Kathy Kenneboris with the Maine Bankers and I'm a resident of Hollis. Um, the only thing I would add is earlier in the um, bill analysis, it referenced that we do have a um, residential PACE program. And I just um, wanna clarify that in the residential PACE program, we had worked with this committee a number of years ago and the CPACE lender does not take priority position in that PACE program. Um, they come in subordinate to the first mortgage holder. And um, I think that's all I, I would ask relative to the amendment. Um, it doesn't get all the way. The only way it would get there would be to um, actually amend municipal foreclosure to say that if they do a foreclosure on a past due C-PACE and a past due tax credit, then that they would pay out and would be 
willing to limit that to just this, the um, lender who subordinated their first mortgage debt to that. So um, the amendment got partially there, but not all the way there. And so we still support the, um, we still support the loan loss reserve fund. And our research shows that Vermont does have one. It may not be active, but it was put into place because they went from um, first position to second position for their PACE loans. And in California's was instituted because the Federal Housing Finance Agency said that they would refuse to purchase mortgages in California because they had a priority lien status for the CPACE. So we just thought that a loan loss reserve fund may be easier um, to help our members get comfortable with um, doing CPACE if the CPACE lender is still gonna be a priority lien status. Um, just to clarify, and then I'll go, I will go on to Representative Grahowski, but um, I thought I heard you say, and I may have mis misheard you, um, that um, the CPACE uh, lender does not occupy first position in the residential PACE program, but I, I, think, I think you meant um, that the PACE lender does PACE not occupy lender. first position. Is that right? Okay. Yes, I apologize. That is correct, Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Garhowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, and, and thank you, Ms. Farron and Kenna Boris for being here. Um, I just wanna back up for a second and see if you can verify this statement or question. Um, so with the amendment that was proposed by Senator Sanborn, uh, if you, your member credit union or member bank is uncomfortable, they do not have to sign off on the property having a CPACE loan. So they can mitigate their own risk by just not participating. Is that correct? Um, I'll um, answer that. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, that is correct. Um, what we were trying to do with our proposed amendment is we had surveyed our, our membership and they were very uncomfortable with, with agreeing to subordinate um, to those. So what we were trying to do is come up with a solution to make them more comfortable so that they would embrace the proposal of the CPACE in Maine. So giving them some kind of um, guarantee would help them participate more because the customer cannot get the CPACE loan unless their first mortgage holder is willing to subordinate. So we were just trying to um, encourage more participation in the CPACE by the financial institutions. Representative Growski, any Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that you're trying to help us create a system that actually works. I think that's important. Um, my question is what's going on with our credit unions and banks in Maine that they uh, have discomfort whereby hundreds of other institutions, some of which do business in Maine have been consenting to CPACE loans. I mean, uh, have your members talked to these other banks? We have a list provided to us um, by the Nature Conservancy. I mean, I'm looking at it. I see, you know, big, big ones, <laughs> Bank of America, Citibank. I mean, is this just, I'm trying to understand why our banks and credit unions um, feel differently, or even if some of your members are already doing this in other states? I think I can answer that. Um, I think we, we alluded to the fact that um, Maine's um, municipal foreclosure, because this brings it in, is a little different than those other states. And that we're not here to say that every single one of our members wouldn't do a deal. It would depend on the circumstances. And I don't, I've seen that list of, um, financial institutions as well. I don't know what the laws were in those states that had them participate or the circumstances for their customer that they agreed to do it. I just know that we surveyed our membership um, and they are still uncomfortable with it. And that's what we're bringing forward to the committee um, with a proposed suggestion to make them feel more comfortable with doing it. I hope that answers your question. Ms. Parent, did you want to address that one? 
Yes, um, just to speak to the credit union side of things, um, there are, well, first of all, we represent the credit unions that are here in the state of Maine. Um, I believe there's only one credit union uh, that has branches in Maine that are not uh, based in Maine. Um, so uh, our members are not uh, participating in these in other states. Um, though other credit unions in other states may do so. Um, our biggest concern, um, and I, I think this is uh, probably fair for a number of the, um, the, the banking institutions in the state as well, is many of our institutions are small. Um, we are relatively small member owned organizations. Um, and the risk that would be taken on would be uh, felt throughout the community um, because you know, we're, we're a cooperative. Um, it's something that we take very seriously. Our, our um, credit unions take very seriously in making sure that they are protecting uh, the people, in fact, the people who have these mortgages because they are in fact members of the, the, and owners of the credit union. Um, so while it may not be, uh, it may not be much of a risk for a city bank, uh, the risk to um, a much smaller institution that is local and helps provide some of the vibrancy of our local communities, uh, that's certainly a concern for us. Um, and again, I think that the the differences in Maine's municipal foreclosure law do make it um, a, a concern. Um, but we also would certainly like, we would love for this to be a program that works um, and for it to work, it, we really need to have something that as, as the, the esteemable chair said, something that primes the pump. Um, for our members so that they can um, mitigate the risk and not be as concerned about where, where they're going to leave their members. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Cuddy. Mm -hmm. I only got halfway into what I was saying before I realized I was muted, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the discussion. This has been illuminating and it has really helped me sort of figure out the direction that I wanna go. Um, and if if it's too early for this, then nobody will second it, but I am interested in moving um, ought to pass as amended with Senator Sanborn's amendment. Okay, I'll take that as a motion of ought to pass as amendment amended. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, seconded by Representative Krahowski. Um, all right. Um, with that motion on the floor, we can proceed with uh, further discussion and perhaps a little more clarity to that discussion. Um, Representative Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I would have a, a question for either of the uh, representatives from the lending institutions uh, that is here and just finished with their questioning. Uh, to clarify, this seems like a very complicated issue, but to clarify in my mind, uh, uh, I, I've got a couple of uh, scenarios I'd like to pose and then, and then uh, I have a final question, but it seems that uh, the institutions that you represent, if they hold a uh, mortgage on a uh, property and that property, someone comes to you for a, uh, a loan, uh, CPACE loan that obviously you have the opportunity to say no uh, or yes. Uh, likely it might be yes because you are also the mortgage holder for the property itself. If somebody comes to you and they uh, you do not hold a mortgage on a property, they come to you for the CPACE loan, obviously you have uh, the opportunity to say yes or no in that uh, situation. And I assume that that is not of concern to you uh, with this bill. If somebody comes to you and um, if, if you hold a mortgage on a property and somebody is seeking a CPA loan from another institution, 
my understanding is that you have to be uh, uh, consulted, if you will, and uh, either approve or you have the opportunity to disapprove that loan being uh, made. Uh, my understanding of this bill from the 129th is that it has been modified so that municipalities, and maybe someone from them can speak later on to this, municipalities are no concerned that they are now moved back in the lien holder uh, uh, schedule, if you will. They still hold first, uh, first lien to be addressed. Uh, and finally, my question, if, if all of that is correct, I, I think I understand that. If not, please let me know. Uh, my question is, if this bill were to place the mortgage lender second in line behind the municipality, as far as lien holders go, and the CPACE loan uh, mortgage holder was placed next in line after the mortgage lender the, of the property, then as I understand it, your institutions or the institutions you represent would probably be in favor of this bill. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, yeah. that is correct. Yes, that is correct. That's longstanding um, law right now. Yes. And Mr. Chair, if I may, were my previous assumptions to that question also correct? Yes, they were. Thank you, Representative Foster. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering what level of funding would a loan loss reserve fund need or would make, would make your industry feel comfortable? Um, how much capitalization in, in uh, an account would, would help? So uh, that's a difficult one for us to answer. Um, and I think that the, um, the proposal that we sent along to the committee um, outlines that to some extent. Uh, we, because we don't have uh, a whole lot of information from the CPACE lenders, um, we really can't make a, a strong assessment. We're, um, I mean, we looked at a, a per certain percentage points um, to protect it, but we would, you know, we'd have to do some underwriting research particularly with the input of CPACE lenders, because they're the ones who are going to have the best information on how, how their programs run. Um, but um, we, um, it probably would not need to be a significant percentage um, or a, a large percentage of the, the loan volume, because obviously in any loan situation, most are not going to fail. Um, so we would be looking at enough to, to ensure the percentage of these loans that would fail. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that we had also mentioned, and this is, exists in some states, um, so while there may not be many uh, loan loss reserves funds, um, often the green banks uh, in states or other um, government entities serve as the loan loss reserve funds. Um, so they, it may not be called a loan loss reserve, but um, Connecticut, for example, they, ought, they will uh, mitigate some risk for the, the subrogated um, uh, lender. And so you, what, they have, what we have seen in other states is that if you have um, at least something so that they can either, uh, frankly, either the CPACE or the mortgage lender could come forward and mitigate some of their losses. Um, it's going to be a better situation. Um, you can also, if the funds exceed um, what is necessary, you could also consider sweeping these funds into something that encourages more green lending. Um, so that's, that's certainly something to consider. Um, that this could be a, a funding mechanism that for um, ha encouraging long, longstanding uh, support of this kind of program. Great, any follow-up there? All right, um, we'll go on then to uh, Senator, well, actually, let me, let me just, because um, I, I think Senator Vitelli has a question for another attendee. Um, 
I may be mistaken. She can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but are there any additional questions before we go on to others in the attendee room? Uh, any other questions for Ms. Parent or Ms. Kinaboris? Okay, well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if we could bring the bill sponsor, Senator Heather Sanborn, into the rooms to ask her a question. Yes, we can. And there she is. Senator Sanborn, welcome. And uh, Senator Vitelli, do you wanna, do you have a particular question in mind? Well, I'm interested, given the amendment that's before us that seemed in when I first heard it to address this issue and the concerns of some of the financial institutions, what role, if any, the Senator believes any um, loan loss reserve fund might have and if it's um, necessary to create a program that will work. Thank you, Senator Vitelli. Ooh, I have a have an echo. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Senator Vitelli, for the question, for the opportunity um, to join the committee during the work session um, today. You know, I think that uh, with the amendment um, allowing for judicial or non-judicial foreclosure in the case uh, where there isn't a tax delinquency, I think we've really um, solved the um, the crux of the issue. Um, the additional protections of a loan loss reserve fund, in my mind, are a nice to have, not a need to have. Um, and there will certainly be mortgage lenders who want to work uh, with green, uh, green lenders and, and with CPACE um, programs, and then there'll be others who don't. And I think um, one of the benefits that we have with our financial system is you can refinance your mortgage. You can move to a different lender, particularly in this era of low interest rates and of um, you know, high property values. There's an opportunity uh, for us to um, have some competition within the financial markets and within the capital markets. So I would really encourage the committee to move forward with the bill without a loan loss reserve fund. If we did at some point um, down the road, find that CPACE deals weren't able to get completed because there was no mortgage lender willing um, to take on the risk the way that we've structured the program. Um, I think we could add a loan or loss reserve um, in a future date. I think also if we did identify potentially federal funds or other funds um, to, to create a loan loss reserve fund in the future, that could easily be added on um, to the program after we passed it, I think, um, and provide you know additional priming of the pump as um, Chair Barry suggested, but that it's not um, a prerequisite for getting the program off the ground and for um, testing the market to see um, whether there are CPACE deals just ready to go right now. Um, and so I think um, I'd really, really encourage the committee um, to, to move forward um, without the loan loss reserve, um, because again, you know, as the only thing that credit union and banks can really say right now is they don't think very many deals will get done because they won't consent or the or that they would raise the cost of the mortgages. And if that's the case, then we'll see that, and then we could go back and we could um, identify potential additional um, funding mechanisms for a loan loss reserve fund. But I don't think it's a prerequisite. Um, to getting this program going right now. And I think it could be a great impediment because if it is, if the loan loss reserve fund is funded through an assessment on the financing itself, then very many fewer deals are going to pencil out. Because remember, if the cost of funds here is too expensive, then the return on um, investment for the, um, the energy efficiency project will not um, pencil out and you won't be able to proceed with the project because this only this funding is only available in situations where it actually lowers the cost of utilities um, for the project as a whole or for the building as a whole. Representative Vitelli. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarity, what what I'm understanding you to be saying, Senator, is that with the additional sort of safeguards that the amendment puts onto the program, essentially we'll be letting the market forces direct whether or not these deals can be made under these circumstances. And then if that is not the case, we can we have the opportunity to go back and build in some further safeguards if that seems to be necessary. Is that, am I getting the picture? Yes, I think that's exactly right. Thank you. Other questions for the sponsor? Well, we have her. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Representative Sandmore, for joining us. Uh, good to see you, as always. And um, I think uh, we have the opportunity to hear from others if the committee um, needs it. I, I personally would actually like to hear from one of the attendees who has some experience with this sort of green lending. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of um, asking to hear from Alyssa Roth uh, from Green, Greenworks Lending. Um, is if you could let her in, that would be great. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi Ms. there. Roth. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to hear from you about this whole question of loan loss reserve. Um, you know, I confess that I, I am a little concerned about um, not, you sort of not knowing um, how many lenders will step up uh, to the plate under the, you know, the, the sponsor's amendment as we've heard it um, and, and to what extent the market will provide. Um, you know, we, we, we do want this to work. We have uh, been a little bit um, scarred. Uh, I'll speak for myself, um, a, a little scarred by the, the failure of the residential PACE program to really take off the way that we had hoped. So can you just speak to the, the appetite that you see uh, for uh, lending uh, uh, with, without the loan loss reserve fund, but with the other amendments that have been put forward? Sure, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak and um, hello to everybody on the committee. Thanks for um, providing this opportunity. So I think um, one of the really important things to think about here that hasn't been brought up is framing the actual risk. Um, I, so I should introduce myself. My name is Alyssa Roth. I am the direct, senior director of policy and programs at Greenworks Lending. We're the leading CPACE lender in the country. Um, we, as an industry, the CPACE industry has closed um, over $2 billion in CPACE projects. And um, we have seen, I think, one foreclosure, municipal foreclosure ever in the industry. So while these conversations are really, really important to have, and we need to understand what would happen in a worst case scenario, um, I really do want to put into perspective how these loans are underwritten by the CPACE lender and again by the mortgage lender before approval and the types of property owners that have the ability to go through the requirements of the administrator, the program administrator, adhere to the requirements of the CPACE lender and receive sign off from the senior lender. These are not the property owners that aren't able to pay their taxes or um, you know, have, have worst case scenarios happen. Um, of course, we do need to talk about it because it's always an existing risk, but I do just want to make that very, very clear that the risk is infinitely tiny here. Um, okay, so one of the main reasons that mortgage holders do consent to see PACE financing is because PACE in most cases is good for the mortgage holder. Um, and that depends on the, the statute as it's written. And the main statute establishes um, that the savings from a PACE program, from a PACE improvement must outweigh the cost of that PACE improvement. So that ensures that every single PACE project must be generating cash flow for that property owner. Because of that, the value of that collateral increases for the mortgage holder, and it actually enhances the property owner's ability to pay their mortgage. And that's why mortgage lenders consent to CPACE. And that's why you've seen this list of over 200 banks and also credit unions um, that have consented. 
But if there is a scenario where this doesn't pencil, where the mortgage lender is uncomfortable, they can always refuse to grant consent. Um, so that is, that's kind of the framing of how this works um, from the mortgage holder and seat pace lender perspective. So because of these factors, this is why we have not seen it necessary to have a loan loss reserve in any other state. And um, I do want to acknowledge that while, um, echo what, what Rob said, that while Maine's um, municipal foreclosure law is unique, it's not the only law like this. Michigan has similar um, has a similar statute and there are other states um, where it is not required for the mortgage holder to be paid out if there is a worst case scenario mortgage foreclosure. Um, there are no states ever that have used a loan loss reserve for CPACE. So um, as Rob mentioned, one was created for the very first CPACE program ever that launched in 2008 and that was in California. And that loss reserve has never been drawn upon since 2008. It's, it's not necessary and no one's touched it. Um, the Vermont statute, which has, um, which did write into the statute that they could establish a law, uh, a, a loan loss reserve, that program never launched um, because the CPACE lien is actually subordinated in the statute, therefore for making it no longer CPACE. Um, the, the crux of CPACE is that this is a public private partnership between the local government and the lending, CPACE lending community. Um, and thereby the, there's obligations and benefits on both sides and the obligation of the local government um, is to enforce this in the same manner as other property taxes because it is an assessment. Um, so that is why it takes precedence in the same way that any other public benefit like sewers or schools or any other assessment you see on a property um, would take precedence over a mortgage. Um, a mortgage lien. So um, I, I think that uh, answers your question, um, but I'm happy to weigh in on any other questions that anyone has. No, that does very well, thank you. Um, I, I think as a follow-up, I, I, I may be misunderstanding the concern from the lending community, so <laughs> apologize in, in advance to, to those listening in from that community if I, if I get it wrong, but I, I, I almost, um, sense that maybe a, a concern is that if this program doesn't take off, if we don't see the results that we um, envision for this program with a lot of green lending coming online, that maybe a future legislature, um, not this one, but a future one might decide, well, you know, we need to take away the, the consent from main base lenders. Um, has that happened anywhere to your knowledge, Ms. Roth? Uh, no, it's actually the opposite. And CPACE lenders advocate for lender consent because we don't want to get in any fights with the banking community or the banking association. Um, we want to remain in good standing with all lenders. And in states that don't have lender consent written into the statute, we're actually working to add it in. So we're doing that right now in Florida and some other areas. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Greenworks Lending while we have them? Okay, well, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks very much. So um, there is a motion on the floor. Um, I do also have a request for a 10 minute caucus uh, before we proceed to a vote. So I just wanna check whether there's any additional discussion uh, that the committee wishes to have before we proceed to that caucus. Great, all right, seeing none, um, we'll take a 10 minute break, uh, reconvening at 12, I'll make it 11, 1231. And um, I'll give us a chance to caucus and Please turn off your video and audio in the meantime. Thank you. Representative Ziegler. I can't, you're muted. I was hoping not. Are we going to talk us by phone? Uh, we'll, we'll send around a link. Okay, thank you. By text. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. See you all at 1231. <clears throat>
Okay, we're back. And if folks could just turn their video on so I can <clears throat> get a sense of uh, how many we are, that'll be helpful. I think we are nearing a vote. So we'll need seven, including a senator. <clears throat> and it's my understanding as folks are coming back in, um, it is my understanding that there may be uh, some technical changes to, or minor changes to the uh, sponsors amendment that the credit union folks wanted to offer. And um, this is a pretty big bills. So I do want to give them the opportunity to present that, you know, these, these amendments were coming fast and furious in the last 48 hours. So, um, Dan, have you received that language already? Some additional yeah, language have. from the credit unions? Yeah, I just sent it. Did you okay. get it? <clears throat> so it's in our email. It should be. Okay. So we can, uh, I'll ask the committee to go ahead and check your email for that language and um izzy could you please let miss parent in great okay so um Ms. Parent, can you just care, uh, sort of give us a, an overview of, of what it is you're proposing here? Sure. So we had a couple of things that our lawyers pointed out when they um, looked at this amendment. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, there were a couple of typos, which I think everyone, I think were cleared up um, previously. So I don't know that I included those. Um, but the... Uh, there was some language around the um, when the let me bring it up. That's going to be easier than me trying to recount it to you. Um, so on page six of the amendment, um, the basically pulling the commercial pace lane and assigning that to from the municipality to the pace lender was um, proposed if the borrower or property owner was current on municipal taxes and other mortgage liens. Um, and we would just ask that they be pulled out in any, any time that they are trying to, um, if the CPACE uh, assessment is delinquent in any position. So this, so rather than, um, if the PACE loan is delinquent on, let's say their mortgage and the, um, the PACE assessment, we, we should have that opportunity to still go to um, judicial foreclosure rather than municipal foreclosure. Um, as it is written, it, would it requires both. Um, and I think if the, the proponents are trying to avoid a municipal foreclosure, in the case of a, a commercial PACE assessment, it shouldn't matter whether or not they are delinquent on their mortgage as well. I think that kind of gets at the, the whole essence of what they're trying to do. And I think it was just an oversight, but obviously they would speak better to that than, than we would. Okay, thank you. Representative Cuddy, something on this one? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, the amendment. Um, Banking is not my first language. That's fine. Um, so you've removed the phrase, uh, looking at page six in the, in the yellow block, you've mm -hmm. removed the phrase and mortgage liens from the first sentence. Yep. And then added to enforce the lien and collect past due assessments by judicial foreclosure or by non-judicial statutory power of sale foreclosure. Nope, so we didn't add that. That was in the original. We just wanted to mention that that is redundant language because that is in fact what that title referenced. Oh, does. I see on the side, yeah, I see yep. on the side. Yep. Um, 
And walk me through again what the removal of and mortgage liens, how that sure. changes this section. Sure. So um, this is setting up the situation where traditionally under the way the law is or the uh, bill is written now, um, a when a commercial PACE loan is delinquent, it um, has a tax sale in essence. So it, it goes into the municipal foreclosure pool. Um, and they're trying to avoid that because they, they want to provide us with some excess funds, um, which we very much appreciate. Um, so this sentence right now says, if only the commercial PACE assessment is delinquent, uh, then the commercial PACE lender will accept the assignment of the lien and you get out of that um, municipal foreclosure bucket, if you will. Um, and it makes sense that you, you don't wanna take them out of municipal foreclosure if the, the um, borrower is also delinquent on municipal taxes. We, you know, we don't wanna to, um, interfere with municipal tax law or municipal foreclosure there. Um, but if they are, but to say that they, um, it shouldn't matter whether or not they're delinquent on their, their mortgage. Um, their, their mortgage is not linked to the default of the um, PACE assessment. So if they are delinquent on both, they should still go into judicial or judicial or non-judicial foreclosure as the case may be, as opposed to simply staying in that municipal foreclosure where the, um, the mortgage holder gets no relief. Does that make sense? It sounds to me like, I, I think so. It sounds, let me restate okay. it. You can, you can dig through the ignorance that I put out and, and try to find a, a nugget of anything good. Um, so it seems to me that by removing those words and mortgage liens, you leave for a bank or, or credit union the possibility of moving into that judicial process if the mortgage, uh, if they are behind on the mortgage. Uh, that would always exist. This is only in the case where their C pays. The, the C pays. Yes. Right. Okay. So yeah. it would. So it would, rather it. It would remove rather than it being. You go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. There, Zoom is terrible for this, isn't it? Um, so rather than removing, uh, so rather than having it be an, uh, an and, it can be an or. Right. So so in essence, you know, they can be delinquent on both their their C pace and their mortgage lien at the same time, and we would like for that to go into. Um, in fact, that's probably more than likely what would be the case. Um, and in, in that case, if you have a delinquency on both, it should revert to a judicial or non-judicial, as the case may be. In most commercial instances, it is a judicial foreclosure or a non-judicial foreclosure. Um, it should go to that realm, not into the municipal foreclosure realm. So I'm going to ask Izzy to also let uh, Rob Wood in. And um, since the Nature Conservancy, I think did a lot of the drafting on this with the sponsor, um, just check whether um, he can speak to this first item in the credit union's recent uh, amendment to the amendment. Again, Chair Barry and, and the committee members. And um, in short, yes, I think uh, that makes sense. And it was, uh, I appreciate Ellen, Ms. Parent, and, um, and the credit union lead for, for flagging that. I think that was the intent is that if a property is, uh, if a property owner is current on their municipal property taxes, uh, but not on their CPACE assessment, that the CPACE assessment could be decoupled and <clears throat> assigned to the CPACE lender. And so the mortgage, the status of the mortgage lien should not 
really factor into that. And so I think that 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 was just a, a, a drafting error. You're working with a municipal property tax attorney to, to get the language squared away. And I think that was just an oversight. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Parent, anything else on this? Or maybe if not, you could go ahead with the, the next portion of your uh, recommendation. Sure, um, nothing else on that. Um, we did include a section um, in the definitions, um, which you will you may recognize is very similar to um, what we submitted with our proposal. Um, and that uh, just outlines consent and per, or mortgage lender notice and consent, um, just defines it. Um, and um, we're hoping that that will just provide an additional safeguard. Um, somewhat somewhat technical in it as far as a change goes um, but but that was our hope and that is on the second page of the document that you've received mr wood any reactions on that one i'm sorry i don't actually have the document um, got it that would be an issue. All right, we'll we'll get that sent to you. And um, in the meantime, I saw a hand from Representative Krakowski, I believe. Representative Krakowski. Uh, my, my question was just clarifying that it was the um, highlight in gray on the second page. Um, we could also consider maybe doing a screen share so that anyone out there in the attendees room who is interested in what we're talking about can see. The language changes. that is an excellent idea and i'm going to ask if our analysts could help us with that i think that would help to make this proceeding um a little more transparent so a little more accessible to the public and even to some of us in the room <laughs> uh great thank you dan <clears throat> and rob i did managed to send you that just now, but all right. So um, can Dan, can you just walk us through what we have already been through and what the sort of the next portion is that uh, Ms. Parent is referring to? Um, so what we were talking about before was changes to this um, in the TNC amendment that you saw earlier, changes to their language. And I believe the primary discussion was the striking of the phrase and mortgage liens there, which I understand um, the Nature Conservancy is okay with. And then we had moved up to discussion of, in the definition section, a definition for mortgage lender notice and consent, which as long as I have the floor, we'll note that this should not go in the definition section, but the substance could go elsewhere. Got it. Okay. Any objections, concerns, questions on this piece? Um, I'm just gonna give Mr. Wood a chance to read that in a little more detail. Anything from the committee? Uh, Representative Cuddy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just reading this and I want to make sure that who is it that is filing this consent with the Registry of Deeds? This would be the cost. The, is this the end use customer who's filing this? Uh, so that's from, uh, that's a piece from the original CPACE. Um, Bill and I believe that it the consent is filed by the mortgage holder. Okay, thank you. But that that might be a better question for Rob. Um, so your Mr. Amendment, Wood? Uh, I'm sorry, Representative. Um, your amendment then in gray is the A and B. Uh, no, it just exists elsewhere. Our amendment is all of four, um, but the the requirement of the registry of deeds um, section is also elsewhere in the statute or in the proposed amendment, excuse me. If, if you want me to jump in, the, um, 
in the original bill, uh, section, new section 10205, uh, subsection four, this is on page five of the bill, uh, describes the mortgage lender notice and consent. And this is, uh, has to be filed um, with the, by the financial institution holding the lien mortgage or security interest in or other collateral encumbrance on the property. They have to provide written consent uh, to the commercial property owner and the municipality of their agreement for the property to, the property to engage in the CPACE program and take on a, a lien. And that written consent has to be filed in the registry of deeds. And so this is, um, I understand this proposal uh, would add a little bit more clarity to uh, what that written consent has to, has to acknowledge and, and include an understanding of the collection and priority status of the lien. I, I'm going to turn uh, to Mr. Wood in a moment, but I just want to um, check with Ms. Parent. Um, can, is this um, is this information that that lenders are not already kind of aware of? I mean, it, it um, isn't isn't this subordination process something that they're already sort of um, accustomed to and um, informed about without this information being presented? Uh, our concern is that, especially for smaller lenders, okay. they might not have a full understanding of what CPACE does because um, subordination is somewhat unusual in the mortgage realm. Um, so this is just meant to provide clarity um, and to, to ensure that, that, you know, someone who is inexperienced in this field isn't, uh, you know, doesn't get carried away and doesn't realize what they're actually doing. So we're, we're just looking for increased clarity and, um, and outline here. I see. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wood, do you want to comment on, on this from the perspective of TNC? Sure. Thanks, Chair Barry. I, I think uh, this in a broad sense uh, works, but the specifics around the uh, A1 and, and 2, I think we would just like an opportunity to, to clarify that, you know, the, the, where the pace link, commercial pace lane actually falls in the, in the priority. And so it's, it's actually after municipal property taxes and utility district charges um, would take precedence over the, uh, the mortgage holder. And so I think just, just to make that quick clarification, um, and then, and then I think on, on in two, uh, if we were to also say, you know, res the funds resulting from the sale of the property in a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure scenario as outlined in, you know, the, 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 the section where that's outlined is are not enough to meet the amount owed on the commercial base lien then the mortgage holder may incur less. I think that just, just those clarif clarifying pieces would be helpful. Um, Got it. But in, in general, I think this works. And we can certainly have Dan um, massage the language to reflect what's in other parts of the bill. So it's more precise yeah. in that regard. Ms. Parent, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and I just wanted to apologize. So for... Um, when we, in, in the lending world, when we speak of priority status, taxes and utilities are assumed to, to come first. Um, so we always refer to first position as the, the mortgage holder, um, even though you are completely right, it, it truly isn't first, but we, we know that the, uh, the taxes always have to get paid before anything else. So that's why we call it first position and feel free to, to illuminate that more uh, differently. Great, thank you, Ms. Parent. Um, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am not comfortable um, adding this on at the last minute. And frankly, I'm, I'm not comfortable with us getting um, constant amendments at the last minute for us to digest. And then, you know, it feels like you know, we are quickly rushing through the analysis on this. 
Um, and I would, I'm, I'm completely open to um, analyzing this, but um, I would prefer to, you know, move forward with the motion as it stands. And uh, once, um, once we've had enough eyeballs on the language, uh, if, if we can amend the bill uh, on the floor, then so be it. That's just my two cents. Thank you, Representative Kessler. Um, I feel a little differently and would be interested in trying to incorporate this, but I'll, I'll turn next to Representative Wadsworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I appreciate these additions and uh, I appreciate that Mr. Woods here and, uh, and uh, you know, doesn't mind the additions. I think we're making the bill better and I think we're getting really close. So I'd like to keep them. Got it. Okay. Um, Dan, have we covered the whole amendment or is there more further down? There, there is, uh, I believe one other piece. I would note that um, rather than, perhaps rather than trying to massage the language, the, the, the notice and consent could just be made simpler with a cross-reference to the other parts of the bill that describe the priority status and the foreclosure process. Um, but like you said, I could work that out after the fact if this gets voted on. So just to be uh, clear though, if you could go back up. So the, the um, when you say a cross-reference, it would say acknowledgement and understanding of the collection of priority status of the seat-based lien as provided under section, subsection, whatever. Is that right. where the cross? So yeah, so they if would you actually look at, um, <laughs> if you look at, um, this is where the mortgage lender notice and consent is in the bill. The information on priority is directly above it. Um, right. So you'd be cross-referencing the provision that's right above it to describe what the Great. lender would need to consent. Um, the up, I might be missing something else because I just saw this too, but the other change is the addition of this new subsection 5A. Uh, and, and I think probably uh, Ms. Parent may be in a better position to speak to that. Great. Um, I'm going to actually go first to Representative Cuddy just to check whether he had anything on the earlier section. No, it's 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 about something later. That's I put my hand up, so I'll, I'll go back to that. All right, we'll come back to you, um, Ms. Parent. Can you speak to five A, uh, or if you want to yeah. say anything about the earlier piece, go ahead. Uh, I have nothing to add for, about the earlier piece, um, but we are five um, A was. Um, something that we proposed, um, it, it just happened to be highlighted. I didn't have a chance to go back and, and change it. Um, if, if this is uh, not amenable to the committee, that's fine. Um, it's, a little more, it's a little more substantive than the other two were. Um, so this was mostly just happened to be in, in the same document. Um, and I wanted to get it to you as quickly as possible. Um, I have a sense that some people will not be okay with this, um, but yep. this is le certainly less important to us. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll go next to uh, Mr. Wood and then Representative Cuddy. Um, Mr. Wood, would you agree that I prefer this being left out? Thanks, Chair Barry. Uh, Yes, I, I would prefer that this is left out because I think this it was meant, I mean, this parent can, can confirm this, but I think this was meant to address the issue that, that has been addressed through the inclusion of the judicial or non-judicial foreclosure option. And I think the municipalities would have, would, would want to speak to this if we were going to include it. Great, thank you. All right, so I see nodding heads. Um, Representative Cuddy? I was wondering if, Dan, if you could come down to page six, there was the other um, piece that um, Ms. Parent had identified as being redundant language. And is that in fact redundant language that we would want to get rid of, or is that um, language that needs to be there? Is that a question for me? I, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, Dan, I, I apologize. Um, the, I haven't looked at, at the, the section in title uh, yet, so I'm not sure if that, if this is actually redundant language or uh, if it's language that we need. 
you are in the same boat with me. Uh, I got the amendment the same time you did. So I'm not right. sure. So. Ms. Parrott, can you speak to that? Yeah, I would just say that was a recommendation from our attorney. Um, if it is redundant, I suppose it doesn't hurt to have it in there. Um, but yes, our, that was that was why we included it at that section. Got it. Uh, Representative Cuddy. That was an old hand, I apologize. Okay, well, there are lots of old hands around here. Um, Mr. Wood, any comment on that redundancy piece? Are you concerned about that language being added, even if it is redundant? Okay. I don't, I don't have any concerns. All right. So have we covered what is in this uh, additional language from the Credit Union League? Dan, are we, have we covered all the bases? There's, there's a lot of various highlighting in the document. I believe so, but um, I'm not 100%. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing heads shaking, yes. Would you like me to stop the screen share so you can see each other again? Why, why don't you go ahead and do that? I think so, not all of us have multiple screens, so um, that's probably a helpful idea. I, I think um, what we've just heard, um, and I, you know, please, um, speak up now and um, correct me if uh, if you disagree. Is is general consensus among those who were in favor of the motion that was pending before we broke for a caucus? Uh, general consensus um, that uh, what Ms. Parent has presented and what Mr. Wood has agreed to, leaving out 5A, um, is acceptable. So I see nodding heads. Um, you know, I think obviously if you're not planning to vote in favor of the pending motion, then that's fine. You might have your own report anyway. Um, but I just want to make sure that those who are intending to vote for that pending motion are generally comfortable. And it sounds like the answer may be yes. Um, let me go to uh, Representative Wadsworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. Those additions, uh, we can drop 5A and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to support that. Great. And Representative Cuddy. I just want to make sure that, oh, yeah, I'm in, good. I just want to make sure that we're going to have the opportunity, you know, that Dan will look this over, we'll have a, a language review, and that at that point in time, um, we'll have the opportunity, if something was missed, to, uh, to remove that uh, at language review. Because that's my only concern is that Dan really hasn't had a chance to go through the second. And it's just one of those deals where somebody forgot to strike something they meant to and it makes its way into law. That's a huge problem. So I want to make That's sure. Right. Yes, thank you. And, and I, I appreciate that, um, that thinking. And it's, I think it's a, this is a good moment for us to kind of uh, bring uh, new members up to speed in particular on how this works. Typically, when we have crafted an amendment that the, com the committee is generally comfortable with, and some of it may be in writing, some of it may be uh, verbal. Um, it might come from two different documents, as we've seen today. Uh, or even three, that we, we, we have an agreement and we vote based on that agreement, but there's a language review. So Dan will take this back uh, as he understands the, the motion um, that prevailed. Maybe there are two different reports and he has to write up two different bills or, or amendments to the bill. Um, and then we get a language review. So at that point, if, uh, if Dan has a question about our intent, he will bring that to us and we can sort that out. If it's anything substantive and is in, and, and requires a change from what we voted on today, uh, then we would have the opportunity to reconsider our vote and revote the bill. And that does happen. So language review is a very important kind of um, safety valve, if you will, to this process. And I think it's helpful that our Representative Cuddy reminded us of its existence. Um, Dan. Just, just to further clarify, um, the, way, the way I have uh, treated language review is if it's an amendment that, that I've written up, that I've had a chance to go through and, and, and work on, which is not the case here, uh, I will usually 
run it through the revisor's office process and the fiscal office process before bringing back you know, the real final language. But in this case, um, I would want an opportunity to combine these into an amendment if that's what one of the reports is, and then bring that sort of uh, rough draft language back to you uh, before it starts going through the revisor's office and fiscal office process. Um, so that's, that's how I would plan to address this. That sounds like the best course of action. Thank you. Very good. Representative Grahowski. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a good plan. And my only request is um, sometimes when we met in person, we would get the language literally right when we walked in the room. And if now that we're doing things a little more digitally, if we could get it in advance, I know I feel better about being able to actually read it and digest it. So if that's possible, um, Mr. Tartikoff, I would appreciate it. Great. Representative Cuddy. And um, last question, I think for me, do I need to accept this as a friendly amendment in order to, to move on or? <laughs> that was in fact my next question um, to the maker of the motion, Representative Cuddy, um, is, is this what you had in mind all along with your motion? Yes. Uh, my my precognition skills were excellent, so I uh, this is what I intended the entire time. Outstanding, thank you. And I will um, second. Uh, I thank you, Representative Grahowski, um, with your a great foresight in seconding that motion, that prescient motion. Um, so, uh, what we've just heard is that the maker and seconder of the amendment um, uh, consider this a friendly amendment to their uh, motion of to pass as amendment as amended. Um, so the amendment would be the language that we saw from the sponsor as her amendment to the bill with these additions as recommended by the Maine Credit Union League um, minus uh, Section 5A in their language. And that will all be um, incorporated by Dan, um, with some smoothing of the language regarding the notification to the lender. And... Dan, is that your understanding? Does that give you enough to go on if we if we vote that out today on that motion? Yes, although I would <clears throat> I would request uh, the ability to follow up with Rob or Ellen um, if I have questions about um, their language because I really haven't had much of a chance to review either of them in depth. You got it. Absolutely. Okay, any other discussion before we ask Izzy to call the roll? All right, seeing none, we will proceed to a vote. And Izzy, this is your big moment where you get to uh, call the roll. And, uh, and actually, I think this is your second roll call vote. So um, you're, you're an old hand at that already. And please proceed. Perfect. Um, it doesn't look like we have Senator Lawrence, so I'll go to um, Senator Vitelli. Oh, yes. Awesome. Senator Vitelli, yes. Um, it doesn't look like we have Senator Stewart either, so I will go on to Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry, yes. Um, I'll go on to Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy, yes. Um, Representative Grahusky. Yes. Representative Grahusky, yes. Um, Representative Kessler. Yes. Great. Representative Kessler, yes. Um, Representative Ziegler. Yes. Great. Representative Ziegler, yes. Um, Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Um, Representative Wadsworth. Yes. Representative Wadsworth, yes. Um, Representative Grignon, it does not look like we have them present, so I will move on to Representative Foster. Uh, out of a great deal of caution, no. Okay, Representative Foster, no. Um, Representative Carlo? No. Representative Carlo, no. Um, the result is eight in the affirmative, um, two in the negative, and one, or three absent, my bad. 
Great. Thank you very much, Izzy. And uh, the folks who voted no, Representative Foster and um, Representative Carlo, is your uh, what is your minority report? I, want, I don't want to assume anything. Uh, I, I won't assume uh, what Representative Carlo would say, but I would uh, work with Ben to establish that the uh, CPACE creditors would move behind the uh, main mortgage holder on the property. Thank you. I concur. Got it. Dan, does that give you enough to draft? Uh, just to clarify, that would be added on to what is the majority report or just add it on to the bill? Uh, that would be an amendment to the what was just voted on uh, in regards to the lien holder status. Thank you. It, it may in fact conflict with some of the language that was presented in there. So you'll have to, that's why I said, well, I'll work with you on that. Sounds good. Got it. Okay, well, that concludes our work session on uh, this item. And uh, we do have a number of other items on our agenda for today, but it is uh, past one o'clock. And I think we do our best work when we're not um, overly hungry or tired or cranky. So um, how would the committee feel about uh, taking a, a break for lunch? Any objection to that? Okay, and apologies to those who are waiting for these other bills, but um, I think- I object, <laughs> only because I, I was eating lunch with the camera off. Thank you, Representative Kessler for sharing that. Um, the rest of us do need lunch, so we're gonna break. Um, we'll come back for 487, 507, and hopefully the storage and, uh, and uh, power to gas um, bills um, afterwards, but it is um, almost 110. Um, do folks need, would, would 40 minutes be enough for lunch? All right, so we'll come back at 150. And in the meantime, if you could turn off your video and audio, that would be great. Have a good lunch. <clears throat>
Okay, it's uh, <clears throat> one fifty one by my clock. So folks could go ahead and turn their video back on. That would be great. Kind of get a sense of who's still truly with us <clears throat> or back with us. And Dan, um, I just emailed you. You can disregard it, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. This will be our first work session um, since the public hearing on LD487. Is that correct? Yes, it hasn't been worked yet. <clears throat> Great. Okay, I'm just gonna ask again if folks could turn their video back on, make sure we have a critical mass. Just wanna point out that the only two people here on time are Merchant Mariners. <laughs> I bet there's something to that. <clears throat> I never, uh, I don't think I ever told either of you about it, but one of my favorite adventures um, ever was when I took my 11 year old son to Philadelphia and we hitchhiked on a freighter from Philadelphia to South America. It was pretty amazing. And the crew was entirely Filipino. And I'm proud to say that I managed to hold my own in the karaoke with them. That's pretty good. They were, was they were good though. I wasn't as good as them. I just, I just managed to win most of their, 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 their tepid approval. That's all. They was that good. a bulk freighter or was, what was the car, type of cargo they were carrying? Uh, it, it was a, it was a banana boat. Basically it ran between yeah. South America and uh, Philadelphia delivering bananas uh, to Philly and going back with, with cardboard boxes basically. Those were some pretty boats in their time. Really nice looking ships. Yeah, I can't remember where the flag was in the Bahamas or someplace like that. Nassau, maybe. Um, but Panama, maybe. Yeah, <clears throat> but it was um, it was an all Filipino crew. I had my several of my classmates that really enjoyed that banana boat life. When they were oh, down right? there, they were when they were down there, they were usually in port for several more days than most of the other types of uh, <laughs> shipping were. Right. Takes a while to load up. <laughs> I won't go on. I won't go on with that. Okay. We don't need to, especially on YouTube. <clears throat> well, um, it looks like we have enough members to start. We don't technically need uh, a quorum to begin a work session, although we do need it to proceed to a vote. So it's 154. I'm going to go ahead and get us started and ask um, our analysts to walk us through this bill. We are now taking up uh, in work session LD 487 which regards positions at the Office of the Public Advocate. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dan to begin. And I think we'll probably have questions for the Public Advocate who's with us as well. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Sure. So um, <clears throat> this is LD 47, an act regarding certain employees of and to allow supplemental funding for the Public Advocate. This is a bill submitted uh, by the Office of the Public Advocate. <clears throat> It changes the title of the business services manager position to senior assistant to the public advocate to clarify that a person in the position may perform duties aside from business related duties. The bill also clarifies that the public advocate may legally accept funds from sources other than an assessment on utilities for the purpose of carrying out its statutory duties. Uh, provided a little additional background here, the OPA is primarily funded through an assessment on utilities and qualified telecommunications providers under 35A MRSA section 116. I've noted there's also a special assessment here that supports the activities of OPA's non-wired alternative coordinator, um, but the section 116 uh, eight assessment is based on uh, each utility and qualified telecommunications providers 
intrastate gross operating revenues and is designed to produce sufficient revenue for the OPA's expenditures as authorized by the legislature. As, des as described during the hearing by the public advocate as part of a recent proposed settlement considered by uh, the Public Utilities Commission, the OPA would have provided would have been provided with $150,000 to conduct a customer education program. In its final order, however, the PUC rejected that portion of the proposed settlement upon a finding that the OPA lacked statutory authority to accept such funds. According to the OPA, there have been other instances in the past where the PUC has instead approved similar funding for OPA as part of proposed stipulations. A primary purpose of this bill as described by the public advocate is to explicitly clarify in law whether the OPA can accept similar amounts included in a settlement or stipulation as well as grants or other funds. Uh, there were a number of people who testified on the bill uh, or entities. Uh, I've noted here uh, that section two of the bill which provides for the renaming of an existing statutorily established position within the OPA um, received no opposition to or any real significant discussion during the hearing. The focus was instead on uh, section one, which had to do with the acceptance of settlements or grants or other funding. <clears throat> the IECG uh, in testimony expressed concern about authorizing the OPA to accept grants or other funds from outside sources, uh, believing that doing so could introduce doubt about the positions OPA takes on matters it's involved in. Uh, I will note here that the IECG supported the part of section one that authorized the OPA acceptance of settlement funds. The Public Utilities Commission uh, expressed opposition to section one of the bill, uh, arguing that authorizing the OPA to accept funding from settlements or stipulations would create the perception of a conflict of interest or result in a lack of confidence in the independence of the OPA or its perceived motivations in agreeing to a settlement or stipulation. The PUC also raised concerns about the proposal's authorization to allow the OPA to administer and expend any such outside funds at its discretion noting that if the OPA requires additional resources to perform its functions, the legislature should consider that need by appropriation instead of this proposal. Uh, I've noted here that additional information and comments were provided by the PUC to the committee yesterday, and I included those in the email I just sent. Um, that, uh, that document included a suggestion that if the committee believes the OPA requires additional funding, the committee may want to consider extending certain statutorily, statutory filing fee provisions under um, Title 35A Section 708, which deals with reorganizations, and a filing fee provision under Section 3132, uh, which deals with um, CPCNs, Certificates of Public Convenience and Necessity, uh, to include the OPA. Right now, they're set up to only include the PUC. Uh, no fiscal information is available. Happy to answer any questions, and I'll stop my share now so you can all see everyone. Great. Any questions for Dan? So um, I have one, Dan, that I'll ask you, and I think others may, uh, uh, other attendees might want to weigh in on this as well. But um, that suggestion from the PUC, which I'm interested in. I, I'm interested in pursuing it. Um, it may have some overlap with another bill before this committee. And I think uh, Deirdre Schneider is our analyst for that bill, but it's LD 251, um, which is regarding public utility fees, uh, assessments, fees, and penalties. So I just wanted to flag that um, as an area of possible overlap. Um, that I want to be conscious of as we work these two bills. Um, it, there may be no conflict whatsoever, but I think if we go in that direction that the PUC is suggesting that we might want to just, you know, um, keep uh, the two bills in mind together to the extent that we can. So not seeing any comment from Dan on that. I think I think um, he doesn't disagree. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, that is that is a bill that Deirdre was working on. She just messaged uh, me to let me know that it's being worked on Thursday. Um, so I, I wasn't familiar with that bill or aware of its status. Yeah. But, uh, right. No. Right. Great. Thank you. Anything else for our analyst? 
Okay, and again, for those who are um, either listening in uh, without video or um, here with video, um, we do have that analysis and also the PUC information from Dan in his email sent um, at 151 today. So should be fresh on the top of your inbox. Um, all right, not seeing any other questions or concerns for Dan. Um, we do have some folks in the attendee uh, list who we might wanna hear from. I'm gonna give the committee first uh, first dibs on who, the, who you wanna hear from. I'm not seeing any any uh, immediate motion on that. Why, why don't we um, call in the uh, public advocate? This is a bill from the public advocate. So um, if Izzy, if you could let in Mr. Hobbins, that would be helpful. And why don't we ask Mr. Corbin to come in as well? Because um, I think we may have some questions for him regarding that follow-up memo from the PUC. And uh, my question for you, Mr. Hobbins, and welcome, uh, welcome back, is um, have you had a chance to review the, uh, the follow-up information provided by the Public advocate, or excuse me, by the the PUC, or uh, or not, and and if you have, uh, you have any any particular response to those comments? Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I I'm just uh, I guess I've been thrown an olive branch, maybe um, maybe to try to appease me or something, and I, I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. My concern was one of principle. And to be honest with you, I was very disappointed at the inferences that were made by the Public Utilities Commission uh, in their order and in denying the stipulation. Uh, as I said before, I'm not in this to have a turf fight with the Public Utilities Commission. We should be on the same page, same page. My concern is that is that they said that we needed we needed legislative authority to do something like that. When I've given you two examples of situations where one of them is $50 million in a stipulation which was approved unanimously by the Public Utilities Commission that essentially says the public advocate with only advice of the governor in the F Efficiency Main Trust will make the determination where $50 million goes. And the interesting part about it is that um, there, was a, there was a disbursement, small one, and obviously I'm a team player. That money's gone into escrow along with, in an escrow account, Efficiency Main Trust. Uh, and I've, as I said before, you know, this, the reason I got $50 million is because I played hardball, played hardball with Central Maine Power Company who didn't want to give us a penny. And fortunately, uh, the persistence of my office and others involved, we were able to, ICEG, uh, we were able to negotiate a settlement. The other instance is the, is the situation involving um, the, MPRP, the original high intensity wire uh, project that occurred about eight years ago. And in that particular case, there was money, there was money that was um, put into a fund uh, as part of the stipulation for CLF, grid, grid solar, they would be, they would basically be involved in forming a transmission planning group to open, to open up others main stakeholders that would CMP would provide $1.5 million in funding to the group. And the, the, the players were, you know, I 
OPA, ICEG, Grid SOA, and CLF. And in that stipulation, it says, quote, funds for this grant shall be payable to the OPA to be distributed consistent with Maine law. And so my, my disappointment is that there was an impute, is that I was, I was disappointed they would infer anything from it when in fact, the Public Utilities Commission on two occasions, one for $50 million and one point one for $1.5 million. The reason we attempted to get to start an educational program is because there's none. Look at the problems we've had with competitive energy providers. Look at the problems we might have uh, involving, in, involving uh, the pro process involving community solar. There, there it absolutely needs to be a program. We don't have that money. That money should come from the wrongdoer, which is, which is efficiency, which is you know the competitive energy provider. Uh, that was basically fined or penalized five hundred thousand dollars. The interesting part about it is that I negotiated a settlement for one million dollars, and it was turned down. It was turned down uh, because because they thought that the punishment should have been greater. Ironically, the punishment is essentially the same as we we suggested. So please understand, I don't want to get into a tariff fight. I appreciate the offer, extending me the offer, that's wonderful. But the bottom line is there has been precedent in the past. And I basically, when they said it wasn't approvable because they, there was no, there was nothing in the statute or whatever, they didn't have the authority. They have demonstrated authority on two different occasions, a lot more than $150,000. Now, the money, if you want to say the money come from the wrongdoer versus a you know some other entity that's okay uh you know i don't want to in fact inject you know pro you know anti-consumer money pro-consumer anti-environmental money pro-environment into the into the process what this was the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars would come from electricity main unfortunately we walked away from the table with five hundred thousand dollars in the penalty, when we could have we could have penalized and given some positive money without having to go back to the utilities and basically the ratepayers, because the money gets burned right through to the ratepayers. Don't let anyone kid you. All the money from the Public Utilities Commission budget and all the money, all the money from the Office of the Public Advocate is somehow an expense to the to the ratepayer. Uh, and for uh, expense from the Public Utilities Commission and the Office of the Public Advocate. Um, if this is a, if this is something that you want to look at, but I just want for the principle of the thing is that they've done it on two occasions. They say in their order, please look at it again. I know you've read it, that they needed a th the, they, there, there was no authority to do, do so. Well, I put a bill in to give the authority to do so. Now, if you want to change the bill to take out, you know, any grants or whatever, and just have it come from the wrongdoer, I think that's a good idea. Because if they're not going to put the money up, if the Public Utilities Commission isn't going to put the money up, a start program, um, I, we're willing to we're willing to do it. But obviously, we'd like to go out and do some outreach, and that will cost money. We don't have it in our budget, and why should why should why shouldn't the wrongdoer pay for the freight in, instead of the utilities that, that have acted in compliance? Because our money comes from all a uh, formula, which the same as idea as the formula from the Public Utilities Commission. So I'm sorry if I'm a little emotional about, it, but I was I quite frankly was a little insulted by the tone and tenor on the remarks about about the about my office and about me it reflects badly in the inference that I influence that I, you know I'm trying to build an empire it's not the case I'm trying to have an effective office I'm trying to have a proactive office because my office good people good people in the past I respect them greatly but it wasn't a proactive office that went aggressively after people like central Maine power 
Electricity Maine, and those who have wronged the system. So I'm sorry if I'm a little emotional, but um, if, if that's what you would like me to do, uh, quite frankly, this what they're what they're asking you to think about doing should have been done a long time ago. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, probably one of the reasons was it probably wasn't asked by the by the public until by my office. If you look, um, last legislative session did increase the the percentages, um, and I asked for the, I asked for the increase, and they this legislature and the governor approved it. So I'm sorry if I'm a little emotional about it, but you know I'm I run I run a I run a good office, efficient people, and it's only right that we have the resources to, to do the job. I wish you could go to a public utilities rate hearing, and they're having one right now. You're going to see two or three people from the Office of the Public Advocate, one third of the number of people we have. And if you looked at the people that are on the other side who are asking for millions of dollars, you'll see a dozen of them from the utilities sitting there before the hearing examiners or the other commissioners. But obviously, I'm having a hard time getting one more position, which was already approved by the legislature from funding. And um, in this particular situation, I'll keep my mouth shut just to take their suggestion and uh, there'll be another day. Be another Thank you, Mr. Robbins. And, and we do have with us uh, the Public Utilities Commission as well, and they'll, they'll get a chance to, to speak also. But um, while we have uh, you and we're kind of on that track, um, I want to offer an opportunity for the committee to ask you any questions. Well, anything you want to ask, I'll be more than yeah. happy to. <clears throat> Not seeing anything, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, Mr. Robbins, uh, the picture you just painted for us of, you know, a third of your staff, you know, two whole people um, sitting on, on one side of the uh, horseshoe table that's used for Public Utilities Commission proceedings, uh, you know, arguing on behalf of ratepayers in a rate case um, with a dozen or so utility lawyers, accountants, engineers on the other side <clears throat> is troubling to me. I, I, I'm concerned about that dynamic, about that possible imbalance. And um, I, I think it's uh, a, a more than a possible imbalance. I'm, I'm probably uh, being generous here and characterizing it that way. And I also take a uh, real note of something else you said, which is that ratepayers foot the bill for all of it. Um, you know, the customers of the utility pay not only for the good offices of the public advocate, who is sort of their representative in these proceedings, but also pay for the work of the commission, uh, who serves as a, a sort of a judge and jury. <clears throat> and in fact, they pay for the 12 or so people on the other side of the horseshoe as well, um, because uh, the uh, the Utilities Commission generally is required to um, allow the reasonable regula uh, regulatory proceeding expenses of the utility to be recovered in rates. Um, so I know, for example, <clears throat> um, in, in the most recent rate case for CMP, um, and this is in the uh, memo that we received from Mr. Corbin today, um, there were about $2.4 million of regulatory proceeding expenses incurred by CMP, which uh, were folded into our rates uh, in, the, in the CMP territory, customer rates um, over a period of years. So it's about 412 million uh, per year that's included in the annual revenue requirement and customer rates. So I, I, I just, uh, is your office, um, able to, uh, should, should we be looking at increasing your funding significantly more in order to really make sure that, that when, when CMP has 2.4 million to spend, arguing that, that you know, m m their customers rates should be higher, that, that you can um, match them in, you know, dollar for dollar? Mm. Uh, well, let me just say that 
ask yourself this question. Why would an agency, have you ever seen an agency have to change their name uh, on an employee in order to, to have, effect, have an employee in the office? Uh, we're one of the very few agencies that list out the number of employees, what the transparency is, what they're doing. Uh, and the irony is that the, the weaker we are, the better off the utilities are. The weaker we are. And I'll tell you one thing, for a small shop, we grabbed them for $265 million uh, on, the, on, the pro, on the process. And it wouldn't have happened. The money would not have come from Central Maine Power or Hydro Quebec uh, if we hadn't been aggressive. We'd have never got the $50 million and we, because we were aggressive. And did we have any more staff? No, we did not have any more staff. We just, you know, I'm pretty tenacious when I when I have to be. Um, but I'm just trying to tell you, long term, past when I'll be the public advocate, uh, for sure, um, there has to be a look to see about whether or not there's an adequate amount of money to hire, to hire good expert witnesses. We are limited by the type of expert witnesses that we can hire because we don't have the resources. Um, and I had to go back to the legislature last time for three hundred thousand dollars because of because of the, the situation involving the billing the, the you know the billing metering system and the whole process which in the end the PUC clipped Central Maine Power Company for ten million dollars of imprudence but I can tell you um, that three hundred thousand dollars again came from the ratepayer to basically fund our fund an expert so we could at least compete with them. And quite frankly, we did a pretty good job of competing with them uh, on the Ray case, uh, Central Maine Power Company and um, the, the NECEC Hydro Quebec situation. Um, so if you're asking me in the long run, I think there should be a look at it. And wh whoever the public advocate is or whatever, uh, the public advocate in Indiana has 57 people on his staff, 57. But if you, I can go through the, all the states. We are up, up until maybe South Dakota has less than North Dakota. Um, they might have, they probably, I know they have less because it, they've got the utilities kind of control the operation in some of those states, the fossil fuel utilities anyway. But I just wanted to, you to know that we have a good staff, very capable, match them against anyone, um, and we work hard. And and that's fine. And I don't want to pat in the back. That's the job. We all knew what it was when we took the job. But I do think there should be a, a review of a couple things. One of them is, you know, should the rate payer pay for the, you know, the, you know, the, the way in operation of a, of a regulated utility, when in fact they might have, they might have not acted within the norms of, be, of, improve, of prudence. So, there's a lot to look at. Um, there's a lot to look at. And one of the reasons why there aren't many employees is because, um, because uh, I think the, the utilities obviously don't want a lot of employees in the process um, because we, we'll, be, we'll be better watchdogs if we had more of a staff. But I'm not complaining. We got nine people. I wanted another person. And um, I was disappointed that it might, it might be in the final budget. I hope it is, um, but that's, that's here and there. That, that went through a public policy process. It passed unanimously by, the, by the, this committee of last session. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the money wasn't funded and we lost the position. But I just want you to know is that I'm not complaining. I'm just saying in this particular case, I'll take what they're offering. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to turn that down, but think about what I said, is that they basically told you and told us that you didn't have, they didn't have the authority to do what they wanted to do. And they wanted the authority come from the legislature. And it seems to me that we should not, we should not just foreclose the opportunity to rewrite that situation, take out the agents and all of that other stuff, but let let the uh, let our office at least 
at least get some of the resources from the wrongdoer. In that, this particular case, we got $500,000. We could have had 650 coming from Electricity Maine. We got 500,000. Really, when you think, if you read, if you saw how many people got wronged, it wasn't, they just got dinged for one incident. They didn't get dinged for 70 of them. Read, read our brief. We asked for $7 million. We could have justified it. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions for the public advocate? Okay, um, what's the pleasure of the committee? Would you like to proceed to hearing from the PUC? I see a couple nodding heads. So um, uh, Chair Bartlett, welcome. And um, thanks for the memo that you did provide. Um, it's been characterized as an olive branch from the, um, by the public advocate. I'll, I'll uh, take that as a good thing. Um, is, there, is there information that, that you wanna add um, to that memo or anything you've heard today? Yeah, if I could just make a few comments. Um, first, I wanna be clear that uh, testimony before position on this bill is in no way intended to be dis or to cast aspersions on this public advocate or any other. Uh, I have tremendous respect and the commission has tremendous respect for the public advocates staff that do show up in case after case representing uh, ratepayers, you know, adding real value uh, to a lot of the cases before us. And we very much appreciate that. We also agree that the public advocate needs to have sufficient funding to hire the experts it needs and to have the staff it needs to engage in these proceedings. That is critically important. The issue for us though, is when the public advocate is negotiating for its own office as part of the settlement, it creates the, the appearance or the potential appearance of a conflict um, and raises real questions in the minds of the commissioner, the fact finders on how to interpret um, a change in position over the course of a case when the stipulation comes with a payment directly to the office. I just think that as a practice, it is not, it is not serving um, the Office of the Public Advocate in the long run, and it's not ser serving the ratepayers in the long run. Um, because if we are not valuing uh, a position taken by the by public advocate or to minimize or minimizing a support for stipulation, I don't think that's good for anyone. Um, so what we try to do with the proposal is to think through, okay, what's the real problem here? It seems to be a lack of ability to have ex enough expert witnesses in these cases. And one way of dealing with that, of course, is a filing fee. I did want to raise- um, um, Chair, yeah. Chair Bartlett, I just want to interrupt for a moment because I'm, I'm having a little trouble with your audio. It seems to be fading in and out. Um, I don't know, if, do you have a, a microphone that's partially covered or um, it might be maybe a loose jack? Yep, let me try. I think I just moved a uh, pad of paper. Did that give that's, us a little more might, clarity? Yeah, that's so far so good. Continue. Yeah, my apologies. Um, I Point I just wanted to raise the, the electricity main settlement um, is an interesting one, a stipulation. That's an enforcement procedure that was brought by the committee. Uh, and there's a maximum fine of $500,000 under the, the statute. The, the stipulation that came before us included this additional $150,000 for a public service campaign. Um, that could still have been part of the stipulation had it been allocated differently. That is one where the, the narrow issue was whether that money should go or could go directly to the public advocate's office to be used for a, a fund that it was administering on its own or whether that should be handled set differently. Uh, clearly, they could have negotiated for either electricity main paying a higher penalty with a portion of it being used for the public service campaign um, it could have come into our regulatory fund and then be used from there to fund a public service campaign. Uh, and you could have, stipulation could have had the public advocate presenting to us a proposal for that. 
Uh, we do agree with the public advocate that there's a lot of confusion around the whole supply uh, issues and the um, uh, it is just how the billing works and uh, how to interact with CEPs. And we are intending to use uh, a significant portion of that $500,000 penalty for that express purpose, um, as we said mentioned in our order. So we are currently uh, working on an RFP to do some analysis to figure out how best to spend that money. So again, that's a place where the public advocate raised a very important issue. We're taking it to heart and that could have been structured with that additional money. The final point I wanted to make just on the, um, on the rate case expense, I wanna be clear that when a utility is reimbursed for rate case expenses, that is related for outside counsel and outside experts. It's not for um, the utility staff that are in the room. So while there is likely to be outside counsel in the room as well, uh, the 12 people you tend to see at a rate case, a number of those are utility employees and are not, um, that is not being recovered separately. So let me just uh, follow up on that point, um, Chair Bartlett. The, you said not recovered separately, um, but if the um, work that is being done by the utility employees in the course of the rate making proceeding is in the course of their regular duties, is that generally recoverable anyway from rates? Yes, that's part of their operating expense, absolutely. So in other words, the 2.4 million that was recovered um, from the last uh, rate making proceeding was really not the whole expense incurred by the utility. Uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, there was, there was actually more involvement by regular staff that would have been recovered um, through O&M. Yes, that's always true. The utility staff, um, they're, especially their senior staff, that is, that is built into race, at least at some level. I think in CMP's case, it's a little bit interesting because some of those folks are Avon Grid employees, and we have a cap in place on how much of that's recovered. So a lot of those, it's questionable uh, how much of the Avon Grid employees' expenses um, and time really are being paid for in the, in the context of that rate case. But absolutely, they're, they're utility staff, uh, and then they, that money is for outside experts. And I think that's why the filing fee concept makes sense, that if what we want to make sure is that we're trying to level the playing field to make sure that the public advocate has sufficient resources, the place to do that, I think, is the filing fee. So that right up front, they are getting the money to compete um, in that uh, arena, uh, rather than having to compromise something away potentially in order to get reimbursed for expenses that they've already incurred. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee for either Chair Bartlett or Public Advocate Hubbins? Um, I wanna turn back to you, Mr. Hobbins, and just ask, um, and I, I suspect you don't have this at your fingertips, but maybe you could help us to figure it out. If the last CMP rate making proceeding, just to take an example, you know, one example of a, of a very important proceeding um, was there was 2.4 million in, in recoverable um, expenses um, that, that the utility incurred, plus, you know, it sounds like maybe, you know, even more than that amount, um, in regular staffing, what what was your expenditure in that case? I mean, if you were tracking your staff time, do you think you spent five million dollars in that case, or what did what did you have to work with? Uh, and I think you're muted. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, what it was just what was in, what's in our budget, and we are limited as as far as the number of employees. We're limited, we're limited. Um, we don't have any, we, we basically have a budget we present and that's what it is no matter what happens. Uh, we did have to go back because of the imprudence of Central Maine Power Company and handling the billing and the metering and, and everything else. Um, we, we had to, we had to um, assist in the litigation. Of, I will say the Public Utilities Commission um, I, I believe um, under, under Chairman Bartlett's uh, leadership, whacked Central Maine Power Company, I think for the most they've ever been hit by. 
That was $10 million. And that comes from that comes from the shareholders and not the ratepayers. So I, I commend them on that. But please understand is that there is still a legal issue about whether or not 500, that when you have enormous amount of, of, mis, of mistakes and intentional act, actions and actions by, um, by a utility, um, I don't believe, especially when the utility was sent a letter, a warning letter, you don't, you should not do this, cease and desist letter. And guess what? The utility continued to do that type of activity. It seems to me that is more, there's those incidents that occurred before they were won and after. And you know, for $500,000, that's not a lot of money, considering they disrespected the commission, they disrespected the ratepayers. Uh, and and they walked away, they walked away paying 100, 500,000 bucks. And ironically, ironically, um, if you, I wish you, I will give you a copy of our, of our brief that we submitted when we took all of the complaints, we put them together and we said, if you use the formula, it would have been about $7 million. Obviously the way the statute's written, um, it's been interpreted by the Public Utilities Commission to be a half a million dollars, that's it. Um, and that's too bad, um, that, but that's, that's been litigated. It's, it's, it's water over the dam. I'm not gonna sit back and complain. What I don't want to happen is to ever happen again, that's all. Any other discussion? Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, this is a question for uh, Chairman Bartlett. Um, are or would those filing fees be recoverable in rates by the utility? If, say, we were to uh, add on that suggestion. Yeah, I'll have to double check. Um, I'd, I'd have to double check. Likely so. Um, so let me check. Okay, thank you. And related to that, um, although I am I am intrigued by the PUC, you know, proposal here. Um, am I correct in understanding that that wouldn't really get at the sort of CEP question? Um, you know that that's that's a whole other kettle of fish, correct? That's right, and I think the the issue there is what what's the appropriate penalty? I mean, I think the issue is not that we were not enforcing and they were not going to pay the maximum penalty. Um, clearly, the evidence was there, and they were. The issue was uh, the issue is whether that penalty is sufficient. Um, I don't think having the public advocate or anyone else sort of swooping into an enforcement proceeding to then extract something additional for themselves is a good practice. Um, I think it is better to have a much higher penalty if we think that they're not being punished enough. Um, so I would just, to me, that's, that would be the appropriate response if, if we feel like that is sufficient. Now, because I agree, I think $500,000 is not a lot when you're looking at the amount of damage they caused. Absolutely. In no disrespect, but the $150,000 uh, was doing something that probably that you could have only collected the way you're talking, $500,000. This was taking $650,000. None of it was going for any benefit, but for the, but for the rate payer and came from the wrongdoer. The other, the money came from the wrongdoer, and that's that's a big difference, because you you was you even admitted you're strapped, you're limited, under your interpretation, to file a penalty for more for for anything less than you can't do it for more than five hundred thousand dollars. Mr. Robbins, just a reminder to please direct the comments through the chair, um, this chair, not the other chair, um, and. Uh, but this chair will now recognize the other chair. I think uh, Chair Bartlett, go ahead. 
I would just say in the context of a stipulation, they could have, Electricity Maine could have agreed to pay more um, and, you know, for this additional fund. We, there's, you know, as with all stipulations, there are, there are frequently provisions that we might not be able to order on our own, but the parties could agree to. So, you know, I really thought quite, or what, one alternative would have been when the stipulation was initially rejected is for a new stipulation to come forward with that 150,000 being used for public service campaign, but just not being directed um, into the OPA's account because of the, the issue that was raised uh, by my fellow commissioners about um, whether they could sta that was statutory allowed or not. So I just wanna be clear that, that the, the ruling uh, in that on the stipulation would not have precluded an alternative to get 150,000 or more um, for a public service campaign. And I, again, just wanna emphasize that we took the Office of the Public Advocates position to heart and are in fact going to be doing a public service campaign um, with the penalty funds that we collected. And I guess my response and, um, through the back, chair. I'll, the I'll chair. recognize uh, Mr. Hobbins. Thank you. For I, any comment. Through the, yeah. My concern is, again, you have a pie of $500,000. Now, if you're going to, and that's all you can, if, the, if the, that's the story, it's all you can collect, then $350,000, you would do that campaign, $350,000 would come from the wrongdoer and $150,000 from the wrongdoer to a fund or to a program that you were going to have. My whole point, no disrespect, you made the decision and I live by that decision, that's the process. But there's a big difference in math between $650,000 against the wrongdoer than $500,000. And with 650, you get an educational component. And the way we're going to have it now, if you have an RFP that comes back at 150, 200, whatever it is, um, it would be, it would, it would diminish, it would diminish the money that would go to your separate account and it wouldn't cost them any more money. 650 Minus five hundred thousand is, you know, is one hundred fifty thousand that they're not going to have to pay. All right. So um, just to avoid the back and forth, um, keeping it to committee members, um, I, I want to just turn to the committee and ask if you have additional questions for or, or any discussion, frankly, but um, in particular questions for the public advocate or the PUC. Okay, Thank you. Uh, well, Representative Kessler, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one thing that's not clear to me is trying to think of this in the frame of mind of addressing that same problem that Commissioner Bartlett was saying is, is how do we get your office the resources that you need to adequately um, stand up for ratepayers? Um, and the proposal of having a filing fee and a proposal of also having them pay more if there is a case that requires a penalty. How much of the um, penalties and fees uh, is the uh, PUC collecting uh, that is from, or what percentage is a penalty versus how much is from filing fees what does that uh ratio look like and i guess that's a question for commissioner barlett or chair barlett chair barlett you want to comment on that i missed the end of that it was sort of garbled and i'm not sure if it's, if it's mere um what uh percentage of the revenue that the pu get, uh the puc gets uh, is from penalties as opposed to filing fees? Um, I don't have that. I should also note that when we receive filing fees, we uh, use it, are using a, whatever portion we may need. For example, if we have to hire consultants, we would use it for that. And any leftover money would be then reimbursed to the utility. So we are only, the filing fee is, it, it may or may not all be used and it doesn't go into our general fund if it's not used. 
and the uh, fees really vary year to year. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much it would take in a year, but I, I don't know if it's in the one to two million dollar range or something like that. Thank you. Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this question is for uh, Chair Bartlett. Um, would it be possible, uh, just you know, as a as a person involved in the um, reorganization of uh, what is now Versant, I recall that uh, the OPA contracted with a number of experts that it seemed everyone was in agreement were a benefit to the case. Is it possible that if we had some sort of provision in advance that if that happened and the PUC approved that the public advocate was prudent in hiring such experts that then it would be acceptable for the expert fees to be reimbursed by the utility because I think that was the proposal. And I understand that after the fact, it did look a little funny that, or could have been conceived as odd that, oh, the utilities now pay and maybe they were happy about what the experts said, but if we knew in advance and then there was a check that the PUC said, yep, we agree that was prudent, then that could be part of the stipulation. Do you see that as a feasible solution to that aspect of this question? Yeah, potentially. What I would say is, re is remove it from the stipulation context. I mean, if the issue is reimbursing experts that are uh, fees that are prudently incurred, you could have uh, that determination made in any case. Uh, and then an order of reimbursement, whether there's a stipulation or whether um, we, it went to a final order. There's no reason to limit it. I think pulling it out of the stipulation context takes away the concern that we had, which is that um, if the agree if this if stipulation includes payment of the expert, what do you do if there's been any change or modification of an expert's testimony along the way? How do we, as a fact finder, do interpret that? And that's where it gets really challenging. And so I think if you just take away any negative incentive for um, uh, an expert to change their mind because of how the, they're being funded, that, that solves our problem. So, but I, so I would just say, if, if we, you wanna go down that road, a way to do it is to simply say, um, if they're prudently incurred, uh, the utility pays, period. If, if, I'm, if I may, through the chair, just um, to, just to, just Robbins, to I don't want to, I don't want to do a he, you know, I don't want to go back and forth, but I think it's important to clarify that the stipulation with between, between NMAX and Amera through, through our off, through attempted, basically through the process, the only, the, Company um, who was set, who was set with buying were willing to pay for our expense, and the reason they were is because the public the public utilities commission did not hire an expert. The public utilities commission hired they basically utilized our services because we had very competent people that thought thought the same way. As the Public Utilities Commission, and so that money could it would have come from the rate would have come from the company, uh, and it was turned down. And so that means that that was eighty thousand dollars that we couldn't use for future cases, and that's why it's very discouraging. And the and the implication of that was that we were doing something wrong, just because I guess it's never been done before. But they were so impressed with our expert that they and they realized in Canada the experts are paid for by the utilities. They're not paid for through the through the you know through their they are paid for they pay for their utilities. Um, they pay the the experts of of public consumer advocate, public advocate, or whatever you want to call them. That's that's the. I'm not going to get back into anything else, but I just think that Thank the you. Clar clarification should be you should be aware of. Well, I, I think that one of the truest things uh, or most fundamental things for me today, uh, Mr. Robbins, is what you said earlier, that 
whether it's your office's work or the PUC's work or the work of the utilities themselves in these rate making proceedings, it's generally the customers who will pay for all of it at the end of the day. So finding efficiencies um, is probably a good thing in general. Um, however, that needs to work. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly um, interested in understanding how this question is dealt with in other arenas. Um, you know, I think of our state's attorney, attorneys general, who often argue <clears throat> on behalf of consumers in the states um, in cases that go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And sometimes there are settlement agreements that result from those cases um, where the attorneys general are then charged with dispersing, I don't know, for example, 17 million from, you know, uh, Volkswagen for a settlement um, in, in a case regarding emissions. I mean, I, I, it isn't, isn't the public advocate, um, and I, I know the answer to this question, but I just wanna pose it for everyone. Isn't the public advocate the attorney general for, util the, for utility work, for, for protection of utility consumers. And, and, and since the answer to that is yes, um, doesn't it sort of make sense that uh, stipulations, which are kind of settlement agreement, if you will, um, can be administered by the public advocate? And I see Chair Bartlett shaking his head, but I, um, at the risk of going around in circles, let me, let me um, end my own comment there. Uh, it's, it's a thought ex experiment as much as anything, but um, I'll turn to Representative Grahowski next. Thank you. I do appreciate a good thought experiment and uh, extended metaphors. Um, it, it strikes me that there's sort of, uh, we've got a, a sentence in this legislation which has a lot of components in it and they maybe have different levels of merit, um, you know, grants, settlements, I think a rate case is quite different than a reorganization, for instance. Um, I think rate cases are sort of required to happen so that the utilities get what they um, are expecting to get, uh, just and reasonable rates, et cetera. Whereas a reorganization is something that they're doing for their own business reasons that the ratepayers don't care about. <laughs> Generally, to put it, uh, it's not something they ask for, if you will. Um, so I think. I feel like I have a different level of comfort around reimbursement um, or filing fees, depending on even those differences. There's probably even more types of cases that I'm just not familiar with at the BUC. So I don't know how to proceed, except for I think this is not a yes or no question to that whole sentence. There's yes or no questions to each portion of that sentence and even more detail than that one sentence in, this, in the proposed legislation provides. Um, so I don't know how we proceed of straw poll with each aspect, um, but I, I don't feel comfortable with the entire sentence. I think I feel comfortable with part of it. And I just wanted to express, I think there's more complexity here to be addressed. So I'm not hearing a clear sense of consensus on the committee. Um, I, I, I am aware that um, there's some interest in pursuing um, what the PUC has put forward as a kind of a suggestion on this bill. Um, it sounds like Representative Grahowski, you might wanna go a little further. So we could, we could go ahead and do your uh, straw poll um, just to see if, if you like, or if you, if you wanna make a motion on the bill, we can certainly do that as well. I just want to caution that, again, we have LD 251 on Thursday, and uh, that's that will be our, our work session on, on that bill relating to utility fees, penalties, and assessments. I think some of this may be related. So if we, if we go forward with what the commission is recommending um, on this bill, it might be good to make sure that we're kind of um, squaring it up with whatever we do or don't do on LD 251 as well. Um, so just before, before we get too carried away in, in motions, I, I just wanted to flag that one thing. Um, we could certainly, you know, flesh out, uh, a concept today and let it sit, let it percolate. 
and table until um, Thursday, as much as I um, hate to recommend tabling, but I think we want to make sure we get this right. And um, that might be one way to proceed. Um, if folks want to go ahead with a motion um, and try to vote it today, I'm, I'm certainly amenable to that. And we could just be aware of it on Thursday, either one. So, Representative Growski, do you want to try um, a straw poll on your? Um, unless anyone has any other suggestions, it feels like we're going around in circles. Um, but maybe Representative Foster has an idea. Let's go to Representative Foster. Well, seeing how Mr. Kessel is, uh, excuse me, Representative Kessel is outdoors, unable to speak up, I will move to table this. All right. It's been moved to table by Representative Foster with a second by Representative Kessler. And that is non-debatable. So we'll proceed to a vote. Um, so by a show of hands, all those in favor of tabling at this time. And look at that, we've done something unanimously today. That's great. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we'll come back to it. And I would just encourage uh, folks to um, dig deep and ask a little more and ask about this a little more. Think about what you're comfortable with. Um, I sense that the PUC's recommendation may be of interest to folks and we might be able to do something with that. So uh, Representative Foster, do you have anything else or is that just a leftover hand? Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. And um, before we go on to the next bill, I, I do want to just flag um, and maybe Dan, you could help help follow up um, on this, I, I would appreciate getting from the PUC uh, for the committee's purpose, um, a tally of the expenses incurred by the public advocate um, in the last CMP rate case, just so we have some benchmark of what how those costs stack up. Um, the, the costs to CMP have already been characterized um, at least approximately. So it'd be good to have a sense of scale. And with that, we'll go on to LD um, 507, which is also a bill from the public advocate. It relates to consumer protections uh, around community solar. And um, I believe that the OPLA team will be tagging out Dan, Dan Tartikoff. Thank you, Dan. And um, tagging in Deirdre Schneider. And she'll be walking us through the analysis on this bill. Let me just pull it up on the screen, hold on. Great. Switch over, took me by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and 507. Everyone can see that fine? Yep. Okay. So this, this is uh, an act to improve customer, consumer protections for community solar projects. Um, this bill directs the Public Utilities Commission to adopt consumer protection rules for customers who participate in or are solicited to participate in community solar projects through a net, meter, net energy billing arrangement based upon a shared financial interest in a distributed generation resource from fraud and other unfair and deceptive business practices. It allows the commission to impose administrative penalties upon a project sponsor, as well as order restitution for any party injured by a violation for which a penalty may be, upset, be, upset, be, a, be assessed. It provides the commission through its own counsel or through the attorney general um, to apply to the superior court to enforce any order or action taken by the commission pursuant to the law. Um, the language proposed in the bill is similar to the general consumer protection provisions related to competitive electricity providers and provides the same directive to the commission to adopt rules to protect a consumer from fraud and other unfair and deceptive business practices as contained in law related to shared distributed generation resource projects. Um, right here is a list of those folks testifying at the public hearing. Um, I don't know, I've labeled this as a possible amendment, Representative Barry, you can clarify, but at the public hearing, um, you were discussing that perhaps there needs to be more clarity regarding RECs and whether that customer is buying green energy and if that could be considered false advertisement and that you had some conversation about that. So that was raised at the hearing. And additionally, the commission 
noted if moving forward with the bill, the commission requests the committee clarify the expectations regarding the enforcement of the proposed provisions in detail and consider specifying certain portions of the bill be delegated to enforcement by the attorney general um, and then other parts of it to the commission. The commission recognizes the language in the bill is very similar to the language in section 3203. However, notes the difference is that the commission licenses CEPs currently, and where this is an area where shared interest projects are increasing, they're concerned that the, what the universe of issues can be and whether they are equipped to address issues relating to individual contract disputes, compliance with equal credit requirements, enforcement of federal and state laws, and rules regarding marketing if they arise. And I may have left one of those out too. I need to go back and check. Um, additionally, just as a note for the committee, um, chapter 313 of the Commission's Net Energy Billing Rules contain consumer protection provisions. Um, I've attached that port, part of it to this analysis below, and it applies to project sponsors or representative or agent of the project sponsor and any entity that markets a financial interest to residential or small commercial customers. The rules um, specifically require those subject to the rule to comply with the Unfair Trade Practices Act and related consumer protection statutes, requires some requires those subject to the rule to register with the commission, allows the establishment of financial security requirements, um, requires prior to the sale, resale, or lease of a final in financial interest in the output of the facility for those subject, um, this subject to this portion of the rule to provide disclosure that includes the usage of plain language, explaining information regarding a shared interest, and provides for sanctions and imposition of administrative penalties for violation of the rule. Um, furthermore, at the public hearing, at, there were some sort of information requests, um, sort of, I'm saying sort of because they weren't clearly defined in my notes, but um, I think Representative Barry, you mentioned, is there a way to clarify the enforcement of the PUC and the AG and can language be drafted that is run by the AG and the OPA? Um, the PUC response at the time was that subsection five, paragraph A through the through C in the bill are traditionally in PUC's wheelhouse, where D through I is traditionally in the wheelhouse of the AG. And depending on where the committee decides to go with this proposal, the commission would be happy to work on this language going forward. And Senator Lawrence, in connection with that question, had raised an issue about checking with the AG about this split enforcement. Um, I would note current law does allow for the commission to refer actions to the AG, which would result in split enforcement, as does the language in the bill. Um, if the commission, committee decides to move forward with language that's more concretely split enforcement, um, more concretely splits the enforcement function, that language can be sent to the AG for comment and provide provided to them with a more developed specific question to review. And I spoke to Senator Lawrence about that. And he was fine with that approach if that's the direction the committee goes in is if, if you decide to move forward and have specific language, we can run it by the AG at that time to make sure that it, it works. But um, 3203, like I mentioned, this section, like I mentioned, they, they already sort of set up where the commission by their own counsel can bring a case or it can, the AG can do it. So it's sort of a, it, Kind of, kind of already envisioned that to some degree, just not so specifically split. split. Great, thank you, Ms. Schneider. Any questions for our analyst? Um, I'll ask one. I, uh, I, I need a little reminder about exactly uh, where my concern came from regarding green energy and RECs. <laughs> Um, did, I, yes. did I any more detail at the time? Because I've completely forgotten. So in my notes, I think um, you were you kind of gave a scenario. Like if I subscribe to a provider, um, I may not receive RECs. If the owner sells the RECs to a third party. I've not really bought something green. And then wrote like, is this false advertisement? So I think you were using it potentially as an example of of maybe just the importance of this, that people can be deceived, but it wasn't clear and I have a star next to it and it <laughs> in my notes. And so I think you were saying it sort of in that way. So I, I mentioned it and I have underneath add as an amendment. So um, I went back and looked and I'm not sure I was much more clear in, in reviewing what your point was at that time. So if it's not important and it's your point, then we can just move on. <laughs> it may not be very important seeing as how I've forgotten it completely. <laughs> exactly. All right, so um, if the committee is interested in proceeding, um, a, a, a motion to advance the discussion might be of use. I'm, I'm inclined personally to 
you know, move forward with an amended version of this that basically um, would assign parts D through I to the attorney general, let Deirdre draft that and run it by the attorney general before we, um, you know, move forward with the bill. Um, but let me ask you, Deirdre, if, if we were to do that, you would not, um, we'd have to vote it and then you would draft it and then you'd bring it back to us for a language review, I guess, with comment from the attorney general or could we just sort of provisionally instruct you to uh, draft that up and run it by the AG? Yeah, you don't have to vote on it. You could direct me as the, com the committee or a member of the committee to draft an amendment. I can run it by the AG's office, run it by OPA, run it by PUC, mm -hmm. make sure all the parties agree, come back with that amendment, distribute it to the committee maybe before we even come back, everybody can take a look at it and you can vote at that time. So if that's the preference, we can easily do that or you can vote it, we could do language review and if it has to be reconsidered, that's the other option. As much as I would like to vote on um, a, a bill this afternoon, um, this may not be the one, I, um, you know, it might make the most sense to just proceed as Deirdre just recommended. What do folks think? Are there other, you know, apart from integrating the, uh, you know, AG provisions, assigning some of these responsibilities to the AG. Are there other things that the committee would want Deirdre to incorporate in that um, amendment that you can bring back before us when we next take this up? Great, okay. Uh, Representative Foster. You're both muted. Representative Foster is muted. I was muted. I believe. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, are you suggesting that you might want to hold on this bill to develop further an amendment to it to bring back to us? Is that what I'm understanding your suggestion is? Suggestion is? I, I think I think a little more than that. Just you know, if if the committee is generally inclined to move in this direction, then I think it's worth having Deirdre do the legwork. But I, you know, I I think the last thing we want to do is is create work for her that the committee doesn't generally support. So what I'm really interested in, I think, is a, is just a straw, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a straw vote. Maybe we can even I'll, I'll put it to folks that way. Um, you know, is there general support for uh, moving forward this legislation around consumer protections for our new uh, booming community solar market um, that would be uh, assigning some of the responsibilities proposed in the bill to the attorney general? And again, the concept would be that Deirdre would, you know, if if we if you if if we all put our hands in the air and say yes, we're generally in support of that. I'm not gonna take that as uh, you know, um, signing in blood that you'll support it when it comes back to us, but rather that you, know, you, you believe it's worth having our analysts spend some time on this and uh, draft it, run it by the attorney general, as she said, the, the public advocate um, and the PUC to bring back at our next work session. So that, that's really the question I think I'd like to, to advance to the group. Does that help, Representative? Okay, uh, Representative Kessler. Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I apologize if I'm having any internet connectivity issues. Um, I just wanted to voice that I do concur that it does not make sense necessarily to create a whole additional bureaucracy if we can make this happen within our existing system of government. So I'm completely on board with that, so. Great, I keep muting myself, it must be the time of day. Um, it's my nap time usually. So uh, in, any other um, comments or questions? All right, so. I'm just going to put this to a vote. Um, if if you could just indicate, by, uh, you know, by raising your hand, um, that you're in support of having our analysts go ahead and draft this, run it by those stakeholders um, in the manner that that we've just outlined, um, 
that would be very helpful. So who is in favor of uh, going forward at this time in that way? Any opposition? Okay, I see. All right, we're unanimous. Excellent. All right. So uh, I think with that, um, before I accept the tabling motion, Deirdre, um, you, you have what you need from us? Yeah, I think so. The idea would be to split the enforcement with the things that are normally in the wheelhouse of the PUC being under their sort of enforcement authority, those portions under the sort of more of the wheelhouse of the AGs being under their authority and aligning any other sections to make that work and then run it by those parties to ensure that it is in fact doable and everyone's okay with it. Perfect. That's right. uh, the chair would be happy to entertain a tabling motion at this time if one were to come forward. Representative Foster. No move. Okay, it's been moved to table and seconded by Representative Cuddy. All those in favor? And Representative Kessler, I didn't see your hand. Are you frozen? I think he's frozen. All opposed? All right, we'll, we'll take that as a win. It's unanimous, I think, since we lost Representative Kessler. Um, <clears throat> very good. Well, that brings us to the um, next bill, um, LD-526, which is storage. And um, Deirdre, I think you have, have, have we already worked this one once? No, this is the first time. And it's LD-528. Ah, I have it written down wrong. Thank you. LD-528. Um, let's go ahead and uh, dive in on that one. Hold up a second. Um, and let me just make sure I send it to the committee really quickly so you have it. So um, just as a little backstory that during the 129th legislature, the commission to study the economic, environmental and energy benefits of energy storage to the main electricity industry was established. The commission produced, not reduced, a report. Um, that report link is on the analysis that included several recommendations. Several of those recommendations are included in this bill. Specifically, the bill establishes a state goal for energy storage system development of 100 megawatts of installed, sorry, installed capacity located within the state by December 31st, 2025. It explicitly includes energy storage systems as a strategy that can be implemented by the Efficiency Main Trust to improve electricity efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, allow the use and allows the use of um, REGI initiative funds for energy storage systems. It requires the trust to explore and evaluate energy storage measures that reduce peak demand um, and to explore alternative methods and tests to measure cost effectiveness and directs the trust to consider expanding energy storage pilot projects, um, including bring your own device programs, um, rebate or funding programs for energy storage paired with renewable energy for all electricity customers and education initiatives regarding demand management and energy storage included targeting education to low income and rural populations. Um, and it requires the trust to submit a report by December 1st, 2021. Um, it also directs the PUC to investigate and where appropriate implement transmission and distribution utility rate designs that account for variation in the cost components of electricity as the load or demand on the electric system fluctuates includes the specific directive that PUC open a docket to investigate opportunities to modernize rate design through time of use or other time differentiated rates. Um, to develop and implement a pilot program to test and evaluate time of use rates in conjunction with energy storage and develop and implement a schedule for regular review and update of rate designs and ensure that the review includes considerations of time differentiated rates. Um, at the public hearing, quite a few people testified in support of the bill. Um, that's that list there, the opponents and then neither for nor against. I'm not going to go through each of these because there's quite a lot of amendments offered in testimony. I think it's almost about two pages of amendments. So I will just sort of um, briefly, there were 
category of stuff that are sort of, they're all related, but maybe they were a little bit different in testimony. So um, one was sort of the idea of increasing the goal that's in the bill. So right now it's 100 megawatts by 2025. There were quite a few people who um, said increase that or also to direct the governor's energy office to conduct a comprehensive study and establish energy goals beyond 2025. Um, and then also along with those energy goals that the PUC recently opened a docket on distribu distribution system planning um, to have that set targets um, based on need and cost effectiveness for 2025 and 2020, 2030, and then establish separate goals for behind the meter and front of the meter storage. Um, so there were a bunch of things about the goals itself and different ways of talking about them or, or looking at the targets in a different way. A lot of folks talked about considered targeted procurement to achieve energy storage. Um, also at, have an adder for energy storage or an incentive. There were options about long-term contracts for storage, um, property tax exemptions or um, pilot rate exemptions for projects. There were also additional um, comments about the clarification of utility ownership um, of energy storage, more support for pilot projects, um, consider amendments that target storage be located in areas where it's needed the most, like remote locations and island communities. There were portions um, directing some more um, interaction of PUC with ISO New England and looking at some of this stuff that's in the bill. Um, some along the line of establishing deadlines for the PUC to explore and a draft a plan for time of use rates so that it wasn't open-ended as in sort of the bill. Um, there's like nitty gritty details here too. It's probably a lot easier for the committee to go through where there was actual offered language. It's from Michael Stoddard regard, regarding the EMT portions of the bill and some of the wording there. Um, so there's that whole section right here. Um, you know, if moving forward, amend the bill to remove the allowance of Reggie funds for energy storage. I keep finding mistakes I've made as I'm reading this <laughs> um, and draft language to exclude energy storage for new wind energy development. Um, in addition, there were information requests or requests for follow-up. Uh, Representative Foster had posed a question to James Cody regarding how do we approach T&D utility utilization of power stored or utility ownership of energy storage systems. Um, Representative Foster also to um, Director Burgess from the Governor's Energy Office that question was, do we know if there are storage projects built out of state that have been built to capture energy from main generation facilities constructed to meet out of state needs? And what is there for existing storage in Maine? On that question, you did receive a memo earlier um, from the governor's energy office addressing that answer. And then also to Michael Sand of EMT, if using trust funds to meet storage goals, how would that impact other opportunities for efficiency projects? And as an example, um, you said, if you spend 20,000 on storage, what can you get in return for that? So I, there's a lot of information in there and there was a lot of amendments offered within the testimony to consider, but um, I did my best to sort of pull those out and put them in a way that the committee can at least get an idea of what, what was said without rewriting everybody's testimony. <laughs> Deirdre, that's very helpful. And um, if, if anything, I think uh, taking a little more time to go through uh, the OPLA analyses will be extra beneficial to this committee as we go forward, because these are big, complex bills that we are dealing with. And the, the analyses that uh, your office puts together are really worth taking time on. So um let's do that if there are any questions for our analysts this would be a great time to ask them no question is uh is uninformed foster thank you mr chair uh i'm not sure i think the questions that i asked i received answers to all of those okay Deirdre except I'm not sure if I saw the one from Mr. Stoddard. Did, did he send an email on that? I don't recall getting one and forwarding it. Um, I'll double check. I don't know if he's in the room today. He is in the room. Um, 
as an attendee. I just let him in and we'll see if he wants to take a stab at that now or if he needs to get back to us. Um, <clears throat> and while Mr. Stoddard is joining us, um, Deirdre, I wonder if after we've spoken to him, if, if you could just walk us through um, some of the other responses and the content of those responses. Sure, I'd be more than happy. I just didn't know if he wanted me to go through so many because there's almost two pages of them, but I would be more than happy to go mm -hmm. through. Oh, the responses to the questions. Right. I right. didn't, I don't, I didn't get the response to the energy storage system utility question either. All I did was get the um, memo from Director Burgess today in response to sort of what energy projects are in Maine now. Okay, and I would love to have that presented to the committee. So we can either he or um, someone from his office or or you can relay it perhaps if, if need be. Um, but first, uh, Mr. Stoddard, we, Director Stoddard, we have a question for you um, uh, from Representative Foster. Were, were you able to hear the question? Yes, I was, thank you. And um, with my apologies, I know that we have prepared an answer. So I know we have something. I cannot put my hands on it. I'm scrambling around to find it. Um, and uh, so if I can buy just a little bit more time, I will dig it up and then hopefully be prepared to respond. But um, I'm not ready just this moment. Got it. Uh, Representative Foster, did you have any additional uh, comment on that question? No, I think uh, I think you're headed down the right road. If Deidre can find those or we can have those questions posed again and get the answers. Uh, obviously the governor's energy office answer, which we have was probably the most substantial uh, amount of information, but I'm, I'm good. Uh, and I guess we did not receive an answer to the first question in print either. So thank you. Yep, great. Um, well, why don't we turn to Melissa Winnie looks like, uh, well, or, or Dan Burgess. Um, I'll let both Dan and Melissa in. Um, and before they uh, go over what the, the additional information they provided with us, um, any other questions for Mr. Stoddard while we have him on the hot seat? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Director Stoddard. Um, we have uh, Melissa and Dan joining us now. Good to see you. And uh, Director Burgess, do you, are you in a position to walk us through uh, that, that information a little bit? Because we, um, I think we just got it by email today, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Chair Barry, happy to do so. We sent it along this morning after pulling it together. So happy Great. to do that. Great, so I'm, I'm Dan Burgess, Director of the Governor's Energy Office. I've got a, a baritone voice this morning from the daycare cold that's been going around my house. So if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, so uh, this memo that you have in front of you seeks to answer Representative Foster's um, questions. So the, the first part I think is um, maybe the uh, easier one to answer, which is if we are aware of any storage projects that have a power purchase agreement with another state or an entity outside of Maine, for, for the services of that storage system. We're not aware of any system that is operating under that agreement. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. We just are not aware of any storage projects in Maine being contracted for by, by outside entities um, such as other states, which I think is, is makes sense given kind of uh, the storage um, oftentimes has locational value as well. That wouldn't be, um, it, you know, um, realized by an outside entity if they're replacing a battery in Maine. Um, so if we provide, get any more information on, on that type of agreement, happy to, um, happy to provide more information on that. The second was around how much storage is there in Maine and kind of what, and what's in the queue. So the under subheading one, um, there are at least 43 megawatts of storage installed and currently operational in Maine right now. We've provided that through um, a listing there and in particular, have listed publicly available links. Um, I, I think worth noting that that's at 43 megawatts is in, is in megawatts. So that's the maximum amount of energy available at any given moment. And then we've got the, in some places, at least below where we have it, we have the megawatt hour, which is the 
total amount of energy that can be provided to the grid for those systems um, at a given time. But anyway, General, I think it's helpful to, to kind of talk about this in megawatts. So around 43 megawatts installed installed in Maine. I should note that also doesn't account for um, you know a variety of smaller distributed generation projects at the residential level that may um, you know someone may have installed a Tesla power wall or um, a Generac system or a Pika energy system. Um, so this, these are just kind of your larger projects and does not account for the smaller smaller projects. When it comes to number two, the planned facilities in in Maine, uh, we've listed um, just two there, another five meg or 4.99 megawatt project in Rumford, and then the 175 megawatt project in Gorham that was recently announced uh, by Plus Power. Um, that, um, and, and kind of when those are expected to reach operation. This is not the full pipeline of, of, of potential storage projects in Maine, but are at least the publicly announced ones that we felt comfortable listing. Section three talks about what's in the queue. So there are, are two different queues to, to be aware of. One is the ISO New England interconnection queue, and the other is what, what is in the um, utilities and energy billing queues. So taking the interconnection queue first, if you look at what um, is, is in that queue for Maine, there are about 680 megawatts of potential projects um, that, have, that could be cited in Maine. Um, I think it's really difficult to say, you know, to any certainty what uh, the likelihood of those being developed are. Um, and I think it's also important to note that um, projects like the Yarmouth project, the one that's, that's in Yarmouth, or even the Plus Power project, 175 megawatts, are, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain, almost likely to be included in that 680 number. So the actual number of, of new projects in the queue could be closer to that you know, 400-ish range, and we can we can run that down a little bit, but our understanding of the queue right now, how it works in the ISO system is that those, when a, when a system goes online, they don't necessarily get dropped off of this queue list, and that's the way ISO is managing that now. And just the final um, queues, just to be aware of, that, that, that are the, uh, what is in the net energy billing interconnection queue. Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, before I go on, the ISO queue doesn't necessarily just represent storage. If a, if a project is with, let's say, a solar project and it's 10 megawatts of solar and 2 megawatts of a battery, it'll show up in this list as 12 megawatts. So that the list of what's in the queue could be lower for, um, could be lower for, for ISO New England. Um, and we'll, we'll work to get a little bit more detail there if it's available, but that's how we understand the, the queue right now. Um, and for central main power, there's roughly 230 megawatts in their in their NEB uh, queue. I'm mean, sorry, in central main power, 232 megawatts, and then in Versant, 22 megawatts. Um, those are the projects that are seeking interconnection requests. And what we've seen is that projects will oftentimes start with storage, and then potentially drop drop off. They're allowed to pull the storage off of the solar project um, uh, if they decide not not to move forward. I think especially early on. Projects um, play into include storage, and because there wasn't an adder provided and it wasn't um, financially feasible, they then dropped those off. So I, I wouldn't um, bank on these roughly 250 megawatts of projects actually moving forward, but at least as a sign of, of interest in the state market for these net energy billing projects or these five megawatt and less projects. Um, so and we've broken it down by county and have the summary, summary chart there. Um, I think importantly, the PUC has um, directed the utilities to begin reporting solar along uh, storage along with uh, these distributed projects. And so I think we'll get more information in the coming months from our utilities. But that's the, the queue and the, the numbers in Maine, as we understand that I'm happy to take further questions. Great. Thank you, Director Burgess. Uh, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I, I would apologize. I have to leave uh, in a few minutes uh, and I have several questions, but I will ask uh, two very quickly, if I may, of uh, 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 Mr. Burgess. Uh, one is, uh, of all of these systems, uh, none are currently subsidized except for their benefit through the net metering uh, monies that they receive because of the extra cost or, or value, if you will, of the electricity that the batteries would 
offer during peak times. Is that the case? In other words, there's no efficiency main or other monies that may be federal or something, but state monies that are involved? Thanks for the question, Representative. Um, to my awareness, I think that is generally correct. I, I will say that the, the last Congress and pre prior president at the end of the last uh, calendar year did sign, um, um, or I, I think some clarity was provided that some of these um, solar storage projects would, would qualify for the federal tax credit. Um, and so I think there would be federal um, um, you know, tax credits available to some of these. And I guess I, I wouldn't want to misspeak. There could be some, you know, um, other uh, projects that were supported in another way by, by grant funding or others, but nothing, no kind of energy storage program is necess necessarily coming, coming to mind that overarching touches all of these, if that, if that's helpful. Representative Foster. Y yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burgess. Also uh, uh, another question that uh, during during the hearing, I believe we received some testimony and, and I think we're also uh, from other information aware that some of the uh, storage capacity with batteries is, is actually installed behind the meter for smaller solar installations, which of course uh, benefits from the net metering uh, uh, added uh, price, if you will, when they, when they expend that electricity. Uh, I'm wondering how that we will know how much capacity there is behind the meter uh, going forward. In other words, I think this bill is intended to help uh, subsidize behind the meter storage as well as other. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could address how, how do we look at that going forward where now we really don't know what there is out there. Thanks representative. I think that's a really good question. And um, I think we're part of my thinking around kind of the, the, the you know, the residential Tesla power wall, um, PICA systems, there's not necessarily a good, unless others are, are, are aware from the industry or from others, not necessarily a tracking system for those smaller systems. And I think that's probably the same um, uh, generally for the behind the meter. Most of what we're talking about listed is the in front of the meter. I think the PUC, um, proceeding or, or direction to the utilities to start providing some of that information, I think we'll get at a, um, a, a lot of that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good question. We should we can come back with more information on. Anything else, Representative Foster? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry I have to leave, but I'll go back and listen to the uh, rest of this when I get home later tonight. Thank you. Great, have a good evening. Um, Director Burgess, the... Um, Behind the meter storage that is already out there, um, is the commission confident? Are you confident that uh, the utilities have that data? Um, is that is that pretty clearly available? It's just that it hasn't been reported. And um, thanks for the uh, question, uh, Chair Barry. I, I guess I'm not sure is 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 the answer, and I think um, I don't want to misspeak, but I think that there's. You know, if you're installing a, a power wall or a you know system on your house, I don't, I don't think that there's necessarily a requirement to report that. Um, and I think, you know, it's worth thinking about: do we want that reported? Right? There could be instances where, if we want to aggregate those storage devices to participate in a EMT BYOD program, bring your own device program, as it's done in other states, then yes. But you can also see um, a reason for, you know, for uh, you know, a homeowner or, or a business not wanting to necessarily um, re report a, a storage system that's pure of being used for, you know, backup behind the meter. And so I, I don't think the utilities have a, or would have a full, you know, list of every single power wall that's been installed. Um, and we should think about what might be helpful there and what might be appropriate for, um, for tracking that. And it may be just that if you want to participate, you need to register. And if, if um, you know, if 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 not, then we should think about if if a required reporting there is, is something that we want to pursue. Great, thank you. Other questions for Director Burgess? Um, I guess I, I just want to flag uh, a general concern that I have, and I'm not sure um, 
you know where exactly I'm going with this, but I, I just want to say that uh, we are asking um, a lot of the PUC right now. Um, we're asking a lot of the Governor's Energy Office. We're asking a lot of the Efficiency Main Trust. So I want to make sure that we're, um, you know, pretty clear uh, about the value of 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 this particular initiative in light of all the others, and that we think about these things together. Um, you know, I've I've uh, I've even been wondering if we need to sort of um, put, put all the, the the big initiatives in in one basket to really understand how we prioritize these things. But storage feels very important to me for sure. Um, I'll go to Senator Vitelli next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I share your concerns about what all we're asking of, of our utility regulators here. Um, Dan, thank you for being with us this afternoon. It struck me during the bill's hearing that there was general agreement that the 100 megawatt goal was too low. And, but nobody that I saw came up with a different number. Uh, so I'm wondering, given the report you just went through listing what, what is out there already, have you come up with a number in your own mind that might be more of a aspiring goal for us to set for the state in terms of storage. And then also there were some ideas about how we could benchmark to get there uh, and, and create incentives so that we would in fact get there. So I'm, I'm a big believer in setting goals and in, in knowing where you're going as a way to ensure that in fact you get where you wanna go. Uh, which is why I think for this bill, that was the first thing listed, but it certainly is, is a much more complicated issue in this regard than in say, you know, where you wanna go on vacation. Um, so I just wondering if you could talk a little bit where you think the goal setting and the goal reaching uh, stands in your mind at this point. Thanks for the question, Senator. I, I certainly, I certainly have vacation goals and targets in mind um, when thinking about the future. So we can talk about those um, too. I, I don't have a specific number in mind today, but have you know, given this exercise and and some discussions I've had with the industry and and others interested parties, and you know, definitely want to you know further that conversation. I agree that you know we already have 43 potentially. You know, when you add up the DG, maybe 20, 45, but a lot more behind it in the queue. Um, I think what's interesting is this, this big 175 megawatt project is really, you know, that, that's emblematic of what can happen when, you know, uh, a new project comes online and makes your, your prior, makes the prior goal seem, um, less ambitious. So I, I think I'd, I, I agree with you on the need to set ambitious, but achievable targets and then figure out how to get there. Um, I think, um, so I guess the answer is I don't have a, a target in mind for today, but I'm happy to come, you know, work work with you and others on thinking about what that could be. We've given it some thought, but just don't have a final number right now. Um, I just think it's also worth noting, if I may, that the 170 75 megawatt project is hoping to achieve or is planning to achieve operation by 2024, and you know that's that is kind of that is a ways away. And so as we think about you know storage installations and what's possible, there are some out years for. Development. That's because they're in the, you know, they've cleared the capacity market, which is a three-year market. So they're looking three years out. But um, all to say, happy to work with you and others more on that number, what that could be. I would appreciate that, and I recognize that there are benchmarks along a time frame that that can also be part of the answer here. Um, so happy to have that in consideration as well. Thank you. Great, uh, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This isn't a question for Director Burgess. I just wanted to um, give some feedback on on where I'm at with the bill thus far. Is that okay? No. Um, so um, um, one particular aspect of this bill that uh, speaking to Representative Barry's um, comment about maybe you know looking at. <laughs> Um, a, a more consolidated package here is I, I actually introduced a bill, uh, LD 1191, which is to look at time of uh, use rates. Um, and 
there were a couple more uh, details in that particular study that um, may be worth rolling into this bill. Um, but um, one particular thing that I'm seeing happen out in the public sphere um, is uh, time of use rates kind of being used as a political uh, weapon, um, partic in particular a post that I saw from uh, Maine people before politics um, saying that this is going to be another one of these um, uh, Democrat initiatives that are going to harm low to moderate income people. Um, and I just want to be absolutely clear to the public that that is not the intent. Uh, and we are very hyper aware of, of this issue with any policies that we push forward. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, make sure that in the analysis of time of, of use rates that we look at the impact uh, that it may have on those households um, and uh, how we can best mitigate that. Um, so that, that was uh, one thing that I just wanted to raise awareness about. Um, uh, another piece is um, when it comes to um, uh, residential storage and potential pilot projects um, in the future. Um, I, I really would love to see um, a pilot project where people can opt in who or where, where that target audience is in areas that have the highest frequency of outages. Um, in, in order to both meet the need of uh, giving those households backup power, but also giving them the benefit of uh, hopefully lower rates um, over the course of the year uh, as they use their battery. So um, that's just another um, thought that I wanted to get out there and hoping that that will result from this bill. Um, that's it so far. That's just the feedback I had. Thank you, Representative Kessler. Um, Senator Vitelli, back to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Representative Kessler. You reminded me of another question I wanted to pose to um, Dan Burgess. And that is, uh, it, it partly relates also to um, efficiency made. So I might also want to check with Mike Stoddard at some point, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see as, because I think you included this in your comments, sort of um, high value cost effective sightings and pairings of storage. Um, if there were to be, pilot projects, for instance, that, that we would direct Efficiency Maine to do, are there some that make most sense in your mind for them to move forward with that could achieve a multiple number of goals? One being the issue I think that Representative Kessler was talking about, which is making sure that this technology is distributed equitably and where it is most needed. So I wonder if you could just comment a little bit about that. Thanks for the question, Senator. I'm happy to. So I think um, there are a few areas which I think um, can make a lot of sense. I, um, and a few of them have kind of come up in discussions or in public hearings. So I think one is, is I guess, you know, storage has been kind of called the um, many things. I mean, it can, do so, it can do a lot of things, right? It can help with congestion, with peak demand reduction, with, you know, um, resiliency. And so I think if we think about, you know, the services that it can provide the grid, you know, finding ways for it to, if we're going to do pilots, I think it's about proving some of those out and showing how that can work in the main grid. I think it's also about ensuring that that value is there for, for, for rate payers. So in the bill right now is, re, is a requirement that EMT go forward with a bring your own device program, which is basically an, the, the idea is that co collectively, yeah, this, everyone on the Zoom call puts a storage device in their, in their home and then allow that storage dev device to be 
aggregated and, and uh, used as a as a system uh, to to uh, work in the in in the electricity markets, and so therefore bringing greater value um, beyond just kind of a backup device. So kind of allowing allowing an entity to use your your storage system collectively together to produce more value. That's what's happening in in, in New Hampshire, Vermont, other states have, have done pilots for that, and that seems like a allowing efficiency main to do that seems seems kind of like a, a common step, um, a, a, a kind of a no regrets, if, if you will. I think in, in my comments before it, I think if, if we're going to be looking at opportunities for storage, uh, I think it's it's also worth considering, again, as, as where they're located, the opportunity for, you know, emergency response or critical care facilities as a potential, you know, pilot program that Efficiency Maine could run or could be done through other means. But looking at, is there a, an emergency operations center that you know, really is, is vital to have a, um, you know, right now probably has diesel backup generation, but is there an opportunity to prove out the solar pulse storage um, type of system, which is being done in other states, um, you know, batteries being uh, placed at hospitals, being placed at um, operation centers, community centers that, you know, when the power goes out are, are serving as warming centers or as, um, you know, delivering other essential services. So I, I think um, would be interested in, in those types of um you know, seeing storage value there. And then I think the other, you know, piece is, um, is around kind of both peak demand, but then also um, um, alleviating congestion and constraints on the grid. And so, we, you know, we obviously have a, 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 and those would be for the larger systems, at least on the constraints. So we have a, you know, we have renewable resources that are currently constrained. And so allowing or incentivizing, uh, incentivizing storage to help us reduce those constraints. Um, so those are some of the buckets I could see either allowing efficiency mean to do or to, um, you know, asking the, the PUC to consider. Um, and then finally, I'm going on for a while, but the, the RPS procurement that is happening, the first tranche and the tranche that's happening now does allow, uh, thanks to the legislation passed by this committee, does allow storage to participate and kind of lays out some of those criteria that it has to prove in order to participate. Um, that was LD 1494. Um, barred from, um, you know, some some of the legislation that happened in other states. So happy to provide more detail after, but so those are just some general ideas and yes, be interested in, in efficiency means take on some of the programming there too. I, I do just want to flag a couple of concerns that I have around this storage conversation. Um, one of them is, is cost. Um, and that's been alluded to a little bit already, but um, it, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that the cost of batteries is coming down um, fairly rapidly. And so to some extent, being a lower income state, the longer we can afford to wait, um, the better. Um, we may be able to ramp up, actually, ironically, more rapidly uh, with storage um, over the next, say, 10 years, uh, by waiting and really accelerating quickly a little bit later. So that's one consideration, I think, is timing um, and price and markets. Um, and speaking of markets, I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of the storage, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Director Burgess, but a lot of the storage that is referenced in um, the information that, um, that the GEO collected for us and presented uh, today, and again, thank you for that, is, is not storage that's um, procured by Maine or that necessarily serves, you know, Maine load. It's, um, it, it may be, in fact, intended to satisfy uh, procurements in other uh, parts of, of the ISO or to serve the ISO as a whole to support, um, you know, the, 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 the proper um, timely distribution of supply uh, that might come from the north, but end up going to the south. Um, so I just I just want to flag that general concern. I don't know. I mean, do you want to characterize any of that storage, um, Director Burgess, uh, that you referred to in terms of its sort of, you know, main, uh, main versus ISO, um, uh, you know, end user? Or uh, if not, I mean, don't don't no obligation. But if you want to speak to that, um, feel free. Thanks, thanks, Representative Barry. I'm, I'm happy to at least opine a little bit. I, I realize it's getting close to the end of the day, so I won't go for too long. But 
I think if you look at the the five projects, the larger projects that are installed, I think it's likely that they're, um, you know, I mean, two, two in Madison for, for, for that um, COU, the, the battery in, in Yarmouth that has, you know, been installed for a while, the new battery in Millinocket, and then the smaller one in Booth Bay from the NWA project. Those, um, I don't know exactly the services that they're providing, you know, to the to the overall regional grid, but I, I agree that there is some importance between what main contracts for and what the overall system needs. I think worth noting that the what's in the NEBQ right now is, is um, you know, I, my assumption is that those projects are hoping to rely either on either an adder that would have been provided or are trying to make trying to pencil it out to the NEB program. So those would be kind of main funded programs. But again, those are I think it's I think it's probably unlikely they get built without any sort of adder or additional support. Well, just as a follow on to that, then, um, in, in terms of the system impact uh, costs that have been the subject of considerable debate in this committee, uh, Director Burgess, would adding storage in any of those cases um, help to reduce the system impact? Is there uh, a beneficial um, aspect to storage in in some of those cases or or not and uh, thanks representative do you mean for the kind of cases that senator vitelli asked me to go through of, of value or just kind of broadly or for the neb projects i mean for neb Sorry. specifically yeah <clears throat> and it's okay um, if you don't have that on, off the top of your head yeah i think sure. it would depend and happy to kind of follow up a little bit more on that great um, I, I can just chime in, um, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, so, are you, I mean, there are absolutely significant dollar values to all ratepayers for these systems uh, for shaving down the peak um, in terms of avoided RNS and avoided capacity costs. So that's not the individual consumer who's necessarily just the consumer who's property the thing is located at those some of those a lot of those benefits flow to everybody that's on the system so we would all pay less uh especially if we could aggregate this and do it at scale so director burgess that part i understand very well the the what i'm referring to specifically though is the the system impact studies that the um that that the cmp yeah. did in particular um around the community solar installations that have sprouted up in many parts of maine um, and the extent to which storage coupled with, because it, because it came up earlier, uh, the extent to which storage might help to alleviate that concern. And I'm, I'm not clear that it does, um, but it's just a matter of, of uh, curiosity for me. Um, but I think the point you just made, uh, Director Stoddard, is, is uh, the larger point here and, uh, and a very good one. Um, all right, so we have uh, Director Stoddard in the room. There are others in attendees. If the committee wants to further discussion, that's great. Um, I do um, sense that we're moving towards a tabling motion. There's not necessarily appetite for a final decision on this bill today, uh, but uh, with that in mind, we, we can continue to discuss as the committee sees fit. Uh, so Senator Vitelli. Thank you again, Senator. Uh yeah, Senator Barry, how do you like that? Representative Barry, um, and thank you, Mr. Stoddard, for being here. I, I really wanted to say I appreciate the specificity of the input that you provide during the test your testimony on this bill, and wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit further on one of the comments you made, which is that in some section it's referred to just battery storage, and you made the point that this is beyond just battery storage. So I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on that thought and then um, also talk a little bit more about what you just started to mention, which is that storage can play more of a role in our overall grid than simply um, shaving off peaks. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. And the last thing I'll throw out there for you is just to, to comment on some of what Mr. Burgess talked about in terms of targeting pilot projects to test um, certain uses, if you will, of um, storage. So sorry for throwing that all out at you, but it might help us get to a good place in the end. 
Uh, thanks. There's a bunch in there, and I'll I'll try to quickly just touch on a, a couple of the high points. The first one is uh, just I know we all commonly think naturally of a battery, an electrical battery, but at the end of the day, what we really care about is um, managing load and and keeping the balance on the grid so that it's reliable um, and so that we don't have to build it any bigger than necessary. And uh, so while batteries will do that, they are not the only way to do that through energy storage. You can also store things up by making them hot or making them cold and keeping it that way for a long time. We all live in Maine, so we've all used a thermos. Uh, we've all tried to keep things hot or cold, depending on the situation. And um, if you do that at a really big scale, uh, like say a cold storage facility where we have uh, food processing maybe happening or storage, uh, which is something we have in our economy uh, and other situations where you try to keep things hot for a while, um, you can also take electricity um, at off peak times and use it to either make things hot or make them cold and keep them that way for a while and displace the need to create that heat or electricity later when it's more expensive and more of a strain on the grid. So thermal storage, it can be just as valuable at achieving the same objective. And in some cases, it's quite a bit less expensive because um, you can partner with an end user, like I, I referenced a cold storage facility, who's already investing a lot of the money to do that stuff themselves. Uh, all you're really doing is piggybacking on that investment they've made to then manage them in real time if they're willing to, and if uh, for maybe some incentive to get them to manage their use. Uh, and, and so that's an example of a very affordable way to use energy storage. And, and I just was hoping that the, that the language would not preclude us from pursuing those opportunities if they seem to be the cheaper alternative and if they would work just as reliably. Uh, the other part of your question is, um, just a little bit of clarification around the, the term peak. Um, and I'm not sure if the, if the original draft of the bill had a preference one way or another, but most people refer to the peak as the regional system peak, the ISO New England system peak. And that is certain hours of the day. Um, and those are indeed very valuable uh, financially to avoid. So batteries and any other kind of storage are very helpful in that regard and also in uh, maintaining reliability, but they're not the only hours that matter. And as I was trying to say in my comments, one example is just what, uh, the question that was directed to, direct, to Director Burgess a moment ago from um, Chair Barry about whether there's a way to mitigate the cost impacts of these new solar projects that are going on the distribution system. And I think theoretically, the answer is yes. If you had storage on the distribution system, that what's happening on those circuits uh, up and down our neighborhood streets in real time, those have their own peaks, their own peak times. And so, especially as we start adding more electric vehicles and electric vehicle chargers and heat pumps throughout the grid, um, we will have strain on the grid on each of those individual circuits. So there may be peaks that are uh, different times of day that might be quite valuable uh, to, to be able to shift through energy storage. And, uh, and similarly, as we add more and more uh, variable renewable generation to the grid, they may run at a certain time of day, which is not coincident with peak, uh, but it'd be very useful to be able to store their surplus power uh, during those off peak times. So just wanted to make clear that we could pursue those opportunities wherever they were cost effective. And I think that's the key term because if there's a real monetary value available, that will help tell you where are the highest and best uses of energy storage. I think there was one last part of your question and I've, it has completely jumped out of my head. So if you can remember it, I'd be happy to take a shot if you could remind me. I think that's fine for now. Thank you, Mr. Satter. Great. Any other discussion? Representative Kessler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was wondering if there uh, was anybody in the uh, gallery or the panelists or attendees from the PUC um, that might be able to answer um, a question. Garrett Corbin, thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, Director Stoddard had raised um, a good suggestion, I think, uh, around um, looking at the case that was opened to analyze our grid infrastructure on a granular level so we can better understand what targets uh, we need to, to hit, where the weaknesses are in the system, uh, and where the most benefits can be achieved. Um, and I'm, I, it, it's not just this bill that, that, that report would help, but also um, LD9. Um, and I'm just wondering what, what speed is that occurring in terms of um, helping us along? When could we expect that report? Could we expect it in time to make decisions on these bills? Hey, good afternoon, Representative Kessler. Uh, thanks for the question, members of the committee um, and Chair uh, Barry. If you could turn on your video, that would be helpful. I, I would if I could, I, I'm not. Uh, okay, all right, no problem. I wasn't sure if it was just a, a quick fix, but uh, please proceed. We'll, we'll imagine you. <clears throat> Here we go, I was just uh, promoted, I think is the term, so. Um, Thanks. Uh, I, I would have thought you would rather have me keep my video off. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, I, I'm not clear on, um, I, I think when I heard that earlier, I thought it was um, being referred to the um, the proceeding that was envisioned in the bill. So um, could you just clarify which um, proceeding you're asking about, Representative? Okay. Yep, the, the case number uh, two, uh, 00039, the Thank one that was opened yeah. in February. Thanks. And, and I'm going to um, defer to uh, uh, General Counsel for the PUC is on as well, Mitch Tannenbaum. Yes, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, Representative Barry, members of the Council. This is Mitch Tannenbaum with the PUC. Uh, I think, Representative Kessel, your question is whether we would have any any information from this inquiry or investigation during this legislative session? Um, if that's your question, the answer is no. We are in the process of getting some engineering consulting assistance through the state procurement process that will help us uh, analyze the issues with, with the grid, both, both at the transmission level and the distribution level. Um, you know, regarding future um, increases in, in renewables and solar and the need to modernize the grid. So the, it's probably, you know, maybe by the end of the year, we would, we would have a good idea where we're going with it, but certainly not this session. Thank you, Mr. Tannenbaum. Any other discussion? All right, in, in that case, uh, a, a motion uh, would be welcome at this time. Um, Representative Kessler. Motion to table this bill, please. Okay, there's been a motion to table uh, by Representative Kessler, seconded by Representative Vitelli. And all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. Great, okay, we will um, schedule this for a later date to be continued. And uh, we do have LD9 on the docket. Um, if the committee wants to continue with it, I would suggest that we give ourselves a 10 minute break before we come back to it. Um, but we also don't need to take it up. We could, we could postpone it to a later date. I'm going to um, acknowledge Deirdre in a moment. Um, and I'm just checking. Yes, we do have seven and a Senator. Um, Deirdre. Um, so my recollection, I mean, it's completely up to the committee that you scheduled that because you wanted to keep nine in the conversation with storage on 528. Um, but obviously if you want to move forward, that's, that's fine. But that's the only reason it's kind of there. That is correct. <laughs> You are quite right. Thank you for that reminder. And Representative Carlo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to make the committee aware that I will have to be leaving very soon for another commitment. Not sure if that will impact our quorum or not, but I wanted to make you all aware. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rep. Carlo. And I, th that would leave us at the razor's edge. We would still have a quorum, but it would be awfully tight. Um, so, you know, given, um, but what uh, Ms. Schneider has just reminded us of and what Representative Carlo has said, um, I'm, in I'm inclined to not take this bill up for work session uh, at this time. Um, if people really want to vote it, we could certainly um, talk about doing that. But um, I think it's been a long day and uh, it is four o'clock. We can, we can come back to this in the larger context of storage. And I, you know, I, I think it's important to keep in mind what, what uh, Director Stoddard just reminded us that um, there are many forms of storage, uh, thermal, battery, um, molecular storage, uh, like such as LD9 contemplates is also part of that uh, larger toolkit as well. So I don't see any objections to um, leaving LD9 uh, on the table. Uh, so we will not take it up and that will conclude our work for today. Um, we do have a big uh, agenda on Thursday morning. I believe that uh, chairing our, our day uh, much better than um, we have seen yet uh, will be Senator Vitelli. Um, my understanding is that we have, we have not seen uh, we, have, we have not uh, um, been able to, to um, schedule uh, uh, certain bills because um, like the solar bills for um, both Senator Lawrence and uh, Representative Stewart, who's the sponsor of two of those bills are uh, 